to the state of state Odisha Conclave. The India Today group is delighted to be here. I'm Shweta Punch, deputy editor with India Today magazine and your host for the day. At the outset, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Darwin Platform Group of Companies and the government of Odisha. Can I please invite Mr. Raj Changappa, the group editorial director, publishing India Today group, to please deliver the introductory remarks. Good morning, everyone. The Honorable Chief Minister of Odisha, Mr. Naveen Patnaik, Chief Secretary of Odisha, Mr. Suresh Mohapatra, distinguished speakers, state government officers, industrialists present here, including Mr. Ajay Harinath Singh, Chairman of Darwin Platform of Group of Companies. Ladies and gentlemen, we are today in a remarkable state of India in the presence of an outstanding political personality who is among the few chief ministers of the country who is serving his fifth term in office and seems indefatigable. As chief minister, Mr. Patnaik, you have not only brought your own brand of politics that could be called the Naveen model, but you've also brought about a phenomenal change in your state that you could say there is now an Odisha model of development that the other states could emulate. <laughs> I will talk of both of these briefly. We are short of time. When it comes to the Naveen model of development, the mantra of your success, as you've often told me when we have met in interviews and others, is when your work speaks for it, let it. Your main strength has been that you talk less and act more and believe that your performance itself speaks for it. You demonstrated that in the 2019 state assembly elections and also in the Lok Sabha elections that were held simultaneously when you probably delivered the briefest speech that any politician could do, particularly a chief minister could do in, during an election rally and all your election rallies. Uh, you would ask the people, and I hope I've got the pronunciation right, Apano kushi to. I don't think I've got it right, but <laughs> meaning, are you happy? And the crowds would roar back that they are happy. And this was this one single slow, uh, uh, statement that the chief minister made that immediately he didn't say anything else. For him, that was the most important thing. And then, uh, if you see the results of it, the polls reaffirmed their satisfaction levels uh, by uh, Mr. Patnaik and his party, the BJD, winning a landslide in the assembly elections and also cornering most of the Lok Sabha seats uh, despite uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's immense popularity in Odisha, the results were different. Uh, sir, by your Spartan lifestyle that includes living in the outhouse of your father's mansion, he rarely changes his car, believes in the simplest of cars to drive, there is no lal bhatti going where he goes. Uh, your pass words in contrast to the verbosity that we have come to associate with politics, he speaks absolutely less, uh, little. Your utter dedication and devotion to the task at hand, your abstinence of the earlier jet set life that you had led, you remain an enigma. But there is no doubt, Mr. Patnaik, that you have shown that you are a true karma yogi of Indian politics. Let's give the Chief Minister a very warm round of applause for that. Now coming to the state, uh, this beautiful and holy state of Odisha, as we know as an intricate amalgam of regions carved by nature and history. The geographical contrasts are evident from the pr prosperous eastern coast plains to the mining industrial belt of the northern plateau, from the green revolution zone of the central tableland to the backward and tribal dominated southern hills of eastern Ghats. Each of these have a bearing on Odisha's development. The state Odisha occupies 4.7% of the country's total geographical area, has 7% of the country's forest coverage, 10% of its water resources, and a phenomenal 20% of its mineral resources. For years, as we know, it was dubbed as uh, one of the so-called Bimaru states, part of the Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh poverty belt. But from 2000 onwards, Mr. Patnaik, since you took over as chief minister, 
this state has undergone a remarkable transformation. As we all know, at that particular time, running Odisha, which is, uh, was one of the most poorest and backward states, was certainly not easy. And just to give you an idea, when Mr. Patnaik took over, more than half the people of the state lived below the poverty level. Frequent cyclones created havoc in the state. There were starvation's death. That was what Odisha was known for. Corruption was rampant, and I was speaking with Mr. Mahapatra just now, and he was saying that the state couldn't even pay government employees their fees, uh, I mean their salaries at that time. But uh, with his single-minded clarity of purpose, his selfless actions, his single-minded focus on all-round development, and his firm style of management, the state has been transformed into one of the leading performers in the country. And even as storms, both natural and man-made, raged in the state, Sir, it was your calm that brought cosmos to the chaos that was there. And just to give you a few examples, from a net importer of rice when Mr. Patnaik took over, in fact, the state used to go with a begging bowl to various other states like Haryana and Punjab. Today, it is not only uh, self-sufficient in rice, but also gives, exports rice to other states. That's the kind of achievement that's happened. And if you... And most importantly, we have talked of, heard of farmers' uh, income being doubling, but Odisha is the state where actually the farmers' income has doubled. <laughs> you have empowered women through forming self-help groups and reserving seats for them in panchayat levels. That has tremendously transformed the state. You have helped tribals across the state, the youth in terms of employment, and have reduced poverty by as much as 30% since you came to power. It is your unique hands-on approach in dealing with natural calamities uh, that your state has faced frequently, 17 times I think in these last 20 so odd years, that has now become the model for disaster management all, all across the country and the world. In case of uh, COVID, most recently, I mean, um, we all of us faced that devastation across the country, but it was Mr. Patnaik's blueprint uh, to take protective measures much, in hand, much beforehand itself, and I think a very unique thing that he did, which was uh, that uh, he opened the ICUs of all private hospitals and gave free medical uh, treatment for all of them. And let's give him a very warm round of applause for that, because it was one of the best managed COVID states that we had. And let us not forget Odisha for one thing. When all of us suffered, and I was in Delhi, you couldn't get an oxygen cylinder even if you had the best connection. It was Odisha that brought uh, oxygen to the rest of the country. And we are ever grateful for that. And you have not neglected, despite all these things, sir, not neglected Odisha's rich culture, tourism, and religious significance. Your development of the holy city of Puri has transformed it into a major pilgrim center. And in sports, I was witness to that. I was invited by you, sir and the uh, Odisha Sports uh, Ministry to come and see the Hockey World Cup and was very happy to see the kind of, uh, you know, the facilities that were provided and the fact that Odisha has now become not only the hockey capital of India, but I think the world also. And let's give him a very warm round of applause for that. And, and, and remarkably, remarkably that even during COVID days, Odisha's GDP growth was 10.1%. And the fact is, it is far, far higher, despite the fact that in every other state and even the country, you saw the thing going down. He was able to bring almost 3 lakh crore, rupees 3 lakh crore of investment. Employment generation in industries came to, came to over a lakh during that period. And unemployment figures, we all know unemployment is a major problem. But the CMI reports recently say that it's among the lowest in the country at 1.4%. And that's a tremendous achievement. Odisha's, as is mentioning, the economy has been growing the fastest. Um, uh, it's much higher than the national economy, despite all the pandemic economic shocks. It now accounts for 3% of, of India's GDP. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the combined annual growth rate, and industrialists and others would appreciate it, is 10.8% from 2015-2016 to 2021-22. Consistent economic performance. Is, is what it's all about, and currently it's, it's an over six trillion uh, rupee e economy. 
I, uh, the other part, and I, I can go, there's a whole list of achievements, and there's very limited time, but I just have to mention the industrial development of Odisha in terms of Mr. Patnaik and his government harnessing its rich mineral resources to bring about both revenue and employment to fund the various development programs. One example, Mr. Mahapatra was telling me that recently, when the auctioning of uh, mineral resources happened, Odisha adopted a unique approach in terms of a transparent, it uh, went about its business in, in a very efficient manner, and the revenue this time was rupees 49,000 crores as compared to 14,000 crores earlier. That's an amazing four-time increase that is there. And this is one of the reasons why Odisha was able to fund its social sector programs that has made Odisha one of the leading development st uh, states in the country. Take a look at steel. Uh, it is now contributing, uh, you know, apart from... Uh, contributing uh, to the largest sh share of mineral production in the country, for almost 47 percent. In steel, Odisha stands as the largest steel and stainless steel producer in the country. Last year, the state approved proposals of one of the largest steel makers, Asilo Metal Nippon Steel, for setting up a 24 million ton per annum integrated greenfield steel plant with an estimated investment of rupees 1 trillion. That's amazing. And it's also one of the highest uh, aluminum producers in the country. Uh, there are many more achievements, as I said, and I would want <laughs> to take the whole day to list all this. But uh, I would only add one more thing in terms of the way uh, Mr. Patnaik has um, managed the entire thing. This is one of the most modern styles of management that has been adopted. Uh, and we call it, in management jargon, purpose-driven approach where leaders place uh, uh, emphasis of, uh, on serving a bigger mission to help, to give, to serve people, and about wanting to make the difference and inspiring all those who work with him to make that difference. Uh, that you have demonstrated in abundant uh, measure, sir, with your, uh, your 5T style of management uh, that has uh, now become a buzzword, which is uh, transparency for those who don't know. Transparency teamwork, technology, technology, and timeliness. Timeliness is very, very important in government, and that leads to the 50, which is the transformation of the state. The success of your purpose-driven uh, uh, formula in whatever activity that you've done, sir, is very, very evident. So we are very delighted and honored that you have agreed to be the chief guest and give away the awards to the winners of our second edition of the State of the State Odisha Survey. We have prepared this second edition, sir. We had come earlier with it. Uh, it's now five years since we did that. And this time, uh, we have uh, employed a leading uh, a research agency called the Marketing and Development Research Associates. Uh, what we have done this time, sir, is that we have mapped it in two, two, two kinds of frames. One is an absolute performance in 2021, where we judge these 30 districts that's there. And the other is an incremental performance between 2016 and 2021. So there's a five-year uh, parameters that we look at. Mm -hmm. And the idea of doing this distinction is because we feel that many times, uh, you know, certain districts have an advantage, historical and geographical advantage that pushes them to the front. Whereas uh, other districts, therefore, while we give uh, the best performing district, we also say the most improved uh, district because we recognize that five years, they, you could transform a lot of things that's there. Uh, what we try and do is that we look at 12 key parameters of development. Uh, it's not rocket science, and this is something you always would love, sir. We look at the economy with the, in terms of the district, the infrastructure, agriculture, education, health, law and order, social security, women's education, entrepreneurship, skill development, digital coverage, and sanitation. These are the fundamentals of development, and we focus on that, and we have something like 112 indicators where we evaluate the best-performing districts, and about 81 for the most improved districts. And what we try and do in this survey, sir, is we are outcome oriented. So many people, when we go to other states, they say, oh, we put so many schools. We put so much of uh, emphasis on classrooms and everything else. But for us, what's imp most important is, if it, we are talking of education, has the literacy rate increased? And more importantly, among women's uh, education, girl education, has the literacy increased over there? So it is not an income ap uh, approach. Uh, it is not an input approach, it is an output approach that we look at on this matter. So if you look, uh, the, then we take the relative weights of these and uh, the attributes are final, uh, finalized in consultation with uh, the India Today team, MDRA research, and also with state inputs. The good news, sir, of the results, and of course you will be giving the awards after this, is that 
the state's growth has been uniform. Of the 30 districts in the state, 16 have topped in various categories. That uh, indicates that the wheel of development has reached almost every uh, district of the state. And uh, by making these uh, awards and these comparisons, the idea is to have uh, uh, competition between districts. The idea is to reward those good performers as well as if supposing that the other district has done well in health, the district collector can ask how did that happen? What were the parameters and then focus on that? So the idea is to bring this very uh, you know, cooperative competition uh, into the process and also reward outstanding performers that's there. So uh, before we request you, sir, to uh, this thing, I'd once again like to thank you for coming over here. And uh, may I now request the Ch Chief Secretary of Odisha, Mr. Suresh, Suresh Mahapatra, to deliver his opening address. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you. Honorable Chief Minister, sir. Sri Raj Chengapa, Group uh, Editor Director of India Today, Secretary 5T, ladies and gentlemen uh, who are present here today. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, India Today Group and Kit uh, for organizing this uh, excellent uh, conclave and uh, rewarding uh, the collectors of different districts uh, on different parameters. This will definitely go a long way in encouraging and motivating the officers who are working in the districts. I have been asked to uh, talk about uh, a topic called what makes Odisha tick. Already Mr. Chengapa has uh, uh, already spoken about uh, the transformation which has taken place in the last uh, 20 years in our state. We are extremely fortunate to be a part of this transformation. We have seen it from a very, very close range. I think all the senior officers of the state, uh, they have seen this transformation from a very, very close range. We have seen the super cyclone of 1999 and the state uh, in which our state was during that time. It was financial condition was extremely precarious. When Honorable Chief Minister took over as the Chief Minister of the state in 2000 and uh, he did uh, two uh, major initiatives he took uh, in the initial years. One is prudent uh, financial management of the state and second is uh, giving a lot of emphasis on value addition in mineral sector in the state. If uh, you can recollect during 2004, 5, 6, 7, we signed large number of uh, MOUs and agreements with uh, entrepreneurs, mostly in mineral sector value addition that resulted in uh, creation of large number of industrial hubs like in Kalinganagar, Paradeep, Dhenkanal, Angul area, Jharsugda, Raurkela, part of Koraput and Raigad, etc which employed uh, thousands of uh, youths, uh, both directly and indirectly in our state. And gradually, the financial situation completely had a turnaround, and we had uh, surplus money available for different uh, social sector intervention, different schemes. As all of you know, our Honorable Chief Minister, as a visionary leader, has uh, started large number of uh, plethora of uh, innovative path-breaking schemes covering all sections of the society. You can talk about uh, BSKY health card where uh, 96 lakh uh, families have been given this health card every year up to 5 lakh rupees for male members and if female members are there up to 10 lakh rupees uh, government pays the bill, it is not an insurance scheme. I was looking at the last month's figure, around 40,000 uh, patients has availed this facility and government is paying almost uh, 90 crores per month, paying their bills to the private hospitals. We have more than 400 hospitals now, empaneled private hospitals. People can walk into any hospital and get free.
free treatment. This was a major uh, problem for the uh, poor people of our state, which uh, has been solved by Honorable Chief Minister by introducing this uh, innovative path-breaking scheme called BSKY, Vizu Sastya Kalyan Jojana. Similarly, we, ha we are uh, uh, having uh, schemes like Mamata, Kalia, etc., which were uh, extremely inno innovative and very, very inclusive. We have included all uh, uh, sections of the society in these schemes. Large number of uh, uh, infrastructure projects, huge investment has taken place in road sector, in bridge, construction works. More than 1,000 bridges have been constructed in last 10 to 15 years' time. In electricity sector, in uh, irrigation, in uh, health, education, you name it. In all sectors, we have made huge public, uh, uh, huge infrastructure uh, development uh, investments, uh, which is uh, showing results now. So if you uh, see the uh, financial management of the state, now we are uh, one of the best uh, financially managed uh, state as far as FRBM Act uh, is concerned. And uh, as Mr. Chengapa has already mentioned, uh, the way we auction the uh, mines in our state after the Supreme Court's order and after amendment of MMDR Act, we did it very, very fast, very transparent, and uh, without any litigation. The transition from the ex-lessees to the new lessees was extremely smooth, thereby in one year itself we have got uh, the dividend from 14,000 crores, the revenue from mineral sector has gone up to 49,000 crores. Thereby it has uh, enabled us to have very good uh, fiscal space by which we can plan for the future. In fact, we have made a roadmap for next uh, five years, a huge investment will be made in priority sectors so that uh, after a few years uh, we'll have a completely transformed Odisha. I think the major credit or the major factor which has contributed to the transformation within the last 20 years is the political stability and the visionary leader, Honorable Chief Minister, uh, who is uh, there for last two decades more than two decades or so. As a common, as a citizen of the state, everybody uh, feels this. Uh, this is the, I think, biggest uh, factor which has uh, contributed to this great uh, transformation. Many other uh, uh, innovative things have been done, uh, like women empowerment. We have the, uh, we have uh, Mission Sakti members, more than 60 lakh active members in the state. Community involvement is extremely uh, good in our state. You have seen uh, during the cyclones, when people from other states, they ask us, uh, how do you shift more than one million people within 24 hours notice? The community is totally involved uh, in different uh, sectors of uh, development in our state, be it disaster management, be it uh, Water Users Association as Pani Panchayats, be it Joint Forest Management as uh, Bana Sangrakhan Samitis. Everywhere we have involved the community to a great extent and a lot of credit uh, of this transformation also goes to our people of the state actually. They, have, they are uh, quite resilient. One after another uh, natural calamities they are facing. Still, they have a spirit of never to say die spirit uh, which they have and they are uh, uh, now we are one of the best uh, equipped state uh, to face any kind of natural disasters. So we have come a long way and uh, I think in next uh, few years, the way we are uh, moving ahead, we are not ticking, we are not running, we are in fact uh, galloping now. And within next few years, uh, you will see a completely transformed Odisha. And the entire credit goes to the vision of our Honorable Chief Minister and the strength which we get from the general public of the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks, sir. With that, uh, we'll begin with the award ceremony. Can we please... Uh, 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 and uh, whoever the award winner is, can we request you to stay back on stage? We begin with the overall winner, 
The best performing district award goes to Sambhalpur. Can I please invite Mr. Dibya Jyoti Parida on stage? And can we hear, get a big round of applause please for the winning district? Thank you. The most improved district award goes to Koraput. Can we invite Mr. Abdal Akhtar to please come on stage? And yes, if the winners can please stay back on stage. Moving on to our next category, economy. The best performing district award goes to Korada. Can I please invite Mr. Sangram Keshwari Mohapatra to come on stage? And may I please request Mr. Chengappa and Mr. Suresh Mahapatra to give the award, please. Thank you. Why are the applauses so weak? The most improved district award goes to Mayur Bhanj and can I invite Mr. Bhardavaj, Vineet Bhardavaj on stage please. <laughs> Moving on to our next category, infrastructure. The best performing district award goes to Jhar Sugra. Can I please invite Mr. Saroj Kumar Samal on stage, he's the collector of the district. Can we, can we have a huge round of applause, please, for the winning districts, for all the amazing work that's happening. The most improved district award in the infrastructure category goes to Bargar. Can I invite Ms. Monisha Banerjee, please? Okay, let's keep the applause going, please. Thank you. Moving on to our next category, Agriculture. The award goes to Bhargar again for best performing district. Miss Monisha Banerjee is right here. Ma'am, can we request you to take your second award? And the most improved district award goes to Koraput. Can we invite Mr. Ab Abdal Akhtar again, please? Moving on to our next category, education. And the award for that goes to Korda, again, best performing district. Can we invite Mr. Sangram Keshri Mohapatra on stage? And for the best performing district, most improved district, the award goes to Balangir. Can, can we invite Ms. Chanchal Rana? Mr. Chanchal Rana, sorry. Let's hear it for the winning districts. There's a lot of work that goes into improving the district's performance across different parameters, and these are all very, very crucial parameters. Again, the next category, health. The best performing district award goes to Sambalpur again. Mr. Parada, can we have you back here, please? And the best, most improved district award goes to Nabrangpur, Dr. Kamal Lochan Mishra. Can we invite Dr. Mishra on stage, please? <laughs> Moving on to our next category, Law and Order. Best performing district award goes to Ganjam. Can we invite Mr. K. V. Amrut? Mr. Brijesh Kumar Rai, Superintendent of Police, and uh, Mr. Pinak Mishra, Superintendent of Police again, please. Thank you. A big round of applause for those 
who make the state seem so safe. I see so many women riding two wheelers here, which is a very, very refreshing sight. And uh, for the most improved district award goes to Kendujar. Can I invite Mr. Ashish Thakre and Mr. Uh, Mitrabhanu Mahapatra, Superintendent of Police, again, please. A big round of applause. <laughs> Moving on to our next category, Social Security. The Best Performing District Award goes to Raigar. Can Raigara, the can I invite Mr. Saroj Kumar Mishra, please? <laughs> and the Most Improved District Award goes to Jagat Singhpur. Can we invite Ms. Parul Patwari, please? A big round of applause for the most improved district award to Jagat Singhpur. Moving on to women education. The best performing district award goes to Bhadrak. Can we invite Mr. Trilochan Maji? And the most improved district award goes to Malkangiri. Can we invite Mr. Vishal Singh? Moving on to our next category, entrepreneurship. And the award for the best performing district in that category goes to Jhar Sugra. Can we invite Mr. Saroj Kumar Samal back on stage? And the most improved district award goes to Jagat Singhpur. Can we invite Ms. Parul Patwari back here, please? Thank you. Let's keep the applause going, please. Moving on to our next category, skill development. Best performing district award goes to Khorda. Can we invite Mr. Sangram Keshri Mohapatra? And the most improved district award in that category goes to Sundargar. Can we invite Mr. Nikhil Pavan Kalyan? Moving on to our next category, digital coverage. The best performing district award goes to Sambalpur. Mr. Parida, can we have you back here, please? And for the most improved district, the award goes to Koraput, Mr. Abdal Akhtar. A big round of applause, please, for Koraput. Moving on to our last category, and the most crucial, sanitation. The best performing district award goes to Korda. Can we invite Mr. Sangram Keshri Mohapatra again here, please? And the most improved district award goes to Kalahandi. Can we invite Mr. G.P. Harshad? And with that, uh, we'll, we'll request our photographers to click a group photograph of the winners so that uh, all of you can proudly display this picture on your desks. Thank you. 
May I also now please request the Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Naveen Patnaik, to release the India Today State of State Report. This is the most detailed analysis on the state that has been put together by the India Today group. May I also please invite Mr. Sandeep Singh to present Mr. Mohpatra with a token of appreciation. Many congratulations to all the winners. Coming to Odisha has been a wonderful experience for all of us. We've been amazed at the quality of roads, the cleanliness that uh, Bhubaneswar uh, has showcased. And this university in, in itself is just amazing. Very, very wonderful. It's, it's been a very interesting experience for us. With that, can I please invite Mr. Naveen Patnayak, the Honorable Chief Minister of Odisha, to please deliver the keynote address on the Odisha model of governance. India today, state of states, Odisha conclave. Ladies and gentlemen, when I took over as chief minister in 2000, the state was going through a severe crisis after the 1999 super cyclone. The finances of the state were in a mess and there was no money to pay even salaries. The development activities had come to a complete halt. In those days, Odisha used to be in the news for all the wrong reasons, like hunger, poverty, disasters. In the last two decades of our government in Odisha, the state has come out of the crisis situation and has been making rapid strides in development and emerged as a role model in many fields. It was not an easy journey. We had to overcome many challenges, including a strong legacy of political corruption and administrative lethargy in the state. Large parts of the state face geographical and socio-economic hurdles but with a single-minded focus to fulfill the aspirations of the people of Orissa. We've been working with grit and determination. The people of Orissa appreciate our good governance and repose their faith in our party for five successive terms. Our model of governance is to provide transformational governance with the aim to build a new Orisa. The principles of our governance are best explained in the five T's, transparency, technology, teamwork, time, and transformation. Transparency in governance is the most important aspect of our government. We follow a zero tolerance approach towards corruption and have been taking exemplary action against such government servants. We strive towards people-centric governance through transparency, 
in the decision making and optimal utilization of the public resources toward the development of the state. We leverage the latest technology to improve the effectiveness of the governance systems and delivery of public services. For example, the Lok Seva Bhavan is completely made online. Most of the public services are now delivered online. Smart classrooms are built under the high school transformation and the classes are taken online to improve the quality of education. A model scheme for farmer empowerment like Kalia could be launched and executed within a short time thanks to technology. Governors cannot take giant leaps unless there is teamwork. All parts of the government have to be aligned towards a common goal of transforming the state. Therefore, we follow the whole of government approach, especially during the crisis situations. This is very effective, whether it is cyclone management or COVID management. The entire government machinery is involved in tackling the situation. Similarly, all segments of society also have to be made a part of this process. We strongly believe in an inclusive governance which stands for the most disadvantaged people. Therefore, we have programs for women empowerment like Mission Shakti. More than 70% of our Zilla Parishad presidents are women. We ensured that women get more than their fair share in the governance structures and become important members of our team for new Odisha. Another example is our partnership in sports. We have built partnerships with sports federations, corporates, and sports persons. Together, we established high performance centers and organized national and international tournaments. Due to such partnerships, we could help restore the glory of Indian hockey. We want to increase the pace of development and therefore, time is very important for our government. We no longer believe in incremental development. The people of the state want transformation to happen and therefore all our efforts are directed towards achieving that goal. A lot has already been achieved in the last two decades. From a situation of abject poverty and hunger we are now a leading state in paddy production. We are on a fast track of industrial development. We are top in mining and mineral-based industries like steel, aluminum, etc. Odisha has been recognized in many fields such as skill development, health initiatives like Biju, Swasti, Kalyan, Yojana urban projects like Jaga Mission, Drink from Tap, High School Transformation, Fiscal Management, Food Security, Mega Drinking Water Projects, Road Connectivity like Biju Expressway and so forth. In spite of the COVID pandemic in the last two years, Odisha is among the fastest growing states in the country. We are making huge investments across all sectors, including large irrigation projects, infrastructure development, industrial hubs, health institutions, educational initiatives, and so forth. In the next two years, 
there will be visible transformation of changes across the visa. We are confident that this will be a giant leap forward in the development history of the state and a new transformed Odisha will emerge as a leading state in the country. India today has done excellent work in recognizing the good works we have done in our districts. I congratulate all the winners who will be receiving awards today. Keep up your good work. I thank India today for having this Uriza conclave. And I especially wish to thank Mr. Raj Chengappa. Thank you. Bande Utkal Thank you very much, sir. It's been our pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. We have about a 10 minute break before we start our next panel discussion on what makes Bhubaneswar the go to place for industries.
its national income national per capita income has more than doubled in the last decade so from all parameters odisha clearly is one of the states that is that has emerged as one of the strongest states in the country our next panel discussion is on the emerging b town what makes bhubneswar the go to place for industries can i please invite my colleague mg arun the executive editor of india today magazine can we also please invite mr hemant sharma principal secretary industries department mr ranjan nayak coo jsw utkal steel mr rajiv sekhar sahu economist and mr sachin r yadav director of odisha tourism over to you ng hello good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome to all the uh, members of the eminent uh, panel that we have here we have with us mr heman sharma who is the principal secretary industries department of odisha we have mr ranjan nayak ceo of jsw steel we have mr rajiv shekar sahu who is an economist and we have mr sachin jadav director odisha tourism according to a state focus paper conducted by nabard the annual average growth rate of industry sector in odisha during the last 9 years is projected at 5.3% compared to the national average of 3.77% industry contributes 36.26% of the state's gross value added compared to 26% at the national level given all this the state has really taken a lot of strides over the last couple of decades and we have heard some of some aspects of it from the honorable chief minister mr navin patnaik moments ago in this panel we would like to see what are the areas where we can still look at for improvement how do we tap the whole potential of the state in various aspects be it in mining be it in infrastructure and be it in other aspects of governance so let me start with mr heman sharma mr sharma i have just mentioned some of the facts regarding the industrial growth uh, and how the state has achieved a lot more than the national level it has even attracted investment to the level of 3 lakh crore and created 1.1 lakh jobs during the pandemic years so if you can just give us an idea as to how you made this happen and maybe it can be modeled for the other states too thank you arun ji for giving a for a for giving a brilliant introduction about some of the work which our government has done on the industrial development front now uh, you asked me uh, what model have we followed what is it that we have done which has given the state of orissa a consistent economic growth in fact remarkable economic growth on the industrial front and on the services front particularly in the last few years as compared to the national averages so i would say you know uh, there are four pillars on which this industrial development in this entire industrial ecosystem has been built which distinguishes us from most other states i would say and these four pillars are governance uh, infrastructure policy and raw material so these are the four pillars you know you, any building stands on four pillars these four pillars consistent work on growing strengthening these four pillars have given us good results on our economic and industrial development front 
you know on governance our government uh, uh, under the leadership of honorable chief minister it's stable it is focused and it is growth and welfare oriented this political stability also gives us financial strength which enables our government to put more and more resources not only for people's welfare through direct benefit schemes but also investing in robust infrastructure so which gives us the second pillar of our growth which is robust infrastructure our ports airports railways roadways industrial parks industrial estates water supply schemes power supply schemes have all come together because of immense investments which the government has made arising out of its political and financial stability in our industrial infrastructure so that's the second pillar now the third pillar is policy now all this would still not have given us good growth had it not been for positive growth oriented policies market oriented policies trying to address the interests of investors trying to address their day to day issues reducing their pain points whether it is through industrial policy or tourism policy or food processing policy and this one of the basic policies which we adopted early on in early 2000 is the policy of value addition in the huge natural resources the raw material base which we have so we were the largest producer of iron ore and bauxite today we are the largest producer of steel the largest producer of stainless steel so from iron ore we have moved to steel we were the largest producer of bauxite but now we are the single largest producer of alumina and aluminium so we have consistently moved from being leaders in raw material to leaders in industrial goods and products now this raw material and this so this is the resource advantage the resource pillar which i mentioned now this resource pillar is not limited to only the natural resources but also a significant investment a significant plan which has gone into improving our what are called human resources today skilled in orissa is a brand you would be i am sure that uh, you would be aware and many of our invited guests might also be aware that uh, the investments which government made in our itis in our polytechnics in our engineering colleges uh, is it brought us at the forefront of skill development in the country orissa's model of skill development is is now known across the uh, across the country so much so that uh, to this year in the national skills competition out of the 81 medals which were on offer our state trainees got 53 medals in the top 100 list of itis brought out by government of india today 11 of the itis are from orissa see we represent about 4% of india's population but 11% of india's highly skilled manpower comes from uh, orissa now you go to any of the manufacturing destinations in the country today whether it is noida greater noida bangalore chennai coimbatore tirupur pune bangalore hyderabad and all, all of course all areas in bhubaneswar you would find that the most disciplined the most productive and the most skilled workers are from orissa no wonder that orissa is at the forefront of this industrial development right that was a brilliant answer now i would like to touch upon you know one key aspect and i think it's an aspect where a number of states have stumbled you know this is when it comes to large scale manufacturing mining you know in the quest for natural resources the issues related to land you know land land acquisition etc etc now we have with us uh, mr hemant sorry mr ranjan nayak and i would like to know from mr nayak you know what has been the experience of jsw because jsw utkal steel is coming up with uh, a very huge steel plant 1. Point, uh, sorry 13.2 million tons uh, steel plant here in the state i would like to know from him his experience of working in the state as a large you know uh, 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 group as a conglomerate and um, especially with regard to the setting up of the steel plant the environmental clearance etc yeah thank you yeah uh, so good morning ladies and gentlemen so uh, i would like to uh, twist your question a little bit actually first of all why odisha and second thing what has been our experience in odisha and third thing what is our plan actually oh, no why odisha just we i would like to take a step back if i look at the current setup setup of geopolitical issues in the world so india is in the is in the sweet spot so india is going to be the 5 trillion economy backed up by capital investment by so many things so then who is going to lead this drive for india 
So then let's take example of USA, China. This is the regional economies which have driven the overall country's economy. Like for example, California, Texas, or New York. So they are, each one of them is more than a trillion dollar economy. California is led by the IT technology. Your New York is the financial hub. Third is the Texas. Texas is the manufacturing or resource base. Then let's come to another country, interesting country, that is China. Again, Guangzhou, then Jinghasu, and Hawaii. If you look at the, on, all of them are in the eastern sector. If you look at the Hawaii province, it's boasts around 300 million tons of steel, 100 million tons of uh, no, cement, 150 million tons of coal, then iron ore, and so and so. So these are the economies which have driven any country's economy when it goes beyond two to three million, uh, I mean three trillion dollar. So now I don't have to answer why, I mean, who is going to drive India's economy? You all can derive that who is the best place to drive India's economy? That is Odisha. I don't have any doubt on this. Then how it is going to happen? You know, next decade, India's, India's economy, I think I am I'm telling a few things from you, but, uh, but let me continue. I take that. Yeah. So then, then what happens in Odisha, what has happened? It has gone into the super cycle. Super cycle means the spiraling economic growth, mainly driven by the resource nationalism. That is your auction. I think many people have told that. So with this kind of now the now the state of Odisha is in a very good balance. It is very good. Yeah. So it's a it's a positive revenue. So these these money will rival back to to creating infrastructure and the social scheme. So what does it mean to an industry player like us? That means we will get a better road, better infrastructure access, and a happier people. That is what we need. You know, so yesterday, I, I mean, two days back, we had a new mine, which, which was in, I mean, in Sundargarh district. A public hearing was done. And I was amazed the road access to that mine is already done. So we don't have to do anything there. Already infrastructure is there, already, you know, Telephone lines are there, your internet connectivity is there. So, so much easier to uh, start the mine. It was never imagined in, I mean, a four-lane road is going across that mine. It is never, on, not across, uh, I mean, India, you go to any country, Australia, Brazil, it's not there. So, this is the readiness, this is the what we are going to do. Coming back to your question, Mr. Arun, you know, JSW Steel has, is the leading steel producer with 28 million ton. With, with, so, with so many other verticals like energy, cement, sports and all, we are going to be 50 million ton and 75 million ton by 2035. It's not far away. So we are going to create the next wave of growth in Odisha. Odisha is going to be our focus. What is JSW today? Another JSW is going to be created in Odisha. How? So next question is how? So we are going to build, apart from you know mining, we are already doing mining around 30 million tons. We are expanding our mining capacity to 50 million tons. Apart from that, and, and we have acquired a uh, steel plant in, uh, I mean, in the district of Jharsuguda that is uh, Bhushan Power through NCLT process that is going, going through the tremendous uh, you know, expansion process. Apart from that, we are going to build the North India's world's best steel plant in Jagsingpur. So, uh, with a lighter tone, I can tell that steel plant will be such a best steel plant in terms of technology, in terms of uh, location. If the whole steel demand in the world goes down to 20 million ton, if there is only one steel plant in the world, not in India, if it runs, that will be Jakshimpur steel plant because, because not due to iron ore. You know, everybody tells that let's come to Odisha for iron ore. It's not iron ore. I don't know, you have Simandu I don't know, deposit in Africa. Billions of tons, one of the best deposit. You have, you know, uh, I don't know, deposit in Gatchuruli, in Maharashtra. You have in Chhattisgarh. But Odisha has got a blend of everything, as Mr. Sarma was telling, is the natural resources, is the, is, the, is, the, is the working style of the governance system. That is what brings. And coming back to our, la our land, uh, you know, land acquisition process in the, in the Jakshimpur, let me tell you, friends, the collaboration, how it does with the government, you know, government bureaucracy, administration, then the people are the, are the, uh, you know, on the, on the ground, that collaboration model wonderfully works without any, any, uh, any issue or anything. 
So it has been a land acquisition process has been a learning, great learning for, for us. And, and it has been, been successfully doing under the guidance of the local administration, SP and collector. So all of them actually we lightly tell, you know, they are our CEO, not, not us, we just follow them. So that is what, uh, I mean, with, with a lighter tone. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So from what you said, you know, the state has really gone a long way from the experiences of POSCO, for instance, you know, which, which uh, left everybody wondering as to how states would come up, you know, with credible policies as far as land acquisition is concerned. We'll have more of it later. Uh, I think, you know, to throw some light on, on the, period, the, the progress made across the various decades as far as uh, Odisha's industrial development is concerned, we have an eminent economist, Mr. Rajib Shekhar Sahu. So, Mr. Sahu, if you can just give an idea uh, from your observation, how the state has evolved over the past several uh, years. Mr. Chengapa in his speech has had mentioned as to, uh, you know, the last couple of decades and the kind of, you know, focused policies the government has taken. As an, as an independent economist, if you could just throw light on you know, some of the lessons we could carry home, you know, for the other states. So, and India today for this conclave and the great opportunity for all of us to debate on Odisha. And uh, I think all of us are privileged to be… Our debt is only in around 19 percent. If any student of economics can compare, will visualize how the state has changed during this period. I still remember that during 97, 98, 98, 99, Odisha was in a debt trap. They were not able to pay the salary in time. They were not able to meet, forget about the capital expenditure. Many of the revenue expenditures were deferred so that they can accommodate in the subsequent years and there will be a backlog uh, going forward. Now, from that stage, during 5, 6 and 7, 8, the debt became zero. And due to many prudent practices that was done, starting from substituting the high cost debt by low debt and low cost debt to rationalizing the expenditure and increasing the incomes. And that was a major achievement. And today you will find all the states or most of the uh, leading states or the so-called leading states like Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, uh, Rajasthan, they are still struggling and their debt size has reached between 25 to 30 percent and some of them are more than 30 percent and at that same time, Odisha is still around 19 percent. And you can imagine, one figure will give you and that will also speak about the stability. Odisha was the first step to adopt the new MMDR policy and the auctioning process and the last year, that is 2021, the mining revenue was 13,000 crores. And 21-22, it became 48,000 crores. Gentlemen, a big round of clap for all those people who are involved in this 300 percent plus increase of the mining revenue. Earlier, it was being told all the richness of the state are below the ground and all the above are all poor people. Now, it is the richness which has come to the surface and we all are going to get the benefit of it. And I can tell you, this transformation is first due to a stable government and a good governance and led by our Honorable Chief Minister of Odisha, Sri Navin Patnaikji. And to supplement that, I must tell you certain truth which, is, which may not be told, a strong and intelligent, active bureaucracy, which is spearheading this movement. Some of them are here, some of them are there, and they deserve a big compliment. The way, in a very scientific and a good governance process, they right. have been able to take it forward. Right. Now, the industrialization, which now contributes about 46 percent plus, is also factored by a very stable and good law and order situation, which uh, our right. friend the from governance. Jindal has already told and going forward, if you see, we will be one of the, we are one of the best state and one more statistics I will tell you, Odisha has recorded the highest growth in GST, month after month. 
and they are now the highest growth state in the country. They have beat all the states in the country and will, I am sure, they will continue to grow at this fashion, the way the governance and the growth of mining and industry is taking place. Right. And a visionary step, both at the top, at the bureaucratic level, and they have aligned people in the process. Right. It is not that industry is being developed, alienating the people. Absolutely. Today, every person in the state wants the state to be well industrialized, developed, increase its footprint in every sphere. Okay. And I was listening to what Hemant Sarmaji was telling, that our talent is there everywhere. Okay. You go to Damandu, you go to Noida, you go to Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, everywhere our skilled people are there. Yeah. That, is, that also indicates our education system is good, our skilled manpower can perform, and with this growth and the way uh, 4 lakh crore investment is being uh, seen to be coming yeah. in the shortest period. Yeah, Mr. Sahu, I mean, I just want to pick up one point that you have mentioned, you know, where um, you said that uh, the, pro the progress of a state should not come into conflict with a whole lot of other social factors, with the environment, even tourism. And that is where I want to bring in uh, uh, Mr. Sachin Jadav, who is the director of uh, Odisha Tourism. So here you have a state which is really steeped in culture, um, which has got, you know, several uh, scenic spots which, uh, you know, many of us are familiar with. At the same time, you know, you have got industries which, uh, which need to thrive, you know, to, uh, to ensure that the state is also in the development path. You have been telling me backstage that, you know, there is, the state follows a unique example of marrying both, uh, you know, these two aspects and having an in, a t tourism, an industry-focused tourism in place. If you could just give some highlights of that. Thank you. Given the constraint of time, I would limit myself to the industrial aspect of tourism. Tourism is often an underestimated, underrated, and misperceived sector. And it is really reassuring that India today has recognized tourism fit enough and eligible enough to sit on the same dais as industry. And Odisha is one of the few states, if not the only states in India, which has accorded the status of focus industry sector to tourism. And accordingly, figures speak for themselves. The kind of attention that the government, this government is giving to tourism, the importance of tourism sector, it has understood. 9 to 13 percent of GDP is contributed by tourism sector alone. And if we see the figures, over last one year, the state GDP, more than 50,000 crore rupees of state GDP is contributed to the tourism sector alone. A factor of three is given for indirect employment to direct employment engaged in tourism. And tourism industry is one of the most employment generating sectors in the state, in the, in the world in fact. And given these figures, the state has not only aligned the tourism policy with industrial policy resolutions, but also fast-tracked the approvals of projects coming into the tourism sector. To give one simple example, in the last three years alone, more than 60 projects have been cleared through fast-track mechanism, amounting to 2,400 2, crores rupees of projects. If you see this Bhuvaneshwar city, which was appreciated by the anchor conducting the program previously about Bhuvaneshwar, there were hardly three four-star and above category hotels in Bhuneshwar three years ago. Today, three five-star hotels are in place already and ten hotels are approved and they will come again coming one year. Tourism is a mirror to the industry. If we are to attract good talent in industrial sector, you need recreational facilities, you need good accommodation and you need travel. Over last two years, because of this pandemic, this sector has been hit hard. But if you see the status of today, you will hardly find any uh, accommodation in uh, Odisha in hotels because the revenge tourism and slow tourism, they are taking place. And recognizing these things, the Odisha government is taking uh, appropriate uh, measures in this direction of promoting tourism as an industry, not just as cultural and heritage and recreational aspect. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for keeping it brief also. Uh, we, have, uh, we are running out of time, so I want to quickly go through to each one of you with uh, a few things. One um, uh, to Mr. Sharma, you know, 
of course we, odisha is is really blessed with natural resources but at the same time you know you need to focus on a whole lot of other uh, industries especially the service oriented industries which are big job creators so if you can give an idea of you know some of the uh, the way you have diversified your focus from just mining into some of the other sectors and also the thrust on infrastructure because you know only if you have efficient infrastructure you can really attract more investment so if you can take 2 minutes just to say that then we will quickly go to the others right i think uh, see having built a very strong base of heavy industry large industry through our mining metallurgy and metal complexes there is a policy driven approach to broad base this industrialization by attracting more and more industries in other focus sectors tourism for one food processing ancillary and downstream of metals apparel textiles technical textiles it ites so all all these industries are what they are a they are employment intensive b they where we have certain comparative advantage for instance we have a large coastline which gives us good seafood resources we have a very rich agriculture because of uh, improved irrigation which gives a, so that gives us a growth potential for food processing industries the natural and scenic his, uh, beauty of orissa gives us good potential for tourism so even in this broad basing effort we have uh, tried to pick up sectors where we have a natural advantage and then through policy driven support bringing up good infrastructure in these areas as my colleague was mentioning so we have earmarked specific sector specific policies sector specific industrial and infrastructure parks which target these industries uh, so we have one of the best seafood parks in the country today outskirts of bhubaneswar we have one of the best electronics manufacturing cluster on the outskirts of bhubaneswar the technical and textile parks coming up at paradeep bhadrak baleshwar gopalpur they are all very vibrant places where this broad basing is happening now on the infrastructure front in the year 2000 we had one port paradeep which of course today is the largest port uh, in public sector in the country now we have two more at dhamra and at gopalpur another port at suvarn rekha is coming up large industries like jsw arslan mittal they are, they are coming up they are very large captive jetties our rail network which was earlier meant only for mineral movement is today aligned to entire national the east coast economic corridor which is part of the where we odisha uh, east coast is also a part then the east coast de uh, dedicated freight corridor more interestingly on the western and southern part of orissa our government has invested very heavily in the biju express way which connects nine of our comparatively you know regionally backward districts and along that express way we are developing parks for micro small and medium enterprises our startup ecosystem at bhubaneswar where we have series of incubators in our good educational institutions like this institution right. for instance this is our effort towards broad basing the industrial growth and it is giving us good and consistent results right uh, mr nayak if you could just give an idea of you know being from the industry um, what is the kind of infrastructure requirement that you still would like the state government to come up with you already have your you know captive uh, you know jetties etc to you know ensure your raw material movement is, is there anything more you want to add on this so really i don't uh, think it's you know we should be very you know uh, uh, very skeptical about the infrastructure because it is already there almost your railway is there road is there very good roads you know from bodbil to bhubaneswar it takes 4 hours so uh, so the government of odisha will do its own part what we have to do as a industry we have to you know make additives on this actually so what we need like like uh, like we have been discussing with the district collector of keunjar that will make a you know conveyor belt conveyorization and all those infrastructure has to also come from the industry also from a large extent and government of odisha will do its own part so we need not get bothered about that and one more uh, as i've got the opportunity one more uh, tip to our industry friends that uh, that be patient and be strategic and be, do your own homework uh, before doing any kind of meeting actually today morning i had a very ba bad experience that i was not prepared very well while meeting one of the bureaucrats because he asked me certain questions which i could not answer so that way we have to be very smart actually as a industry because because the digitalization of the government of odisha and, and its bureaucrats are far ia i mean far ia so we have to also match that uh, that pace and that uh, that information so that is my only tip to our industry friends and don't be too clever and too you know to you need not be actually so be patient and just go steady that's that's all okay great uh, mr jadav i just want to bring you in uh, 
from the tourism point of view, uh, you know, what is what is what are your expectations? Is there something that you feel that you know the state could uh, show the way when it comes to promoting? You know, uh, you may you may pursue me as being partial to the government because I'm part of the government itself. But the government is doing more than what can be expected. In last three years alone, our budget allocation has enhanced six times. Can you imagine this in any state of India? And not only that, beyond government works through departments. Leave alone the allocation of uh, budget or finances to tourism department. Even beyond tourism department also, more than 1,500 crore rupees have been allocated for creation of specific tourism products related to culture and heritage. So this is unheard of in the history. So Odisha is uh, uh, at a juncture when it is uh, just waiting to, uh, this tourism sector is waiting to explore for the positive. Okay. Okay, Mr. Sahu, finally to you. Um, if you could just tell us maybe three takeaways, three things that you feel is key to the Orissa model, which other states could emulate. Uh, I'll give you a small example before I go into these three things. I was in Delhi, so I met a couple of people and uh, somebody introduced, oh, this man is from Odisha. He said, yes, I am putting up my industry in Odisha. And he said, oh, you have gone to Odisha? He said, yes, udar koi kuch mangta nahi hai. Baki koi bhi state jao, oh, sab mangta hai pahle kitna dega. Either koi mangta nahi hamne, I have already set up my industry. Now, this is something very unique and we all should be proud of what, uh, I mean, people's perception about Odisha is. Now, about uh, Odisha, as I told you, the leadership, that is number one, I think that takes between one to fifty. And the sustainable model with which we are working, the participative governance model, where no party feels that he has been bulldozed. You have seen in Puri, people have come and volunteered to give land for development of Puri. So that is another unique model where everybody is taken together. Odisha government is also futuristic. They are working with a vision. Just because we have iron ore, we are not talking of only the steel plants. At the right time, the government, the bureaucracy is thinking of diversifying into new generation of industries, which will give more employment, less pollution, and take care of larger sections of the society and the talent. So these are some of the good steps uh, government is taking, which other governments should also take into account. Wonderful. So thank you so much uh, for, for your brilliant observations. And I think today we have had a few takeaways from this, uh, from this panel discussion that we have had. I thank all the, uh, you know, uh, honorable members of the, the panel and as well as the, the, the audience, lovely audience that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, MG, and a big thank you to all the panelists. Can I please uh, invite Mr. D.S. Behera and Mr. S.K. Sahu to please come on stage and present our guests with a token of appreciation. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, uh, hearing all of you share your insights about the industrial uh, potential and all the opportunities that Urissa and Bhubaneswar have to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Moving on from big industry to startups. Bhubaneswar as a startup destination, achievements and challenges. Can I please invite Dr. Omkar Rai, Chairman of OHUB, Mr. Devi Prasad Sarangi, Chief Executive Officer of iServeU Technology, Mr. Binayak Acharya, Founder of Think Zone, and Ms. Ambika Satapati, Founder of Zoo Fresh Foods. So what's fascinating here with our panel is that all of them are highly accomplished and all of them are from Orissa. We have uh, Dr. Omkar Rai who is heading OHUB which has been constituted to promote the spirit of entrepreneurship in Orissa. We have Devi Prasad Sarangi, Chief Executive Officer of iServeU Technology. Can you just raise your hand? Yeah, right there. One of the most successful startups coming out of Odisha and he wants to project himself as a brand ambassador for, for Odisha, for young people all across the country to come to Odisha and start up. We have Binayak Acharya, founder of Think Zone. Binayak has been doing some fantastic work in the field of learning and improving learning outcomes, especially amongst those who, ca who cannot afford to access expensive avenues for learning and education. And we have Ambika Satapati, who is uh, actually a Delhi girl, but married to an Uriya, and she's made Orissa her home, and she manages the business from Orissa and, uh, and Delhi, of course. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Let me begin by asking Dr. Rai, since uh, his job is to promote the spirit of entrepreneurship. Dr. Rai, uh, just tell us a little bit about what OHUB is trying to do right now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, first of all, since I have newly joined this state, uh, I must congratulate you for organizing this very event and this very session. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the OHUB is an offering of a startup Odisha initiative of the government of Odisha. OHUB is a place where uh, we will host the startups, apply best practices, connect to the you know, uh, ecosystem players like mentors, investors, venture capitalists, all sorts of you know, ecosystem players will be brought on one roof. Apart from that, OHUB is also going to act as a hub, uh, which will connect to all the incubators, entrepreneurial cell, academia, R&D institutions, startups all across Odisha. So OHUB is a place where from all the best practices will be disseminated, workshops will be held, Mentor Connect will be held, uh, pitching sessions will be held, and all sorts of services that are supposed to be offered by government of Odisha to the startup incubator communities at large will be delivered. So what is so the cutoff to be able to uh, access the services being offered at OHUB? As of now, uh, Odisha came up with the uh, Odisha Startup Policy 2016. And it was rolled out with the Youth Innovation Fund, funds of funds, um, recognition and grants to incubators, supporting to the incubators, bringing out mentors, investors on board. Apart from that, we are also, you know, engaging with the startups, understanding their problem, facilitating them, helping them in branding and all. And therefore, if you look at the kind of uh, uh, achievement that we have made so far out of uh, uh, the target that we had 5,000 by 2025, we have already crossed uh, 1,280 startups by now. 
and uh, out of these 1200 it startups odisha is the state where you will find that women contribute 40% of the entire startup uh, ecosystem in this nation that's so amazing. we are the leading state in the entire uh, country apart from that uh, you have co panelists they are very celebrated startup we have a dozen of startups who are making lot of noise lot of uh, you know news all across the country and therefore uh, the kind of funding that has been generated the kind of branding that has been attracted to odisha is enormous we are we are revising our odisha startup policy in the year 2022 itself and this will uh, you know incorporate all the learning that we have all the expectation that a startup community of odisha had at large and we will make it odisha startup policy okay number one in this na nation particularly in terms of making it a uh, best efficient most smooth and maximum in the ease of doing business okay that's very encouraging to hear mr sarangi you run one of the most successful startups out of odisha yet when we look at the list of unicorns none of them are out of the state yes. um what are, what do you see are the challenges i will come to the opportunities later but since uh, you know we've had a detailed road map from dr rai here on what the state is trying to do what do you think are the challenges why is it that startups are a little uh, still not as uh, uh, they don't view odisha as a very lucrative state to start out in first of all like uh, thanks for inviting me to this event so i would take very few moments to explain about what we do uh, then i guess it would make sense for others to understand basically so uh, what we do is i serve as a fintech startup we started this before four to five years ago and what we effectively do is we are infrastructure provided to banks other fintechs other enterprises who wants to build a uh, fintech product and why uh, we are uh, i mean we thought of building this because if you'll see today we are really have reached into a exciting time where everybody has got a smartphone everybody has got uh, their aadhar right everybody has bank account today everybody has got access to upi today so i believe uh, going forward be it a, a tech startup or be a ecom startup everybody want to build their own financial services and which should be embedded into their mobile applications right so having said that we believe everybody every company going to become a fintech company in in future right so that's why our solution is been built in such a way where as a startup be a startup or be a, any other enterprise who want to build any sort of financial service you don't need to worry about the license because it's financial services so it is under rbi's purview so you, uh, we will take care of your license we will take care of your tech stack we will provide you solutions inside your mobile app or inside your platform which would be completely seamless so that's how uh, we are helping uh, other companies or other fintechs or other in enterprises right and why i'm saying this because i think it is pretty important to understand like how uh, we have achieved the scale so last year we did around 12000 crore of transaction volume we uh, did around 80 crore of uh, revenue and we raised our second round which is 100 crore of uh, revenue uh, fund raising in in last month before that we in the last round we did around 50 crore uh, funding so if you'll see within a year uh, and in terms of valuation our last round was at 100 crore whereas uh, the last month round was we did 500 crore so which is a almost a 5x jump within a year so i believe uh, from your perspective i think there uh, that that's true i mean be it flipkart or paytm of the world or zomato of the world you'll find all the unicorns based out of delhi and and mumbai or or probably in bangalore right so that's why i believe other startups are not coming to bhubneswar because there is no success story but i believe with i serve you story what i'm trying to tell you is we have Uh, created a scale now uh, we are now like 400 resources uh, and uh, also i would like to mention that when uh, there is a immense pressure from my investor to uh, you know open up a office space in bangalore and uh, invest into the our tech resources in bangalore so i was a bit skeptic uh, whether it, what to do then i think uh, there is a salvat like mr vijay sir who has helped us instead of going to bangalore like we have so we we thought of we decided to expand our uh, office space here only right so <coughs> what i'm saying is now we have created uh, enough Did you have access to talent in odisha yes of course i think that's why we, we we are here today i think more than 100 plus engineering colleges are here you will find a lot of uh, talented graduates you just need to train them i mean we are 
training more than 500 engineers our plan is to train at least 500 fresher engineers into emb which is a payment technology so as a result in future anybody who be it global or be it domestic company who wants to uh, build any payment product today everybody see chennai or bangalore as a payment hub i think in in two to three years everybody would like to come down to odisha because the sort of talent we are creating i think it will okay. be in the market all right we'll we'll, yeah. we'll come back to you later uh, binayak uh, let's uh, let's let's talk about your journey. You're working uh, with little children and uh, enabling them to learn better. Uh, why Odisha one, and uh, what are the opportunities and challenges that you see in the state? Uh, so uh, I'll start uh, with your first question as why Odisha. Uh, you know we have been uh, discussing a lot about, uh, uh, and this is across this uh, across the entire country of the challenges that we uh, we as a country still have. We have a uh, we have to you know move forward uh, in 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 every aspect. Uh, so uh, I feel uh, in the state of Odisha we still have opportunities in different uh, you know segments, be it healthcare, be it education, where uh, we are working. Uh, so uh, so our goal basically is to uh, like at Thingzone is to improve the learning outcomes of children uh, from a low resource settings. So ideally, uh, like. If if someone like out here would listen to this, they would say that okay, we are uh, uh, we are working as a civil society organization. We are you know we are an NGO. Uh, why you are working in this space? Uh, the whole reason that uh, like uh, Things Zone was started over here is that we have seen opportunities uh, of not only you know benefiting uh, our end users, but also a lot of positives in terms of synergies that we can uh, work uh, with with different government authorities. Uh, so at Things Zone, like uh, we have been uh, you know really. Being supported by by startup odisha uh, in uh, like when we were just uh, ideating and starting out and uh, uh, and this is not just about things one but i know of stories of many other uh, you know startups who have had you know partnerships with government while implementing their programs so we at things one have been working with you know uh, state departments uh, uh, like the uh, like the mo school abhiyan of uh, uh, of department of uh, school and mass education wherein we have been implementing our programs along with them uh, we have also piloted our solutions uh, uh, in different districts of odisha uh, now the the challenge that i feel over here is how do we take from the pilot stage to the scale stage that is where uh, I feel uh, uh, us, uh, uh, like uh, the state as a whole could really do better for other startups because startups are getting opportunities but how do you convert those pilots and opportunities to scale it across the, uh, the entire state is, is something uh, which I feel is a very good opportunity for, uh, for everyone. Okay, alright. Uh, let me bring in Ambika here. Ambika, uh, you run your business out of Delhi and Rudisha a lot. A big part of your business is driven out of the state. Um, so t tell me what are the opportunities that you see here and then we'll come to the challenges later. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, I, I'm not an Odia, I'm married to an Odia but in fact I've spent the last eight years uh, in Odisha and just a fortnight ago we moved to Delhi. Uh, we continue to have a, a largest uh, operation as well as offices and teams out of Odisha. Uh, and in fact when we first came here we based ourselves out of Bhavani Patna and not Bhubaneswar, which is a, a small town on the other side of the state. Um, the reason that we came was personal. Uh, we were interested in the food industry. Uh, we run a fish and meat business. Uh, the name of the company is Zoo Fresh Foods and the brand is Fresher. And anybody who's been to Bhavani Patna would probably have seen Fresher's uh, imposing outlet at, at uh, the Vimla Convent Road. Um, we came because my husband was in Odia and he wanted to start his own business. He quit his government job and came. And his first instinct was that, you know, if I'm going to take a risk, right, because starting a business is a risk, let me do it on home ground. Because that is where I will get the love and the support that is needed to tolerate those early years of struggles and failures, right? And he was absolutely right in that decision because uh, we came for a personal reason, but then we stuck for a business reason because of two things. One is we saw that at least for our industry, the food industry, for fish and meat, which is where we are operating in, uh, the state is a very large market. It will probably be worth 4,000, 5,000 crores, right? So there is no reason why a 1,000 crore business cannot be built out of Odisha. And the second reason was that we got a lot of support 
from the government um, and from all the policy making bodies. So we've been very closely associated with Startup Odisha uh, from its early days. Uh, we were incubated by KIT TBI. Um, and then we have partnerships with the Odisha Poultry Federation as well as the Odisha Fishery Federation. So I think that kind of support that we got, I don't know whether we would have got it in another state. Okay. And uh, even in terms of uh, you know being able to hire, uh, we are very proud to say that almost 100% of our workforce is local and is Odia, right? And many of them from West Western Odisha. So it, I think it's been a great experience. From a law and order perspective, you gave an award for that. Um, I would say it's just fantastic, 10 out of 10. I operate as a woman very often. Um, thank you. When we used to live in Bhavani Patna, we had our own farms on the outskirts of the town, 7-8 kilometers outside of the town. I would drive alone sometimes at 7-8 in the night and there would never be any problem. So I think it's women friendly, it's safe, law and order ex excellent, lot of support from the government and uh, for many of the commodities we are in, the market size is also large. Wonderful. It's so encouraging to hear this. I love the point that Dr. Rai raised that 40% of the startup uh, founders out of Odisha are women, which is a huge aberration from what's happening in the rest of the country. So for startups to scale and to, to, to build a business that will grow, what you need is access to finance. That's one. Then, of course, you need, uh, you need a market, you need mentors to guide you through. Uh, Dr. Rai did mention that you know, you're working on ease of doing business. That's something that startups really crave for. So I want to uh, uh, ask you, Dr. Rai, when it comes to ease of doing business, what are the, uh, you know, what are the, uh, how are you making it easier for startups? To start out, one, and then to scale. What are, in terms of clearances, permissions, income tax filings, all of those? See, there are services and there are regulatory issues you are referring to. As far as regulation is concerned, the startup ecosystem in Odisha is absolutely regulation free. As far as promotion is concerned, we will bring all those services. We have already brought, we are actually bringing one after other. We are evolving in the terms of uh, delivery of services to the you know, startup ecosystem. So all these services that you have just mentioned like mentoring support, investor support, uh, regulatory support, or or other compliance support that they are required to do, they, that all will be provided and facilitated and, and enabled by way of a policy, which is uh, again being revised in year 2022. We are very participatory, we are very open, we, we do consultations, we seek support, we seek uh, ideas, opinions, inputs and feedbacks and we have very seamless communication with the startup community as has been vetted by co-panelists just now. So our, our idea is that we make our policy the best, best in the country itself. How do you do that? Do uh, you get it in? Is, it is with the consultation process, feedback and input, with the learnings that we had, the kind of experience they are undergoing. They will give us feedback, they will guide us in making a best policy. We believe, we aspire that, okay, we, we know that we cannot match Bangalore, Pune, Chennai right now in terms of unicorns. But what we can do is that we be, can become number one in the entire nation in terms of ease of doing business, in terms of being most industry friendly, in terms of bringing best policies in place, best promotional policies. And whatever policy we bring, we will try to make it very efficient, industry friendly, and we will implement it in the best possible manner. So okay. that's the kind of, you know, ecosystem, that kind of uh, brand we want to create for the government of Odisha. Okay. Mrs. Sarangi, the startup story in Odisha is fairly new. Like Bangalore, you know, you had Infosys coming out of there, the IT revolution came out of there. Odisha is, has started out and it's uh, going at a great speed, but it is, it, it's been slightly, it's, it's a, it's, uh, progress is fast, but it got on to this whole startup uh, world a little later than the, than the states that we see that are doing really well. Uh, in your opinion, what can Dr. Rai and the government do to enable the fintech sector specifically further? So from my perspective, to sort of scale, you need two things. One is access to capital and the other thing is uh, talent. I think uh, and as from our uh, perspective, when we have started, we have been supported by two entities. One is Kid TBI, where we got incubated and again Startup Odisha. I think they keep supporting uh, each and every startup who are coming out of Odisha both the entity, Startup Odisha as well as KTBI. So I think access to capital is there. I think uh, whenever needed, they have always supported us in terms of capital. And in terms of talent, I believe, uh, because there are, 
as, as I mentioned you, there are already 100 plus engineering colleges are here. So I think there is no lacking of uh, in terms of talent. But uh, what is missing here is in terms of uh, when you want to scale, you of course want to raise higher amount of capital. So I think what from my perspective they should collaborate with uh, BCs, uh, you know, my angel investors. And, and of course like mentors, so who can guide other small fintech startups uh, in terms of uh, raising fund, in terms of uh, building out product at scale and connect and a lot of ODI guys are uh, working at RBI uh, or you go to any bank, any PSU bank, uh, they, they, uh, you will find ODI guys there, right? So I think in terms of connectivity, today we count India Post Payment Bank, uh, Common Service Center, you, you name any private bank, they use our software today. I think that that only happened because a lot of ODI guys are sitting out there. I mean, we got help from them, right? That's how we we uh, got the opportunity so the to Uriya work with. So the ODI Connect helped you. Yes, everywhere. Of course. Okay. Yes, I think it and it can be scaled if uh, this kind of event when we are organi organizing or or when startup ODI is organizing. I think if they can invite uh, you, I think uh, we have a ODI guy called Rajiv Misra who is, who is heading SoftBank. You, you go to any I mean, venture capitalist, banks, you will find our ODI guys. Just, I mean, we need to connect with them. And earlier when I was mentioning, I think I was mentioning about uh, Mr. Rajiv Sahu. <laughs> that was my bed. I, I have taken somebody else's name. Uh, I was mentioning Mr. Rajiv Sahu, who has helped us in terms of scaling it up. And I think also he is helping us in terms of connect with RBI because RBI governor is, by the way, his schoolmate. So we are also getting a lot of help from uh, mentors like him. I think, uh, yeah, I think other startups also need mentors like him. Okay. Binayak, uh, you're in the learning space. The last two years have been, uh, uh, you know, they have seen a sea change in the area of learning. And the kind of work you're doing can, can really cross borders and boundaries. You're, you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, compensating learning through WhatsApp messages, voice messages, right? That's that's something that you're looking at doing. Uh, what would, what kind of support do you think you can get uh, to be able to scale? Because there's a huge potential for great Im impact in the kind of work that you're doing. So, uh, so as you correctly mentioned, uh, that the last two years has been, you know, in terms of uh, the valuations of edtech startups uh, and the amount of money that is being pulled into startups is uh, is is really huge. Uh, but here is the, uh, you know, the, you can say the problem is that the, the, the target segment that these startups are catering to is not even, I think, 10% of the entire children that uh, we are, uh, that are there uh, in the country as a whole. So what we need is, you know, innovative solutions which can least, uh, reach to the last mile. Uh, so, uh, so maybe I can say this that uh, there's this thing of India and Bharat and maybe we need an edtech uh, for a Naya Bharat maybe wherein uh, these solutions are actually reaching to the final mile uh, to, to children who are there in public schools and uh, creating you know a model out of it uh, which is sustainable. So, uh, so maybe uh, if, uh, if the end users, like in our case, uh, uh, our solution is always free for the end users. We don't charge anything to children, we don't charge anything to teachers or the, or the youth who we, uh, uh, who we work with. But could we again create a sustainable model out of it for their, uh, like I said, mentioned some time back, but we need… But isn't that your job to figure out a sustainable model? Exactly. So that is where I feel and uh, this is I think a very uh, uh, a nice uh, place to, to share this that because there are so many, so many senior, uh, you know, government dignitaries over here, could we, could we give opportunities to startups uh, in, in working along with them in, in, in sector where they feel they could add value? So, so even if uh, like such a solution is implemented, uh, the uh, you know the end user, be it uh, children in our case or maybe teachers, have benefited out of it, and it is not costing them anything. So, could we create a synergy wherein it is sustainable, and at the end of the day, it is creating positive value? So that is where I feel uh, if if something of that model, uh, a, a place, uh, maybe a marketplace wherein startups sure. could show their products to government, okay. and and. Uh, uh, and those things could be, you know, uh, implemented. All From right. a planning to implementation stage, I feel if uh, startups get that, uh, you know, place, maybe things would uh, move faster. But i just like to add here that, uh, you know, while uh, getting access to a huge market is great, but I think startups also have to ensure that they are able to deliver value on a consistent basis. So I think that that's probably your challenge as a startup founder, right? 
that's uh, 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 Ambika. You you know you you spoke about the great law and order in the state. You spoke about how you you find talent here to be able to uh, make your business grow. Uh, what are the challenges that you uh, specifically see in the state that needs to be addressed to enable other food related uh, businesses come into the state because there's so much potential. You know, it's the coastline. You've got uh, you've, it's, it's a treasure trove of uh, processed food, uh, enabling processed food uh, businesses. So what kind of support or what kind of uh, ecosystem would you think should the state uh, work on building towards? See, um, I think there's a long wish list. You ask any entrepreneur what you would like for the state to change or for the government to do. But I am of the personal opinion that, you know, I think the government is already doing a decent job. Uh, and there's only so much that we can keep asking the government for, right? We are entrepreneurs. It is our job to create solutions and to build innovation in the system, right? And create change. Uh, having said that, I think, uh, for example, there might be multiple assets that are lying unused, which can be, you know, sort of leased to startups or startups can work with the government to make them productive. But I think more importantly, and something which Debi also said, as we scale, we will need access to capital. I think almost everybody on this panel has had some kind of support from Startup Odessa or Kit TBI or somebody else in the ecosystem. But that is for our very early trial and error, error processes. As we scale, when we want to raise 10 crores, 100 crores, 1000 crores, right? I think the challenge for Odessa as a state and not just the government, but entrepreneurs, professionals, everybody, is the perception that people outside have of the state. I don't think there's anything wrong with the state. The market is large, the people are smart, the government is good, we can all grow, right? But if I have to convince a VC to invest 500 crores in Odisha, their thinking is that the market is very small, you'll not be able to hire people, you'll not be able to grow. And that perception has become an insurmountable challenge to cross, right? So, um, for example, also with hiring, if you want to hire senior management and you want to convince an Odia who's living in Bangalore and is a VP somewhere to come back to Bhubaneswar and work, he'll not agree, he or she. Right? So these are the kind of perception related challenges that if we invest here, it's very risky, the market is not large enough, the business will not be able to grow, um, you will not be able to hire skilled, high quality manpower. These perceptions need to be changed and I don't have any sort of silver bullet solution that you know, should we come out with some you know, startup Odisha Yatra across the country to show that Odisha is a great state to do business in. I don't think that there's any silver bullet solution but we have to collectively push to change this perception in the minds right. of people. Because whenever I speak to VCs, their whole idea behind investing in startups is startups that are catering to Bharat, which you all are, right? They, they want to invest in startups who are catering to Bharat based out of Bangalore. <laughs> 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 yeah, because that's 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 their whole thing that I, we don't want to invest in startups that are looking at Delhi and Mumbai. The world has moved beyond Delhi and Mumbai and we need Bharat centric solutions and that's what every founder is claiming to do now. That's so I think in, in many ways we've been lucky because we just recently raised a round of capital from Axilla Ventures, which is a fund run by the founders of Infosys. And I think in many ways we've been lucky that the investors that we do have on the cap table are true believers because, you know, they kept aside this point or where the company is doing business and looked at the market and the potential and the entrepreneurs, right? But I, but I think there's still a lot more work to be done there. In fact, even if you look at it from the local ecosystem point of view, we don't need to necessarily copy the Silicon Valley model or the Bangalore model, right? There are traditional industries in Odisha with whom, you know, we can connect who can support early stage founders. Mm -hmm. That is also a part to grow, right? We, we can channelize our inner resources as well if the world is refusing to believe in us. Yeah. Or we can change the perception outside. But either ways, resources have to be made available for businesses to grow. Absolutely. So Dr. Rai, you have a daunting task to change the perception of the world for us. I think that's very, very challenging. And you have everything going on for the state. So is there, um, is there something, and uh, from what I was reading, Mr. Patnaik has also said that he wants to build Bhubaneswar as a startup hub and uh, right after Bangalore and Delhi and th the third largest startup hub is what I read that he had said. So um, uh, is there a plan in place for branding Odisha as a startup uh, destination? If you look at uh, the panelists, they have referred to in by way of uh, various assertions so that just hold the mic th a there are a large number of Pudiyas uh, manning many R&D institutions of uh, greater establishment all across the country, even abroad. Uh, I have personally visited all across the world uh, in R&D institutions, high-tech institutions. 
and i have found that most of the r&d installations are being headed by odia uh, in us in europe in bangalore in chennai in hyderabad pune mumbai and all so the idea that devi prasad has just uh, mooted that all these uh, odia uh, people who want who are great affection to this state and they want to contribute the government's job would be startup odisha's job would be to network them to attack them to facilitate them create a platform where they can come brand as invest in a startup ecosystem mentor the startup ecosystem and create a kind of uh, you know a brand for odisha which attracts all sorts of ecosystem players within odisha secondly uh, uh, the uh, um, miss ambika has just reported about talent you also asked a uh, question about talent i must say that uh, we are now only seeing this story but odisha has been a great place for ages you know that most of we have 20 r&d institutions in odisha no other state has uh, we have institute of life science we have institute of mathematics national institute of education uh, research national indian institute of science education and research iit iim triple it several engineering colleges several centers of excellence several successful incubators large number of talent pool we produce about 9 lakh graduate every year they are the graduate who are actually working most of the startups going most of the it places in this country and we could tap this talent route their energy within this state mm -hmm. we'll be able to solve the startup community as i said before we are uh, preparing our odisha startup policy 2022 which is a great revision over our earlier policy which was created in 2016 we have learned we'll we'll talk to them we are already talking to them we'll try to create this policy which will address all sorts of issues again i would reiterate that bhuvaneswar is a place where we have no dearth of talent we have large number of talented people academia industry we have it industry uh, employed 30000 Uh, technology manpower which are working at various uh, uh, level of uh, various uh, uh, level of value chain most of the people are doing r&d there are serious small companies uh, working on semiconductor designing and so odisha is a place where you can have talent uh, of course we have to channelize that energy that talent to create a kind of ecosystem a kind of interaction and platform to make sure that whatever the startup community requires they get on it that's okay. the way we we are we plan to do in the future thank you super any specific sectors that uh, the government is going to really put emphasis on uh, we are sector agnostic basically you know that odisha is a place where we are talked about uh, heavy engineering mining metallurgy uh, food tech aqua textile art culture there are soft things and there are hard things we are we want to become uh, technology agnostic we want to promote all sorts of startup whosoever comes with ideas it will be our endeavor to support them the way they require uh, we know that you most of the sectors that have gone uh, uh, that have attracted success is food tech agri tech aqua fintech edutech and all and therefore we don't have any particular emphasis but of okay. course uh, uh, it would depend upon uh, the what kind of problem these startups want to solve our 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 uh, endeavor would be to work with them uh, okay. wherever field they want to work wherever field which field whichever field they want to create you know wealth product and job okay all right thank you very much it's been a pleasure having you all uh, on this panel very quickly closing comments anything uh, that you would like to add uh, mr sarangi the only thing is <coughs> i would like to request sir uh, if you can also invite a lot of unicorns have been started by odia founders beat oyo beat of business moglix i think you should invite them to just so that they can share their journey uh, in, in i think more than 100 startups are incubated at startup odisha right so they can get a lot of benefit from them and other than that i believe entrepreneurs are not followers we are the leaders we are the drivers having said that i am in constantly in touch with miss sanjukta where we have told her like we would like to invest into startups as from from our company capacity our promoters have also got some money so probably from a personal capacity we would like to give it uh, give it back to the society right and that's how we really we can do it so we have been in constant constantly in touch with her and we would like to also i mean evaluate startups i'm if possible we would like to also invest okay. in from our company you don't have to make your sales pitch here right now binayak so uh, the only thing that uh, 
uh, like in in short i want to say is that the improvement in the image of uh, of the state uh, as as the startup capital so that is where uh, i feel uh, and as ambika has uh, also mentioned the same we need to create this positive perception that things are actually going right and it is happening we are in the right track but uh, uh, and this is especially required to get the right amount of talent uh, to the startups based out of here uh, in odisha so okay. maybe creating a more positive perception that uh, this is the place to be okay ambika my only closing comments would be that i hope the next 10 years are very exciting for odisha that it grows rapidly that we grow along with the state and that we continue to get the love and support of the people of the administration that we have got till now so that's that's really what our Super. expectations and I, are uh, and we hope that uh, startups out of odisha scale their businesses build sustainable business models because we do know right now the kind of surge we're seeing in startups the cash burn is so high and uh, everyone's talking about a huge startup bubble so we hope that sustainable business models do come out of odisha and the next unicorn comes out of odisha thank you very much it's been a pleasure talking to all of you thank you can i uh, invite mr rashmi kanta tripathi and mr sankar jena to come on stage and present our guests with a token of appreciation a big round of applause for uh, the young startup founders who are scripting another story of odisha which i think is a very fascinating one thank you Thank you very much and we wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Home to over 4.6 crore people, Odisha along the Bay of Bengal often acts as a magnet for all kinds of natural disasters, starting from floods, cyclones to droughts. Between 1891 and 2021 over 100 tropical cyclones are known to have lashed Odisha the highest number among other states on the coast but over the years Odisha has come a long way in its disaster management our next panel discussion is on the Odisha way of disaster management can it be a lesson for other states Can I please invite my colleague M G Arun, executive editor of India Today, on stage, please? And can I also please invite his panelists, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Jaina, Development Commissioner, Cum Additional Chief Secretary in Revenue and Disaster Management Department, and Special Relief Commissioner, Shri Jagadanda, Social Activist and Member Secretary, Center for Youth and Social Development. and mr basanta kumar kar development expert the music on yeah from floods to cyclones to droughts odisha has been at the receiving end of several natural calamities like shweta had just mentioned in a span of two decades odisha had encountered as encountered 10 cyclones and it began with the super cyclone in 1999 which all of you are familiar with from the super cyclone to 2019 uh the cyclone fanny and the 2020 yaz odisha has come a long way since the cyclone fanny the state has registered zero casualties so now the state 
how has the state managed this particular feat and what are the lessons that you know several others can learn from it today we are joined by this distinguished panel of experts let me begin with uh, mr pradeep kumar jena who is the development commissioner come additional chief secretary in the government's revenue and disaster management department who has got decades of experience in this and in fact he was telling me backstage how he was a young collector when the super cyclone happened in 1999 and he had seen how 10000 lives were lost in that year to now when you know the state has uh, brought down that particular death rate to zero mr jena if you can just give us an idea of what are the steps that the government has taken what is the odisha model when it comes to disaster management what are the particular facets of it thank you mr arun uh, in fact uh, super cyclone 99 not only was a what said year for disaster management in odisha in fact three disasters have redefined the way disaster is to be managed in this country basically super cyclone 99 followed by 2001 bhuj earthquake and 2004 uh, tsunami and uh, we know that during super cyclone odisha lost about 10000 human lives or uh, the infrastructure of half of the state was just not there it collapsed and livelihoods of about 1.8 million 18 million people can hold it please uh, 18 million people was devastated and from that stage now we have come to a situation where we are able to achieve zero human casualty during cyclone itself is a big long journey and a very successful journey so what happened in 99 that we have learnt and now we are doing something differently that i would like to say the first thing was during 99 even the indian meteorology department's uh, predictive ability was pathetic we used to get three line vhf message that a cyclone is likely to hit odisha in and around paradip beyond that nothing what type at what speed what path what will be the impact zone no information that is the technology part then what happens when you whether the state was prepared state didn't have any institution to manage the special relief commission was the lone officer to manage the disasters then you didn't have any infrastructure in fact when i made the mic announcement in 1999 that people should move to safe shelters i as the district master didn't know what a safe shelter is where is it located in fact there are no pakka school buildings or any office building available all the houses are uh, residential houses of private people are all asbestos houses So, so without knowing what is a safe shelter i used to advise people to move to the safe shelter that was the situation so what have we done in the last uh, uh, 20 years in fact in 99 it is the then chief minister of Chand- chandrabhu naidu from andhra pradesh sent his teams to clear the road from varampur site till bhuvaneswar katak and they restored our electricity as well as they brought the two sets of satellite phones because of which our honorable chief minister could talk to honorable prime minister that was the level of preparedness in 99 but in 2022 we have seen three cyclones in last three years we have managed six cyclones and every time in fact we have all our young collector boys and girls sitting here all our young colleagues it is they who are managing it it is not that as src or the md osdm i manage it is they who are managing the entire thing and what have we done we have put in place a disaster management framework we have a, we are the first state to come up with a state disaster mitigation management authority we are the first state to again have form our own response force and then what we have done we have a good capacity building strategy we prepare disaster management plan right from the state level down to the village level then we collaborate and partner with ngos csos and uh, community based organizations and then we use technology very efficiently for Uh, assessment of the threats for uh, early warning dissemination and also for post disaster assessments so using technologies then and most importantly what didn't happen in 99 and is making everything successful now 
that's the same bureaucracy was there, same bureaucracy is right now also there. But the difference, the key differentiator has been the leader, the chief minister. His vision that, okay, cyclones are bound to visit Odisha being a coastal state, does it mean thousands of people should die? And therefore, the mission of every life is precious and we have to save every life. And therefrom, the mission zero casualty emerged. And once the chief minister wants zero casualty, let me tell you, whichever state you go, if the chief minister wants to achieve something, his bureaucracy can never fail him. So that is what has made all the difference in the last 20 years. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jena, you know, in fact, you know, what you, what you said is uh, extremely true because you need to have leadership. And we have seen during the COVID times uh, and also uh, the, the various natural disasters which states have gone through, how uh, certain states have seen leaders emerge. And I think the public also realizes it and rewards them, you know, uh, as appropriate. Uh, I would like to come to Sri uh, uh, Jagannanda. You know, in fact, uh, you had also been mentioning how you know, the civil society may, plays a huge role. Of course, the government takes, you know, a huge step, but then it is complemented by the, the interaction with, with the civil society. Um, if you could just give your, you know, ex experiences from that, you as, a, as a, a member secretary of the Center for Youth and Social Development, if you can give, uh, throw some light into that area. Thank you, Arun. I think disaster opens a wonderful opportunity for everyone to come together so that you can respond to a crisis in a very planned way. That's a great opportunity actually. And the opportunity in Odisha started in 99 super cyclone because we were overwhelmed actually at that time. 10,000 people, you know, lost and we didn't know what to do. Government, civil society, all of us we were absolutely in circles. From there, when we started our journey, I think after the current chief minister came in, the first ask of the civil society to him in a meeting in the secretariat was, we need a single command agency in the state who should handle disasters. And thereafter, um, I'm sure other efforts in the government also must have happened. And the Odisha State Disaster Management Authority, as was told by our development commissioner, came up and became a reality in the country and the first authority in the country. After this, then Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority came up, the National Disaster Management Authority came up, they are all after Odisha actually. Odisha really provided a model for the Disaster Management Authority to come up and later on, the Disaster Management Act also to be enacted in this country in 2005. So, Coming back to the civil society, you know, three things we picked up at the civil society end. First is, you know, that time we requested the government at the level of the chief secretary and our request was very specific. Can you identify a senior officer who will facilitate the interaction between civil society and the government and do the similar lines at the district end actually? And it was followed up very rigorously. We had a very senior officer who was handling the civil society part. And then civil society got into action. Out of the three things which we picked up from civil society action, you know, community-based disaster preparedness emerged as a very strong point. Very, very strong point from Odisha. And when it came up, I'm, government also came in, you know, very strongly and together, the community-based disaster preparedness model was formulated actually. And that became a guideline for the country. The second issue which we picked up, how do you take care of the most disadvantaged, most, you know, affected population who requires a special care, like orphans. When 10,000 people we lost, I still remember I went to a village. The village has lost almost 91% of the population. Only few scanty people were there. And when I was talking to them, they were all in big Sanata actually. Sanata in the village, nobody was able to open up actually. Talking to people in a crisis, listening to their pains, listening to their agonies, listening to their frustrations, listening to their dreams, their own aspirations, is also a big ticket agenda in disaster response. By just listening, you deal with the trauma. 
So the second part was, how do you deal with the special needs? And I'm sure Basant will tell, Basant and the team that time started a very interesting program called Mamta. And the Mamta program was meant for, you know, wives who have lost their husband, children who have lost their parents, a very, very special program. So that was the second. And the third part is, you see, after the disaster, livelihood is the huge challenge. How do you, you know, how would people survive actually? Today I have seen government is very, very good now in response, immediate response. And you know, the, what, I, what was mentioned by our additional chief secretary, the Odisha Disaster Response Force, now the National Disaster Response Force also has come in. You know, the, the whole structure is ready actually. Um, and in Odisha, the other advantage is the fire brigade and the fire services, they have roped in as a disaster response, what you call mechanism to deal with disasters. So they are not waiting for a fire to come, they can come. So, the, so today there is a multiple forces, but livelihood restoration, immediately starting something, giving hope to the people, giving, you know, so that was a very interesting civil society learning for us. And uh, so that is all I will say right. right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in fact, you raised a very important uh, point of, you know, how the most vulnerable, the women and children ha are, are, are addressed. I mean, and I think that is where uh, um, Mr. Basanta Kumar Kar can come in. He is a chief advisor, come mentor to the Coalition for Food and Nutrition Society. So if you can just, uh, you know, give your insights on how this was managed and what has been your experience in this? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Arunji. Um, nostalgia haunts. Uh, so I am very fortunate today to be with uh, Pradeep Janaji and also Mr. Jagdanan, who steered uh, and also built the foundation of disaster management in Odisha. I am very happy. And at that time, under the leadership of Navin Patnaik. I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, disaster is defined as hazard plus vulnerability. If disaster is defined as a hazard plus vulnerability, Odisha disaster model stands unique and unparalleled in the world as hazard plus vulnerability divided by C. C stands for capacity and capability. I'll talk about that. Uh, the foundation was built in uh, Odisha super cyclone. What Jagdan ji told, the first model on community-based rehabilitation of women and children at risk means <coughs> we don't use those words, but for benefit of other audience, I am speaking. For, for the orphans and destitute women, generally they used to be referred to the orphanage and destitute homes. In the first time in the history of disaster management, uh, to the best of my knowledge, also in East Asia, this pilot started in Jagasimpur in Erasama, where community, all the destitute women and children who were orphans, they were rehabilitated at the community level. This is unique and unparalleled uh, in the history of disaster management. I think you should give credit to the uh, civil servants uh, who supported us and also to the chief minister, number one. Uh, number two, uh, community mental health. Always, whenever you find disasters, there will be focus on brick and mortar, sand and clay. But caring, uh, mental health, trauma, psychosocial counseling, the first foundation of such community mental health program also started in, in, in Odisha after Matha Odisha super cyclone in partnership with Nimans. So that is Odisha's another contribution to disaster. Avoidable death model is also another exemplar model of Odisha. From 9,885 after Matha in super cyclone 99 to zero or to double digit, it itself is an, uh, another year. I work on nutrition across the globe. Malnutrition is a silent emergency, whether it is cyclone, a flood, it or drought, it could be two months, three months, six months, eight months. Malnutrition is 24 into 7 into 1, 2, 3 years. Odisha is the exemplar state, in not only in India, but also in Asia, which also mainstreamed malnutrition uh, and addressed malnutrition as a silent emergency. I'll tell you a few examples. If you look into National Familial Survey 5, Odisha has uh, demonstrated reduction of wasting, Odisha has demonstrated reduction of stunting, Odisha has redu uh, demonstrated reduction of severe stunting, though children are always prone to death. 
in national level it increased and during COVID, uh, always we say nutrition is a PP, personal protective equipment. Odisha introduced the first nutrition budget in India, not only in India, but also in South Asia. So there are many things we can come later. Okay, wonderful. I want to come back to uh, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Jena. Uh, you know, you were telling me that um, things don't stop here. I mean, just because, you know, we have managed it successfully in the past years, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we can do it in future. We don't know the, the, the quantum of any disaster that can come any time. And right now we even have, uh, I mean, the, across the country, you know, severe heat, heat waves, including in, in Odisha. Uh, I want to ask you about, you know, what are the preparations that you keep doing and what are the new models that keep developing in this? And also if you can give us an idea of how you share this with other states, because, you know, there were some examples we were mentioning of how you go to other states, including Maharashtra, Kerala, etc. You know? Okay. See, no, no two disasters are same. Every disaster is different because one is geographic area it affects. Second, the ferocity, the intensity is different. And maybe sometime a cyclone will only have wind action, may not have flood. A cyclone can have flood, can have storm source, and, and can also have tsunami. So, no two cyclones can be same. So therefore, that you have prepared for one cyclone doesn't mean that you will be able to do better in the next cyclone. So that means, after the cyclone or any disaster event is over, there is a need to analyze whether things have gone right, is there any uh, shortcomings, wrong things, wrong practices, and is there anything to be learnt out of it. So once you do that exercise and take those learning to prepare the for the next event. And in fact, the peacetime exercise is always more important if you want to win the war. So during the peacetime, how do you engage people, build their capacity, build the capacity of your system? That also determines your success. Then what happens? Okay, there are many good practices in Odisha. And now Odisha, wherever there is a disaster man management uh, conference, Odisha has to be invited to go and speak there. Along with that now, we have it tied up with uh, Lal Bahadur Sastri Academy of Administration where they send their IAS officers, in-service officers to Odisha to be trained in disaster management. Further, few states, Bihar sends their officers, Assam sends their officers, and also Maharashtra. Maharashtra has sent three batches of officers whose capacity we are developing here. So, uh, every state has something to offer and we have some strengths that is what we are sharing with others. But then there are also some good practices other states have, like use of GIS technology by Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. We are also learning from them and trying to improve our GIS model. And what is more important how do you standardize? In fact, this is, this is a small booklet which fits into my pocket. This book, booklet has been designed drawing upon the experience of last eight cyclones, floods. And here, collectors and officers down below can have it in pocket and what is their roles and responsibilities, what are the do's and don'ts. So it's a, it's a handbook on cyclones. Yes. Goes into your pocket and you carry it every yeah. time, is yeah. it? So, so if you are a CDMO, you will only read that 20, 30 lines, what you are supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do. If you are a collector, what you have to do, what you don't have to do. At least this is a checklist which provides you shortcut to immediately manage the situation. In fact, you must have seen in the election, none of the collectors commit any error, only because of some well-drafted uh, SOPs in the form of a handbook. And then we have designed this small pocket book. In fact, one of our collector who was working with me Kamal Mishra, Dr. Kamal Mishra, he was instrumental in preparing this. So, you have to codify things. You have to train your people on a, a regular basis. And then, most importantly, how do you empower your community-based organizations and PRIs? Elected representatives at the ground level, they are the best bet in managing disaster situations. Be it COVID, be it a natural disaster, they are your strength. So how do you empower them? How do you create trust? But that doesn't mean there are no challenges. We have a right. lot of challenges ahead. In fact, Jitendra is sitting in front of us. 
if you ask him to share he will share his frustrations what is not happening and what should happen so there are many challenges also but that doesn't mean uh, we can't move away and the slowly and gradually we will also incorporate other things to emerge as a leader in this field. Right. So preparing for the worst case scenario is al always important. I want to bring in Mr. Jagannandan, you know. Uh, you know, there are so many things that we hear about Odisha where the, the micromanagement of things are so important. Sir also just mentioned it as to um, how you need to empower the people at, uh, you know, the, the grassroots to, you know, to enable uh, tackle these uh, disasters. So, if you can just give an, an idea of you know that kind of a model, uh, how okay. it works, because we have heard uh, stories of how even you know everything was taken care of in advance before the cyclone strikes. There is a particular way in which the evacuation happens. Even women who are supposed to deliver yeah. babies are taken care of, and you know uh, special treatment is given to them much in advance. So, how does that work? I, I would uh, share two ideas. The first idea relates to rescue and evacuation. You know, the revenue administration, if there is a disaster in our state, both the development administration and the revenue administration, it's a year-long affair for them. Picking up people, putting them in the cyclone shelter, arranging food for them, and sending them back home, then, uh, you know, assessing the damage and nobody is happy in the damage assessment. Everybody is grumbling, everybody is murmuring. So, it becomes a huge challenge for both development administration and our rev revenue administration. You know, so therefore, that challenge, today the good part of the story is, all the cyclone and flood shelters in our state are community managed are supposed to be community managed, they, they are owned by almost the panchayats, that transfer has taken place, which is a very good thing actually. So, they are there. But the hindsight of it is, today, after the damage assessment is done, you know, government comes with some housing assistance, this, that. I think Odisha in the coastal area requires a complete movement for converting kacha house to pakka house so that people can stay in their home and face the disaster rather than running to a disaster, you know, shelter. And, uh, and it becomes a Herculean task for the administration to manage that. That can be done. The most vulnerable people, government can take care of them. Others can own a house actually. We have to create a movement where people owned housing can take place. And we have a model in super cyclone, Asra model, which was initiated by Care India. You know, owner-driven housing actually. Owner-driven housing, you know, a big program where National Housing Bank can come, other banks can come, government can really come in a big way and people, you know, it becomes a housing movement. And in a post-COVID situation, if we get into a housing movement in the coastal area, it will open a new economy, you know, altogether. Right? So, that is one. The second issue is, you know, climate change has affected the state. We are all victims of the climate change issue now. We, are, we have become very vulnerable now. But at the same time, this is the state which contributes highest per capita CO2 emissions actually. So, we are the reason for the you know, climate change effect and we are also the cause for climate change effect. So, that requires a very creative planning at the, because we are a coal-bearing state, the fossil fuel has to be exploited, you know, and that, that is the major reason for the CO2 emission. So, that requires a very creative approach for adaptation and mitigation. These two things, if that happens, I'm sure we will go to the next level. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Carr, is there any, uh, you know, uh, maybe a couple of points from you, what would you expect, uh, you know, is there something more that you could do? be it uh, tackling the nutrition issue that you talked about or disaster management? Yeah, uh, I'll just uh, uh, summarize in three points that could be the future expectations. What Jagdandi told about climate change. Within climate change uh, framework, soil is losing the fertility. If you analyze the Bengal famine in pre-independence, pre it was because of the soil infertility. That is the core that is the new research is saying. So, uh, 
addressing soil fertility will be key because uh, there is a coastal there are also salinity there are there are also soil fertility soil erosion uh, so that will be uh, important for odisha to deal with skilling human resource uh, whenever i am saying skilling human resource i am talking about human resource at the system level government and also building resilience capacity of the community yeah. will be key and for skilling you have to invest on good nutrition because first thousand days is key and right. important only you miss thousand days starting from pregnancy to two years of age then cognitive potentiality will be affected because uh, good nutrition can supercharge demographic dividend so investing on good nutrition for a better skilled talented resilient society will be necessary for odisha thank wonderful. you wonderful i mean listening to both these uh, gentlemen uh, uh, mr jena would you have would you like to sum up uh, you know yeah yep. was as mr jagnan pointed out we have done very well when it comes to response management but the response has three parts pre disaster during disaster and post disaster and in all the three phases by and large we have done well then what what is the most important thing okay some people have lost something how do they recover that recovery strategy is the most important thing that means there are two aspects apart from response there is mitigation and adaptation requirements and mitigation is something very cost intensive high capital cost and if you have observed odisha in last 3 years our honorable chief minister whenever honorable prime minister in, uh, has visited odisha in fact three times in three years and every time our honorable chief minister has requested honorable prime minister not to give us any uh, response fund we will manage somehow in case government of india in fact in fact during covid time honorable chief minister asked honorable prime minister not to give any money we will manage somehow but he said if the national government central government wants to help us kindly help us in long term mitigation measures like housing and thankfully both government of state government and central government together now we are going to take up about 8 lakh houses in coastal area that would take care of the housing stock convert kacha houses to pakka houses the other thing is your power infrastructure is the most vulnerable to any any wind action so unless you have a resilient power infrastructure come what may it will impact not only immediate response but also the livelihood generation industry so it will impact adversely your economy so for that thing underground cabling then uh, nbls towers all higher specification things which are very costly and third one is to save the coast from getting eroded due to storm surge and tsunami so a coastal protection system so these are the three things which our honorable uh, was chief minister has always demanded and for immediate needs he has always requested that no don't give us any fund we will try to manage from within our budget that's wonderful i think you are one of the maybe the only state which is telling the center not to give us any funds we'll manage on our own kudos to that and uh, thank you so much uh, all three for you know enlightening us with a whole a variety of aspects related to disaster management thanks again and thanks the lovely audience despite you know being <laughs> lunch time you know you are here thanks thank you very much uh, mg and a big thank you to all our panelists it's a fascinating story about how odisha has scripted this fantastic turn around and so many lessons from here for the other states can i please invite mr praveen kumar and mr sc mohanta to please come and felicitate our guests Thank you. Thank you very much.
we'll take a short break for lunch can i please request our delegates to go uh, towards kunj one lunch has been served there and can we request you to please come back by 2:30 2:40 latest thank you
excited to be here with you all and um, the first half of the day saw the honorable chief minister here we gave out awards for the best performing districts in the state that are doing some commendable work in the field of education infrastructure law and order agriculture and so on we have been speaking about rise of odisha as an investment destination rise of businesses in the state startups in the state our first panel after lunch speaks about odisha as the new hub for higher education can i please invite my colleague kaushik deka executive editor india today dr silpi sahu chairperson sai international education group and dr ak das vice chairman odisha state higher education council council and he's also the former vice chancellor of utkal university and a distinguished scientist over to you kashik thank you sweta good afternoon everyone i hope we all had good lunch education is a very interesting subject and especially in eastern india as we all know uh, education is always given very great importance for in every household and odisha is almost like an education hub with uh, 37 universities uh, one iit one aims and many other higher educational institutes uh, if i am not wrong around 65000 schools in this state and it it contributes a lot to the uh, country's academicia so in that context i have two very eminent guests to discuss about education in odisha and uh, and a very positive thing about odisha is this that uh, the state has 50% population uh, which are under 25 years of age that mean it gives a huge potential for the education sector to grow in this state so in that context um, sir how do you see mr das the ed- potential of higher education in the state because uh, it's a fact that we have so many universities so many higher educational institutes but in terms of gross enrollment we are still behind odisha is still behind the national average i believe some 22% uh, and uh, the national average is 24 so in that context how do you see this gap can be bridged i think uh, first is you are correct that there is a uh, lot of potential because the youth population is uh, very large and uh, there is a need to exploit their potential and higher education is the area which gives you jobs which gives you livelihood and which also gives you incentivizes you to become a good citizen for nation building now uh, then we come to what you raised of gross enrollment ratio there are two things if you see 2010 statistics and statistics of 2000 the year 2000 you will find the gross enrollment ratio was less than 10 and today the gross enrollment ratio of odisha is 22.7 i think around that figure that is the ishe figure so if you see the growth of enrollment in odisha during the last 15 20 years it has been phenomenal if you see the slope of the growth of gross enrollment ratio it is probably much better than any other state around but the fact still remains that the enrollment ratio is less than the national average and one of the reason is that all of us know that odisha has a large number of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe large percentage people who have been traditionally did not have access to education and so if you see the difference then you will find that though the uh, urban areas the gross enrollment ratio would be high the uh, tribal areas the aspirational districts the enrollment ratio is less and the government is uh, bed uh, the odisha's hi- policy on higher education is based on two simple words one is inclusive and the other is excellence so we are looking at achieving inclusive excellence and towards that the government policies are directed and so you will find in the last few years the aspirational districts there are 10 about aspirational districts there are educational institutions model degree colleges they are 
getting opened in the aspirational districts. You will find our central university is in Koraput. We are trying to digitize that entire area digital infrastructure so that learning can reach. And I am sure the, uh, that 1.7 or 1.8 percent difference in gross enrollment ratio will be made up under uh, in a few years because every aspirational district there is a focus of government in higher education and so i am sure that will be bed up uh, in the ensuing reforms thank you uh, dr shahu uh, you were working in school education sector uh, as he mentioned about the disparity, there is a geographical disparity, then the demography is such that uh, the inclusion is always a challenge. So in school education, particularly in private education sector, how difficult it is to um, take the education to every corner of the state? Because uh, most of the time we see, not only in Odisha, in many states, the good schools are located in the cities. So rural areas, most of the time they have to depend on government schools which uh, the quality of government schools have remained suspect in many states. Uh, not, it's, it's not a um, general classification, but it, that has been an issue. Uh, private education sector can uh, come forward and fill the gap, but we see that it's always concentrated in the cities. So how can we uh, uh, change that and take private education, affordable private education, the key word here is affordable private education, to every corner of the state, particularly in Odisha. Right. I don't think uh, there is much disparity now in the school education. And um, as far as the private education is concerned in the rural areas, the rural areas can also, the students in the rural areas can also afford to study in the private schools. And there are a lot of private schools in different parts of uh, the state. And the government is also doing a lot of uh, initiatives like Odisha Adarsh Vidalayas, where these uh, Odisha Adarsh Vidalaya schools are all CBSE, English medium schools. And I think there are about 314 Odisha Adarsh Vidalaya schools in each block of Odisha. So uh, I don't think uh, there is uh, any problem as such uh, for the students in the rural areas in reaching out to the uh, private education. Dr. Sahu, I would also like to ask this question I am tempted to ask because uh, national education policy has been launched and there is a huge focus on local language in the… which is good. Uh, but at times there is a debate that it has come at the cost of ignoring English or uh, the, the tendency to ignore English. Though it's still… the English language is still highly demanded in India but this education policy might change that. How do you see this in the context of Odisha, the promotion of local language versus the necessity to learn and understand English? And the third one has come, Hindi. So in the, in the Eastern Belt, we, we always see that there is an apprehension uh, regarding Hindi. Though Hindi is mostly understood in this part voluntarily, but when it comes to uh, academic rigor, then there is a resistance. So in this uh, circumstances, that national education policy, the language policy and school education and particularly in the context of Odisha, how do you see all these three things converging? Uh, the language as in Odia, as uh, the medium of instruction, I don't think there is uh, any problem in that because children, they should uh, understand and learn the mother language first, mother tongue first. English is of course an official language and English, the children should, I mean, to need exposure and to go abroad and then to excel in life. English is always required, but mother tongue which is there in the national education policy, I think uh, the government has actually done, uh, has taken up a great initiative in promoting the uh, state languages. So, uh, Odia as uh, language of the world, though Odia, Odia is not a medium of instruction, not even in uh, the government schools, but uh, Odia as a language should always be given priority. So, other than the Hindi and English. But that priority uh, can also create problem. This, there is an argument, I am not supporting or uh, saying against it. Uh, 
the argument is that if you ignore English, then at a global level or even inside India, it, it becomes difficult for communication and then the larger… No, I, I am not saying that, you know, government should give focus to the mother language, mother tongue, but other than English, the initiative of the government to focus on uh, the mother, lang mother language, mother tongue, that is a really a great initiative by the NEP 2020. In your school, how, how, how are you going about it, the incorporation of uh, these three languages? And uh, you, you know the importance of in India, knowing Hindi yeah. is, uh, in, has in, an advantage. At Sai, at Sai English, English, yeah. yes. at Sai English uh, is of course the medium of instruction. With, uh, we have of course second languages, we have Hindi, we have Sanskrit and we have French also as other second language and uh, though more importance is and Odia also as a second language and though importance is given to English because English is the medium of instruction but at the same time we have Odia Divas, we have Hindi Divas, we have Sanskrit Divas celebrated in the school and we give importance and priority to all these mother languages also. Dr. Das, continue with the national education policy. There are many things in this policy, particularly the focus on interdisciplinary approach. And then there is a uh, thing that Prime Minister Modi keeps talking about, exchange of uh, students and faculties, students going from say, Odisha to Tamil Nadu, from Tamil Nadu they would come to um, Odisha and many other such things. Particularly in interdisciplinary approach, how do you think that uh, the higher education uh, can be revolutionized and Odisha in particular can benefit from this policy with any specific uh, example, if you can say. Uh, let me come back directly to national education policy yeah. and what exactly it uh, prescribes. Now, one is multidisciplinary education and the freedom of the student to be able to choose what he studies. You will find that in uh, well back in 2013-14, the state of Odisha in university education went for something which is called choice-based credit system. The choice-based credit system has a cafeteria of subjects and the student takes a core and then takes a subsidiary, two subsidiary subjects with environmental science and computer education as compulsory education. So, Odisha has implemented it in all universities and colleges since 2014. So, we are already ready for NEP in that respect. So, that was one of the major things. The second is skill. Skill has been given a lot of importance and like, as it should be given as you have a session, I think after this. And you, we, you will realize that Odisha probably started a skill journey somewhere around same time, 13-14. And today Odisha is probably one of world's best place to get skilled. And so, connecting general higher education with skill is not a difficult task for us today. The third point which NEP has brought in, which is you have brought interdisciplinary education and when you come to higher education, interdisciplinary research. Now, again, since 2014, under a World Bank funding arrangement, under Rashtriya Uchchatar Siksya Vijayan, and a funding that Odisha government created. Government of Odisha in all its universities, about 12 universities today, has established what is called as research centers of excellences, which look at problems relevant to Odisha, particularly the biodiversity, the Gandhamardhan um, uh, range, the Similipal, the Chilka, the uh, 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 south, southern ranges and the Bhitarkanika uh, forest. Now, these interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary centers have researchers drawn from all departments and they work together. And if I remember correctly, during the last two years, despite pandemics, I think these 12 together have published somewhere around 100 top tier, tier one publications, indexed publications, and I think the young fellows have come out with two, two or three patents and international patents. So, that is one part. Second, Odisha is probably the single state in government India where the state public universities give a startup seed money to young faculty below 45 years 
to do research. A young faculty when he joins does a competitive proposal writing and gets about 7 lakhs to be spent in two years. That is a startup money. Odisha again is probably one of those states which gives for full-time research its own junior research fellowship of… it is not equivalent to the central government, but you will have to understand it gives around 15,000 for students who have cleared net but not got a central research fellowship. This is leading to PhD. And as I was telling, 40 percent of this, that is 70 of these 175 fellowships given for year, is reserved for girl children. So, you will see what we have been trying is to create a research ecosystem. And so, when the National Research Foundation under NEP comes in, we would be ready to take advantage of it. And we are creating an ecosystem where Odisha will vibrate with knowledge. Most of our faculty training is another aspect which NEP has stressed on. And so, faculty training, we, our faculty today are trained in institution of eminence outside Odisha, apart from in our universities where human resource development centers exist. And so, if you look at, for example, registering in the academic credit banks, digitizing the universities, I think this journey has started and you all know the uh, uh, proverb that if you want, like you are planting rice, you are looking at, after one year you will get a result. If you plant a big banyan tree, maybe ten years you will see the banyan tree coming up. But if you want a generation of academicians who will excel, maybe you plan for hundred years or fifty years. So, we are going in an equilibrated manner step by step and whatever NEP has come up with, I, I must thank the bureau, uh, uh, the officers of government of Odisha who have always been receptive. I am an academician, I go with a proposal and you will be surprised that they get approved. And so, we have been able to run this and we have been able to create a ecosystem where all universities work together. There is something called a consortium of universities, where all the 13, 14 universities work together. The vice chancellors sit together maybe once in a quarter and decide what reforms to be taken. So, the curricular reform, the examination reforms, whatever has happened, they have happened because these vice chancellors together sit with the officials of the higher education department and decide what is to be done. So, in a sense, we are growing, going in the right direction. For us, implementing uh, national education policy of 2020 should not be a big problem. The dilemma that everybody has, and we are all looking at the central government to tell us, ki this four-year uh, bachelor, two-year, uh, three-year uh, BA degree, BSc degree, and then one-year MA, one-year MSc, that is a dilemma which you have to resolve along with all the universities in India. Because if one of my children, child goes to Andhra Pradesh, he should be able to get a seat there wherever he wants. So, if he goes from a three-year degree program and lands in a four-year degree, there will be a problem. So, that is the only one on which we have not given a serious thought. We are working, seeing how the national consensus is evolving. But otherwise, we are inherently NEP ready because these are standard reforms which was necessary to do and government of Odisha has put this in place. I think that's all that I have to say on NEP. You mentioned the word pandemic, so I would need to ask one question related to that because uh, the pandemic has actually transformed the education sector in uh, more than one ways. Uh, I have two questions, uh, post-pandemic situations. One is uh, directly related to pandemic because UGC has said that now every university or higher education institute should go for digital mode of education. Uh, there have been a lot of talk talks about blending the two, uh, physical education and virtual education. Arguments are in favor and against. What Odisha has done specifically to create a holistic model of um, virtual and physical, combination of both, because not just for a uh, pandemic situation, but 
in future also because uh, the advantage of digital education is that as uh, you have rightly mentioned there are remote areas in odisha uh, where uh, education spreading education re taking education to those uh, places has always been a challenge but at the same time digital mode also uh, presents another challenge that whether there would be connectivity and electricity and all other issues so what is the holistic approach that odisha has taken to blend these two and uh, make it 100% useful for the students the ultimate user we have let me first tell you in tangible terms what is there on ground on ground we have created a studio where digital mode good lectures are being recorded and are being given free of cost through a portal and through a memory stick so if you are an undergraduate student or a postgraduate student and your college doesn't have teacher in pandemic you are not able to go you download or ask us we will send it second major reform that has this is there and it is continuously uh, running the second part that in digital mode what we have done during the pandemic pandemic was a great learning lesson time when pandemic started there is one group of people which conveniently everybody has forgotten actually to my mind who should have been branded as the pandemic warriors warrior word was used are the teachers now teachers are responsible to the students the government odisha government did one thing every two months one month during the peak of the first wave there was meeting with all the principals and vice chancellors to find out whether online teaching is being done where connectivity is not there you use social media to send you send even the printed lecture notes to them because there was basically no other way and we i must applaud the teachers because they are teachers are not very well applauded in uh, any way any part of the world at least in india as such i think they have done a wonderful job in reaching out to the students i think during the last two years teachers have not taken any serious leave no serious vacation they have been whenever there is a lull in the pandemic they have come to the uh, organization and taught the students if students are there that was one one of the steps which nowhere is there we found after, during the pandemic that our children have forgotten the art of reading books and so 25% of the course in odisha in uh, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate are asked as self learning and then five or six classes in all units are being provided 25% maybe 15% of the classes are for doubt clearing so we are forcing the student to read you will find your children do not read now whatever note comes or whatever internet google maharaj tells is supposed to be what a bible i think we are forgetting the art of studying the classical textbooks that is what we are doing then of course we follow whatever ugc prescription is there ugc has tried to give us 40% should be in the virtual mode that will be the blending and so what we are now uh, conceptualizing that this cafeteria you will find all all state public universities which run at up bottom of the affordability man absolute affordability have a problem suppose somebody wants in a certain rural college to learn data science how will he learn data science there is no teacher of data science around so such courses the odisha state open university can provide online if there is a nearby college which is providing or whether virtual tutorial our studio can record so we are now trying to blend it in a manner where in the spirit of nep is absorbed and the student actually learns the third part is whether the student understands because you will find in pandemic we found that the student and his terminal in front of him created a lot of psychological stress apart from the ophthalmic stress that is i got and so what we have done is in odisha every 20 25 students have a proctor and the proctor is a kind of mentor to the students and is supposed and this proctorial system worked fantastically in pandemic so 
and before the examination during the pandemic, for 15-20 days, year-wise, the semester-wise, students were called to the university or college and doubt-clearing classes were made because actual classes. You must understand that for a teacher teaching in a classroom with eye contact with the student is a much more effective model of learning than looking at Google Maharaj and learning. The, at least I am old style person, which I believe so, and I teach so I practically know that this to be true. But times are changing and history proceeds on a graph, which is probably irreversible because circumstances are guiding it. So we are going with it, we are blending in a manner where the additional skill areas and subject areas can be brought in from the state open university, can be, uh, can be brought in from central agencies, MHRD, education department, some kind of uh, Swayam portal gives. So we are trying to blend it so that blended mode exists, but with the provisio that student understands. I told you in the beginning, inclusiveness with excellence is the only those two words we understand. In Odisha, we do not understand anything else. You said times are changing. In fact, uh, about this digital mode of learning, uh, how pandemic this process has become. In fact, India Today, this issue has done a cover story on this digital addiction and how you can get rid of it. But coming back to the subject, uh, you, you mentioned about the book reading habit, that habit which has gone and uh, it's very important for a school student to, uh, to learn that habit, uh, at least I believe so. Uh, and at the same time you said times are changing, maybe the future is the books are obsolete and this is the mode. Uh, Dr. Sahu, do you agree that this is the future that students will learn uh, from Google Maharaj or from uh, any other digital sources or we should keep that physical mode of uh, book reading and if that is so, how your school and as, as an educationist, how would you uh, suggest that that habit is, that book reading habit or that form of education is maintained for future so that students, of course, in, the, in, in, in modern environment, you can't force them to uh, read a book and avoid the digital environment, but how it can be done in a healthier way. No, there is definitely no comparison between Google and uh, reading books offline, reading from the books. And uh, you cannot compare, um, uh, uh, you know, the story books or learning uh, materials, reading from Google with uh, the offline method of uh, teaching because teachers, ca I mean, no digital intervention can replace the teachers. Teachers are the best mode of learning to make, uh, they make uh, the students, they make the students leaders of tomorrow and they create uh, the, these leaders to become writers, engineers, doctors, professionals. And we at uh, SAI, we do have, uh, because uh, digital intervention and technology has always been at SAI right from 2008, even before pandemic. So during pandemic, we did not have much problem in switching over to the Google Classroom because uh, uh, our founder chairman, late Dr. Vijay Kumar Sao, his slogan during uh, pandemic was at SAI, the buildings are closed but the school is open. So we quickly uh, moved on uh, to the um, uh, Google Classroom. We did all uh, events and celebrations online and our students and uh, parents, 90% of students and parents they were a part of this event and celebration because in every crisis lies an opportunity and we took advantage of this opportunity. We saw how digital intervention can also become an opportunity during pandemic. Though as I said, teachers, I mean no digital uh, mode can actually replace teachers. But uh, and anyway, ad, as Dr. Das said, uh, books, reading from the books are the best methodology and you learn a lot of things because there is a lot of difference between reading from the books and reading from Google. Thank you. As you talked about content, reading from books, the one important part of uh, this uh, content is textbook. 
And as we hear that textbook are being changed um, and CRT is uh, preparing a national curriculum framework and there is a talk that history would be changed and many other things would be changed. Uh, we do not yet know what the changes would be but if we have to ask you about the current uh, curriculum, uh, the representation of Hindi which is, a, uh, sorry, uh, history which is a controversial subject, how do you see the representation of uh, Odisha and Eastern India in the current uh, curriculum, do you think it's adequate or do you think uh, there is an urgent need to change that? No, there is an adequate uh, use of uh, information about Odisha in all uh, textbooks which are followed in uh, Odisha. Also in history, we have ancient history, we have ancient Odisha where uh, details about Odisha is also mentioned. So I don't think uh, there is any change uh, um, as related to Odisha is concerned and what and about uh, the national curriculum framework it's uh, you know that's again a separate topic and uh, actually the government wants to uh, project each and every person so that each and every person of history is given importance in the textbooks that is why they have tried to change uh, the textbooks but if I ask you very directly, one suggestion that you would like to give uh, for those who are preparing the curriculum framework, uh, one suggestion that you think that needs to be incorporated in the textbooks, uh, it could be on whichever subject, but uh, you think that which uh, hasn't been given adequate importance till now? Uh, I don't think so, uh, you know, because government I think has uh, uh, has touched upon each and every area because as far as uh, uh, concern for history or civics or uh, you know sociology or any other subject I think government has touched each and every area starting from uh, the ancient history till the modern history they have touched each and every area so I don't think there is uh, any change or we need to focus on any particular topic my final question to Dr. Das, as you talked about uniformity, like three-year course, four-year course, now one thing, it's the admission time soon, the admission time will start to college admission that central universities have incorporated this common entrance test. Uh, what's your view on that test and do you think every state should also adopt this because again there will be a problem for students if they are applying for state universities, they have to go through the score. Uh, 10 plus 2 score, if they have to apply for central university, they have to prepare for differently. So it becomes an added task for students. So what do you think that the score pattern that was already uh, existing, that is correct or the new method should be adopted by all universities? For Odisha? Your mic, sir. For, for the state, state of Odisha, we have a common entrance, uh, uh, common admission. Centralized admission because we don't want somebody from Koraput to run to Bhubaneswar for admission. So it is centralized, computerized admission, part of our inclusivity. Right now, we are not thinking of getting into CUAT, at least this year. Government will take its decision at the right time. But personally, if you ask me, then if we have an entrance test to the general courses, then why have 10 plus 2? Forget plus 2 examination. If medical people have an exam entrance, engineering have an entrance, it, uh, why do you have another, uh, there is a central board and there is a parity in all other boards. So, my view right now in Odisha for PG and UG, we have common admission, common entrance. So, right now, this year, we are going as it is and I think that is fair enough. That shows that Odisha is leading the way. Uh, we have already run out of time. Thank you so much for being part of this wonderful discussion. We learnt a lot and it was an honour having you to here. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Das, Dr. Sahu. Thank you, Kaushik. Can we invite uh, Mr. Ms. Ashmita Mohanta and Mr. Ashok Kumar Pohan to present our panellists with a token of appreciation, please. Ma'am, can I request you to stay on stage? Just one minute.
section, we have to talk about skilling and how we look at skilling. Skilling over time has to become an integral part of curriculums and how we look at education. Our next session, Skilled and Odisha, how to make Odisha a state of skilled human resources. At the outset, can I please request our team to play the video address by Mr. Subroto Bakchi, Chairman of the Odisha Skill Development Authority. Odisha Skill Development Authority was formed at the behest of the Honorable Chief Minister Shinabin Patnaik. His charter for the newly constituted authority was to build an aspirational brand called Skilled in Odisha. He said, a day must come when future employers would ask their potential employees, are you skilled or are you skilled in Odisha? This overarching aspiration meant three things. In the short term, high quality employers should make a beeline to lock in talent in Odisha's skill training institutions. In the medium term, global employers must come to Odisha in search of extraordinary talent. And finally, in the long term, Odisha must be known as a sandbox for innovation in the world of skill development. Great ideas worthy of being replicated elsewhere must be tried in Odisha first. Back in 2016, towards fulfilling our goals, we created a threefold strategy. We call it Fix, Scale, and Accelerate. What it meant was that first, we fix the ITI system. Second, to scale up short-term skill programs for school dropouts. And finally, we accelerate the setting up of the iconic World Skill Center. Let us first talk about fixing the ITI. In India, ITIs and IITs were set up around the same time. Unfortunately, in successive decades, the ITI institution receded in stature, even as the IITs lunged forward. ITIs became synonymous with failed aspirations and blocked dreams. If a high school student had all the doors slammed closed, that child came to an ITI. The ITI was seen by many people as a failed institution. Our job was to make it aspirational. For starters, we changed the report card for the principal of every ITI. For this, we used the 10642 formula. Each ITI had to name 10 students of whom it was truly proud. Every teacher needed to know the personal story of each of the students to present them as role models to be emulated by skilled trainees. For example, they needed to know what family circumstances these 10 students come from. What was their transformation at the ITI? How did they overcome odds? And where were they placed after finishing their training? Of the 10 names, six had to be of those who have made a mark outside the state and four had to be women, and two had to be stories of entrepreneurship. The 10-6-4-2 formula caught everyone's fancy because everyone loves a delightful story. Today, all the ITIs can highlight their role models who inspire others to follow their examples. The first such role model was Muni Tiga, an Adibasi girl who lost her father early in her life. She came to an ITI. She trained for two years, and after her training, today she has become a loco engine pilot with the Indian Railways, where she hauls trains between Bhuvaneshwar and Palasa every day. Nunaram Hansda, another tribal, came to ITI Raurkela, where he always ran short of his mess dues by 30 rupees a month. His teachers pulled together the deficit and let him study. Today, Nunaram Hansda runs the insulin manufacturing line at Biocom. Just the same way, Somendra Das, trained at ITI Puri, became a trainee at Tata Motors. Quit his job, started an auto body repair garage, where today he employs 80 people and clocks revenues of Rs. 8 crores. 
The next thing for us was to make the ITI students self-confident. Over the years, they looked like a ragtag bunch. The state roped in National Institute of Fashion Design to suggest a new set of uniforms for them. Unlike the past, today ITI students play contact sports, compete at the state level, ITI fests take place to celebrate the debating, acting and other artistic talents. They look forward to going to class today because there are other cool things to do as well. Among the many other interventions at the ITI, a significant one was the concept of a change leader to work with young students for enhancing their life skills. For this, we have partnered with Tata Strive to send bright skilled trainers to every ITI on a two-year fellowship to augment technical training with life skills. Today, 93 change leaders and project managers are part of a process that impacts 27,000 students every year who learn about ideas like learning to lead, teamwork, problem solving, sustainability, design thinking. In 2016, government ITIs had less than 6% girls. In many ITI today, it has crossed 20% and the eventual goal is to cross 33%. Today, Odisha's ITI boasts of skill museums, open-air art installations that display their technical and design prowess. They take pride in their social outreach in terms of natural disasters, from fixing household gadgets in the flood-hit Kerala to helping restore power after Cyclone Fani that battered Odisha in 2019. The next thing was to create a new sense of direction and ambition among the teachers themselves. For the first time in India, we sent 215 ITI teachers and administrators to ITE Singapore, considered one of the best skilled institutions in the entire world. 90% of these teachers did not ever have a passport in their lives, signaling their own personal lack of outlook and ambition. These teachers, upon their return from Singapore, crafted the mission, vision, and values for what we call the new ITI. Beyond the ITI and polytechnics, the state implements many short-term employment-linked skill training for those who have dropped out of school after their fifth, eighth, or tenth class and would not go back to formal education either because they cannot cope or they have family compulsions. These youth train to become retail sales assistants, drivers, janitors, healthcare assistants, domestic electricians, industrial sewing machine operators, and so on. The flagship program for such training is the Deen Dial Upadhyay Gramin Koshalya Yojana of Government of India that provides 75-day residential training in many domains. Odisha has been adjudged by the Government of India as the best performing state for DDU GKY implementation for three years successively in a row. The famed Tirupur textile built of Tamil Nadu critically depends on skilled Odia workers. These are from DDU GKY, whose deft fingers make international levels from Diesel, Guess, H&M, Mark & Spencer to Tommy Hilfiger. Among the thousands of beneficiaries of our short-term skill program is Sumati Naik, a 10th class pass from Bhadrak who could not speak any language other than Odia. Today, Sumati is a department manager at Westside Coimbatore, or consider the story of Damanti Swain, a girl from Kendrapada, who was selected by Tata Advanced Systems, Hyderabad, where she builds aircraft body for Boeing and Pilatus. To make Odisha's talent more visible, the state has been engaging at the CEO level to create a special connect with high-quality employers. The efforts have paid off. Now, let's talk about the iconic World Skill Center. The World Skill Center has been set up in Bhubaneswar at an outlay of nearly 193 million US dollars. It has come up in Bhubaneswar, housed in an 18-story state-of-the-art building, spanning half a million square feet. It will roll out one-year courses as a finishing school designed with the help of IT Singapore in areas like precision engineering, vertical transportation, air conditioning, refrigeration, as well as certain creative economy courses like beauty and healthcare. Additionally, through several other programs, the World Skills Center will directly and indirectly impact 1.5 lakh youth by 2024. 
The World Skills Center will be run with expert guidance of an expatriate leadership team of five from IT who would eventually transfer the ability to local leadership team. The World Skills Center is part of a larger skill ecosystem in the state that is being further strengthened. A key part of the overall fix, scale and accelerate strategy is using the spirit of competition among youth for making skills aspirational. Towards this, in 2017, the state decided to participate in the India Skills Competition 2018, which was a precursor to World Skill Competition at Kazan in Russia. In preparation for Kazan, Odisha set up Mission 1, 2, 3. It meant Odisha would strive to get India one gold, two silvers and three bronzes. Towards this, Skills 2018 was conducted in Bhuvaneshwar for the very first time with 5,000 youth competing in trades from beauty to hospitality, nursing, welding, painting, carpentry, bricklaying, plumbing and many others. At the national level, Odisha surprised everyone with the second largest medal tally in the country, slightly behind Maharashtra. More importantly, three participants from Odisha represented India at World Skills 2019 in Russia and one of them, Aswat Narayan, brought India her very first gold medal after the World Skills competition in Kazan. The next one will be held in Shanghai in China in October 2022. Towards this, India Skills Competition 2021 was recently held in Delhi by the government of India. This heralded Odisha's moment of crowning glory. At the India Skills 2021, Odisha has been ranked first among all Indian states with the highest medal tally in all three categories of gold, silver and bronze. A large contingent is now getting ready under what we call Mission 234. The goal this time is to get India two golds, three silvers and four bronzes at the World Skill Competition Shanghai. Based on the original charter to make Odisha a sandbox for innovation, many breakthrough ideas have been created out of Odisha and one such is the Nano Unicorn program. As we all know, a unicorn is an internet startup with a valuation of more than a billion US dollars. India has a clutch of more than 60 such entities from Ola to Oyo to Paytm. But India's true progress would depend on how many nano unicorns we can create. These are tiny enterprises set up by skilled yacht who may generate just one or two jobs at a village or a small town somewhere remote in India. To build a prototype for this, Odisha launched the Nano Unicorn program. To find a potential Nano Unicorn with talent scout at the ITI level for their entrepreneurial aptitude, we listen to their dreams. And if we like the story, we send them to a two-week mini MBA program where the person can further own the business idea. At the end of the program, we bring in rupees one lakh from philanthropic funds and get the nano unicorn off the ground. A pilot has been rolled out so far with 433 nano unicorns, and this will be stepped up to 3,000 in the coming couple of years. The large goal is to harvest the story of entrepreneurship which we will share with young people to encourage them to look at skills as a means to become entrepreneurs beyond the journey of the last six years. Now, we are beginning to dream bigger. Odisha's skill efforts are in the middle of a reject. We are soon going to start work on Skill Vision 2030. The idea is to create a blueprint for the future. We have chosen 2030 as the milestone because it coincides with the sunset of Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations for the year 2030. What would be unusual is the process of crafting the vision, the creation of subsequent policy, articulation of the strategy for implementation, and the determination of funding as well as organizational structure and the resultant change management process. The exercise would start with an analysis of global trends that would have discontinuous impact on the future of work, employment and entrepreneurship. Vis-a-vis -vis these trends, the study would look at the as-is condition of skill preparedness of the state and then look at the could-be and the should-be scenarios. We need to plan for a differentiated position for the state. 
to make it a global benchmark for skill development and human transformation in the decade ahead. The visioning process would entail drawing from the insights of a multidisciplinary team of design thinkers, economists, sociologists, market analysts, technology and development sector specialists, and domain experts who have the thought leadership and the experience in large-scale transformation and change management. We know this is a journey that will never end. Under the leadership of the Honorable Chief Minister Shri Naveen Patnaik, all of us are driven by a sense of purpose. We are here to take the story of skilled in Odisha to the next level that recognizes every individual's right to skill, just as we talk about right to education. We are driven by the vision of the Honorable Chief Minister Shri Naveen Patnaik that skills must be seen, not just as a means for employment, but as a tool for human transformation. Skill in Odisha. That was the very dynamic Mr. Bakchi who sent us this so very detailed introduction to all the good work that's happening in Odisha in skilling. Uh, we have to remember that uh, Odisha at one point was a skill nobody and now it's a powerhouse for skilling. Can I please invite Mr. Amar Patnayak, Member of Parliament, Biju Janta Dal, on stage please, and Mr. Sangaran Gopal, Principal of the iconic World Skills Center. Mr. Gopal, we got a glimpse of the World Skills Center. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you've done so far and what's your vision for taking the Skilling Center forward? Okay, as uh, was mentioned by Bakshi sir, the World Skills Center is supposed to be a finishing school, which means it is adding on to the work that is done by our ITIs and the polytechnics to kind of move the notch one level higher. So the type of programs that we are running actually looks at skills and uh, skills training at something a little higher than what is currently being offered by our ITIs and the polytechnics. This whole thing actually works on a model of a hub and spoke. So the intent is to have the World Skills Center as a hub and all our ITIs and polytechnics to then have a role as hubs, uh, as spokes, so that whatever we, we develop at the, the World Skills Center can be multiplied and you know, be pushed down to the, the vocational and technical education institutes across the state. Uh, we have been in operation for about a year now and the vision is to actually see the World Skills Center establish itself as a hub and at the same time to make sure that whatever we develop at the World Skills Center gets effectively and efficiently transferred down to the ITIs and the polytechnics. Okay. Well, skilling is the buzzword. There's a Skill India mission that's being driven by the center. A lot of states are trying uh, to build, build on that and are setting up skilling institutes and so on and so forth. But we also know that this has been an endeavor that has not yielded the desired results in many parts of the country. Odisha it might be an aberration in that sense, right? We've not been able to crack the code. Mr. Patnaik, I'd like for you to come in here on, you know, what's the mindset shift that we need towards skilling? And why is it that our performance on the skilling front nationally has been so lackluster? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shwetaji. Uh, I think the most important thing which Mr. Bakshi has uh, made the presentation uh, is the fact that the mind shift has to shift from skill as a a uh, poor cousin of technology, B.Tech degrees uh, to something which to aspire for. That aspirational uh, change which is required in our students who would probably like to uh, do a B.Tech degree may not be of any great quality but not a skilled degree of good quality. 
So this change which is required in the mindset of uh, policy planners as well as implementers and as well as our students is something that has made Orissa stand out. The uh, Government of India's program may have had this uh, uh, change in the mindset in its thinking, but the states who are actually implementing it uh, have actually treated it the way we used to treat our ITIs before. Uh, so this aspirational aspect to aspire to be skilled in an ITI is a dream that I, I must fulfill when I complete my class 10 or whatever is something that we have ingrained into our uh, students. Now, this is not, this is what not, which has not happened in the rest of the country. Okay, fascinating because now in Urissa, I believe being an ITIN is a badge of honor. That's what I was reading that if you, if you come out of ITI, you wear it with, with much pride. Um, uh, so, if you could tell us, you know, how do you, how do you shift the mindset, right? And uh, for instance, I was watching the stories in the video, this, this, this lady, Damianti Swain, who has been hired by the Tata Group now, uh, if very amazing stories, very fascinating stories. So, do you encounter any kind of a mindset baggage when you're working with these students, when they come to your center? I think… Uh the, the key thing here is we are talking about human transformation. Right? It's not just about uh, skilling someone for a job, but letting that person know and believe that they are being developed to their maximum potential or they are on a journey towards the development of their maximum potential. And how do you do this? You do this by demonstrating that you are investing in this person's journey. And one key way to do this is to actually give them an infrastructure where your commitments towards their uh, upliftment and advancement is very clearly displayed. So if you, if you look at, at, at the video, look at the World Skills Center itself. It's, it's such a fascinating building, right? And, and why are we doing this? It is to actually make a statement. It is to make a very bold statement that the state is actually investing in each and every one who walks through these doors. And I guess the same uh, commitment is put across to the ITIs as they are upgrading their facilities. For those of you who have seen the, the video that was shown earlier, you would have caught some glimpses of ITE Singapore. And you would have seen those colleges. Some of those colleges look even more magnificent than universities themselves. And this was the same question which even uh, people there asked. Why are we investing so much on technical education when even our universities do not have this kind of facilities? And again, I think the direction was very clear. It is to make sure that our students pursuing technical and vocational education do not see themselves as poorer cousins in the education system. So you need to convince them of that and probably the best way you can do this is to demonstrate that commitment, firstly in infrastructure and of course follow that up with good curriculum, uh, standards of you know, instruction, pedagogy, assessment. Uh, uh, I just let me yes. supplement him. Uh, you know, normally what happens is that when you talk about upgrading uh, some new concept, you invest heavily in physical infrastructure. But what we have done here and what I am sure the skill center has done is not just the physical infrastructure, the digital infrastructure and I think the most important is the intellectual infrastructure to shift away, to be proud of having been skilled in the skill center, to be, have been skilled in Oressa. And then the last and most important is the emotional infrastructure. That is to work with somebody to unleash his full potential to become a citizen who contributes because of his skill to change society, to transform things in society. I think that is the key thing, that is the approach that Orissa has followed. Okay, how about the role of the private sector? Have you made, have you considered or have you made it mandatory for companies that are setting up operations here to take in a certain number of people and skill them? Has that been part of your strategy? Mr. Gopal. This uh, falls broadly into our placement uh, initiative. So that is currently work in progress. We are tying up with 
with potential employers to make sure that whoever who goes through these programs are given good opportunities to find good placement. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what we are doing at this juncture. Okay. Uh, Mr. Patnaik, well, well, yes. Yeah, I think, I think uh, as I understand, the most important thing in the skill ecosystem is to understand what the private sector needs. Right. So the right skilling is the key. And there, I think uh, the work is to find out what the private sector needs, what are the gaps that they need, and what are the areas in which I think the skill bridging can take place. Right. So that exercise, I am sure, is taking place. And in the vision document that Mr. Bakshi mm -hmm. talked about of 2030, this is what is going to get reflected. So the private sector, not just for the purpose of getting jobs, but they would be involved in developing these uh, skills themselves and the students themselves. There are various programs, I think, they have of managed uh, uh, operations by private operators so that they become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the private sector could get invested in a certain cohort of skill, uh, skilled, uh, you know, children who they might just hire for actually upgrading their own ecosystem inside. Mm -hmm. So these are various possibilities for the private sector and the government, uh, ITI's cooperation. And I, I think the government of Orissa is working on that. Mm -hmm. I believe this is what is actually making Orissa uh, stand, uh, stand out. I was speaking to somebody who was explaining to me that, uh, you know, they had uh, somebody from the government they had traveled to uh, Kashmir and uh, there uh, they went to an ITI in Srinagar and uh, you know the, pers the concerned person spoke at length in, in the hall and there were a lot of students there but there were a bunch of girls sitting right at the back of the room and they kept whispering amongst each other and then uh, one of them raised their hand to ask a question and the question was that why is it that you're only offering courses which are which enable boys to get employment, which were very technical in nature. So the girls felt very dissuaded to make the trip to, uh, all the way to that ITI to attend a program or a course which was very mechanical or technical, which was not in, at their, uh, you know, uh, they did not fall in their purview of interest which I thought was very, very interesting. And they had the, so, so the generation has changed. They questioned the, the concerned official on that. And that's what got them thinking about how to rejig the mix of courses that they're offering. So is that something that uh, Orissa is mindful of? Yeah, you would have heard Mr. Bakshi speak about it. May not be in that great detail. But the fact is, for skilling in the ITIs for our girls, I think it is free. Uh, and, and you have a certain percentage, I think one third have to be girls. And most important, the recognition of the fact that girls require or need a different kind of skill, which is called the part of the creative economy of the country. Now, I think in Orissa, the biggest strength of our uh, uh, entire skill ecosystem should be the fact that our, if you look at Orissa's handloom and handicrafts, if you look at the Pipli uh, works, if you look at the filigree works, if you look at many of these works, the miniature kind of work is done by women. And that should be the USP and that mm -hmm. is what we should leverage on. And I do not know how many of you have heard the speech in parliament of uh, uh, the finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman uh, while discussing on the appropriation bill of Jammu and Kashmir. She did mention that the master weavers or the master craftsmen from Katak are being taken to Jammu and Kashmir, she mentioned, that is why, uh, that's why I remember, to train those people on the various as aspects of miniature work. And that's where our strength is, and I, I'm sure this is what they're going to build on. Right. So there is a lot of things, emphasis, under the skilled Orissa thing, as you know, our Chief Minister emphasizes on the women aspect, the girls, to be empowered in all possible ways and I think that is at the crux of our entire uh, skill ecosystem in our state. Right. Mr. Kopal, we are so way behind the curve when it comes to skilling. The world has moved forward in leaps and bounds. We are talking about AI, robotics, so on and so forth. Yet, when we talk about skilling, we are talking about people getting trained in painting cars and uh, becoming beauticians and all of that. So how do you bridge that, you know, high skill gap with the, with the basic skill gap? Because I sometimes feel that there's also a disconnect between 
where the world is headed and what we are thinking. Shouldn't we be gearing up our children, you know, in the higher skill band category now? Uh, I think you're right. But uh, firstly, we need to change this uh, misconception that uh, what we are doing in India is something which is of a lower skill. We need to actually understand the nature of the country, right? It is such a vast country, right? And I mean, today you have satellites in space, right? So why, why are we saying that, you know, the technology has not caught up? But whether that level of technology has spanned right across the country is something that uh, we need to study further. And I don't think at this point it has. But the journey has begun. So you need to do it in a gradual manner. You know, for someone who has not used any form of automation, if you straight away plant them into AI and robotics, the learning curve would be very, very steep. And that would pose a lot of challenges on its own. So it, in a way, you need to kind of moderate this, this journey. You know, Those who are in a position where they are a lot more familiar with this technology, we can inch them up that notch and bring right, them. Right, sir. But what I'm saying is it does not have to be either this or that. It can be this and that. Yes. Like, so, for instance, I would love to be skilled in uh, AI, for instance. I would love to love it. If I, have, if I had, you know, a good institute offering me that, I would love to take weekend classes and just do that. But I find that those avenues are very restricted. Of course, that's a more national level question, not specifically in Orissa. But why, why aren't we thinking on those lines, this and that, rather than this or this? I think today the opportunity for this and that is there. Right. But how much of it is actually able to reach everyone, that might be a bit of a challenge because it's quite difficult for you to set up a, a, a technical uh, facility that covers for the wide spectrum. You know, because technical training is actually a very wide spectrum. And to have something that covers the entire spectrum might be a bit challenging. So uh, probably a better way to go forward is to have institutions that do uh, the progression in a gradual manner and then allow provisions for students to move into this uh, institutions and upgrade themselves. So, see, technical training is, is, is an ongoing journey. It never ends, right? And particularly today because the shelf life of technology is getting shorter. So, right. someone who goes through an ITI or a Polytechnic or even the World Skills Center cannot claim that the moment I've completed my technical training, this is going to last me a lifetime. It's not going to happen. So, I also think there is a shift from uh, technical and vocational training to continuous technical training and that's something that must become a part of life in India too. Okay. Mr. Patnayak, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the role that the corporates can play in this on a national level because we've seen that, uh, you know, corporates keep complaining about how they're not able to find skilled labor and we know that, you know, we are trying to build a pipeline of skilled professionals. So how can we address this gap? I think I, I talked about it a little bit earlier. You see, uh, we read at number of places that some, you know, 80% of our graduates are unemployable. We also read that, you know, so much of skills are given, uh, training has been given, but this is not, you know, uh, they don't find jobs uh, in the corporate sector. I think the root cause of the problem is this, uh, you know, the gap analysis between what the corporates want and what the skill centers or the skill uh, institutions provide. Having said so, I would also say that the kind of synergy that the industries should have had with our ITIs or even before in our educational system, the way it is there abroad, I think that much of investment in time and energy by the corporate sector is yet to be found. And therefore, the communication of what they need what kind of things that, that would actually be required for their specific industry, that is not communicated down the line to the skill centers or to our educational institutions. I, and the NEP, the recent NEP, is, a, is actually doing a good thing by recognizing this fact and trying to get skill in our educational system right from the beginning. Right, right. In fact, uh, my son who is nine, his school sent a mail saying that now the children are not going to be evaluated on the basis of concept learning, but they will be evaluated on the basis of skills. Yeah, the skills learning and uh, the, that's going to be the evaluation for every quarter. 
In, in fact, uh, I, I don't know whether someone would be there uh, here in this hall who would be from uh, the school where I studied here. This is called the DM school here. When anybody I was, here from anybody that school? Here? DM school? No. So when I was a student here, we used to have something called as SUPW, socially useful productive work. Yeah, I, I and did I, too. <laughs> I, I learned typing, uh, you know, in those old uh, uh, manual typewriters. I remember we had typing so classes. So did I. This is terrible. <laughs> so, and then we also had woodwork, you know, the, the woodwork. So this was an NCRT school. I don't know, somewhere along the way, we have lost that. Yeah. Because, because I think everybody wants to follow the engineering route straight away into that uh, field uh, without probably even having, uh, it's not that's a question of competence, not even having the, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, interest or, uh, interest yeah. or, you know, versatility required. So I think the skill ecosystem has to develop to grab these people and take them in a direction in which they feel proud, they contribute to society and the most important thing is that they, they are not left after completing the B.Tech degree complaining that we are unemployable, we are not getting jobs in the private sector. Says. The other day I was watching the news, it was India Today TV and there was a news story which was a good news story about this young girl who was an economics graduate from ba Banaras Hindu University but she would set up a tea stall in uh, Patna and uh, because she said that she did not get the kind of job that she wanted, so she decided to become a nano entrepreneur, I think, a micro entrepreneur, whatever you would like to call it. But she said she researched on the number of teas available and she studied how Thelawalas do their chai and uh, she set up a little stall outside. Our cab driver in Bhubaneswar is, uh, is uh, a BA I'm forgetting his subject right now, but he's also a BA graduate and uh, an honors graduate. And uh, he, I asked him, I said, why didn't you take a job with a private company? He said, uh, with a private company, I would have been paid six, seven thousand rupees a month. Now I earn twenty thousand rupees a month. I own four taxis. So his skill is driving and he's uh, capitalized on that. These are very exciting times for skill, I think. The examples that you were mentioned actually uh, a testimony to that. Uh, I think our, our, our students should realize that uh, it is the skill uh, education which would either not only make them entrepreneurs, not, not only make them you know, find jobs in the uh, corporate sector, but would also make them entrepreneurs. You should actually go through the list of people who, uh, the world over, who haven't had a formal degree, including Bill Gates himself, who dropped out from Harvard. But the point is that in our country, still it was considered that a degree uh, could actually get them jobs. A degree is what society wants. I think it is the skill and the proficiency in that skill which should actually make a pa parent proud of his son or daughter and make the country proud uh, of that particular child. And I think that is arriving. The NEP is in that direction. Things which are happening in Orissa under the uh, guidance of our Chief Minister is absolutely brilliant that I think many of the states should mimic and start uh, you know, replicating it. Then the system will change. Absolutely. Then the things will change when people will say that I'm uh, skilled in India just like we are trying to brand, uh, have a brand of skilled in Orissa. Okay. Made in India, skilled in India, contributing to India. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to both of you. Can we get a big round of applause for our panelists? It's a fantastic story of a complete turnaround in Odisha where skilling is concerned. Can I now invite Mr. Ranjan Ghosh and Mr. Ashish Kumar to please come on stage uh, to present our guests with a token of appreciation, please.
positive session on skilling we move on to a very crucial topic we are increasingly living in a very polarized world narratives are getting more and more strident but odisha stands out as one of the few states holding on to the essence of india's pluralism our next session is exactly that odisha the essence of india's pluralism can i please invite my colleague mg arun executive editor of india today magazine and panelists mr devdat patnayak author and mythologist and mr r balakrishnan author researcher and chief advisor to the chief minister's office good afternoon everyone culture shapes a society's core values and norms which are shared and transmitted from one generation to another through social learning through a social learning process of modeling and observation one of the unique aspects of indian culture has been its plurality and today to talk about plurality and also to talk about some of the challenges that are that it is facing we have got two prominent experts with us we have got mr devdat patnaik who is a prominent author he has written around 50 books and a mythologist and we have mr r balakrishnan who is an author researcher and chief advisor to the chief minister's office welcome one interesting aspect of both these panelists is that they are they are plural in themselves mr balakrishnan who was born and brought up in tamil nadu has spent over 30 years in odisha and he is an ias officer who can read and write in odia mr devdat patnaik whose parents are from odisha but he is born he was born and brought up in mumbai lived there for close to 5 decades and he speaks and writes excellent marathi i don't have much claims to it but i can say that i am from kerala but lived most of my life in mumbai and today i am in bhubaneswar talking to you about plurality so let us start off this conversation and i just we at the back stage we were saying that you know we could have it more of as a fireside conversation because uh both of my panelists are excellent when it comes to words i think you know we can talk of the fact that you know india as a country is known for its plurality could you guide us through some of the aspects that have that you would like to underline when it comes to the country okay i'll i'll go with mr balakrishnan first okay as a country and then you know we can come to the to the state you thank you good evening all of you uh, in the outset uh, you yourself mentioned that uh, is a three plural people uh, talking about uh, going to talk about india's pluralism and orissa i am a non resident tamil uh, and then he is a non resident oriya and you are non resident kerala we are all talking about pluralism that is the beauty of this country so that 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 is the beauty of this nation and uh, right from the beginning in my view that indian subcontinent has been plural it's a, it's a born plural so look at the variety that mean the number of languages speaker spoken there are many countries say uh, which remove actually for, take uh, the new american american continent when the europeans went then what happened to uh, red indians the native americans and then the whites went to australia then what happened to the aboriginal cultures but india is a continuously functioning civilization from the indus valley civilization period 4500 year back people had a toilet latrine and drainages and lived a excellent civic life 
Even, even today is a living civilization and up to an absolute continuity and then there is not much of war and people living together. This many languages survived. For example, that we have a language called Bonda. They speak a language called Rimo. It's spoken to something around 4,500 to 5,000 people. They must, must have existed in this particular land for the millions of years. So the very fact that India is a, a very, very a classical story for the pluralism. And uh, of course, there could be a different type of understanding. Uh, probably we'll go to that uh, at, uh, after um, uh, Mr. Patnaik takes a call on that. Basically, the pluralism itself, how it can be multiculturalism, can be variously viewed. Probably I'll come back to that. Okay, Mr. Patnaik, maybe your views on, you know, India as a plural country. And, and also, you know, maybe you can draw on uh, some of the areas of expertise, which is mythology. Uh, so, India is the land which gave the world the concept of rebirth. So, what is called Punarjan, rebirth, karma. This idea of rebirth emerges in India and because it is about uh, rebirth, that idea is closely related to diversity. Because the concept that you live only once, there is one God, one life and you live only once and you have to live one way, the right way. That kind of thought does not allow for diverse manifestations of life. Because if I say there is only one God, one life, one way of living, then I want to live the right way and then there is a wrong way. Right and wrong comes. But the moment I say there are many gods, many lives, many ways of looking at things, many ways of living, I automatically open myself up to the idea that people are different and it's okay to be different. I'm not, I don't see a difference as chaos. So when you talk to scholars from the West or mythology scholars, they always use the word chaos and order. Indian philosophy does not have the word chaos. The word chaos doesn't exist. They'll say prakriti, nature is default programming and then humans impose a culture on it called sanskriti. And because humans are diverse, we all will create diverse sanskritis. So we all have to deal with one common thing which is nature. But every culture will look at life differently. So what is in Jainism called anekantavad multiple ways of thinking. These are ideas which are what? 2000 years old, 3000 years old. We are not talking about some idea which came in the enlightenment period which is what? Less than 300, 400 years old. We are talking about ideas which have been part of our country for 2000 years conservatively. Maybe 3000 years. So that I think is the essence of Indian pluralism. The acceptance key of karma, of acceptance that everybody thinks differently, everybody is different. There will be different languages. I don't expect homogeneity. I expect diversity. While th the way I see philosophies in the West, they privilege homogeneity and they privilege one idea over many. And that's what you see happening. And when they came, so they bring the idea of there is only one, but the moment they come to India, they, everything is about many, many, many. And that's the tension that you see. So India's pluralism is based on its philosophy. Great. So you know, now we will examine as to why uh, plurality is a very important, uh, you know, component to have or an idea to have, and we should uh, sort of uh, um, give our best to maintain that quality. Uh, you have been a, a an IAS officer for several you know, years here. What has been your experience? And I know you you were talking about the way in which um, this impacts governance in a big way. So, from the practical aspect of it, how do you bring, how do you bring plurality? Uh, why do you think it's a major component when it comes to governance of a state like Odisha? I will take this question in two parts. Uh, rather, I thought that uh, rather it's uh, better for me to anchor one particular idea. Uh, why? Because I am an officer here, I am bound to work here. Apart from that, I love this place for the simple reason it's a plural. And I am born plural. 
So then a plural guy liking a plural place is a, it's a very natural kind of idea because I was brought up with that kind of ideologies and I found it's a very excellent plural ground. Why this is a essence of pluralism in India, uh, you are right now in a state right now. In India, there are six languages are officially declared, declared as a classical language. In the Tamils first took that as a kind of movement. They fought for 100 years, ultimately in 2004. And uh, Tamil was declared as a classical language. Incidentally, I happen to be a person who also had a role in drafting the cabinet-related notes. I was approached to write for it because I love my mother tongue and uh, I have uh, quite a um, writing as well. So then, last language to be declared as a classical in India is Odia in 2014. Then followed by Tamil, it was uh, Sanskrit, then Telugu, then, then Kannada, Telugu, Malayalam, then Odia. So if you really look at it, out of these six languages, one is a Sanskrit language of the ancient and uh, not actually spoken by the people, but it's a great depository, repository of knowledge. But then other languages are basically Southern Dravidian languages, that means rest of the four. Only one Indo-Aryan language in India, which is living language, which is declared as a classical language, is Oriya language. Why I am telling this a classical, I am underlining, when a language is considered classical, that is also home to, it's a home to 62 type of tribes, who speak to three important linguistic family languages. We are not talking about the three different languages. We are talking about the linguistics family. That means we have a something called austro asiatic linguistic family to which our people like uh, Santals, Mundals, Bondas, Gadavas and Juangs, they all belong. Then again, Dravidian languages like, uh, like our, our uh, Kandos and uh, Kui speakers, Oran, and uh, so many people, uh, tribal people belong. Third category, Indo-Aryan, that is uh, our Oriya and other Desiya languages and all. Fourth addition is 1963, when the Tibetans came to Chandragiri and uh, settled down here. I would rather our Kesi Satpati, uh, he advocates that that also will be recognized as a linguistic family being spoken. So I take by his advice, that way literally four linguistic families are living. So one language being simultaneously classic, and uh, simultaneously being plural and home to the four different ancient linguistic, three different ancient linguistics family and accommodating another linguistic family is a unique case study. So that is how I look at it, the ground in which uh, uh, this particular uh, state. I have a feeling it has been plural right from the beginning. We know Kalinga war as a war where the history took a U-turn where the Sanda Asaka was supposed to become the Dharma Asaka, the history of the world, at least the history of Asia would have been different, but for the Kalinga war. But then nobody knows that who was the king who fought. But probably in such a big war, it was a very, very, very loosely organized a federal structure. I have seen that the federal spirit in Orissa at every point of time, be it a Paiku Andolan, be it the freedom struggle, even today's modern Orissa history, it's a plural and federal in nature. Having said that, so as an officer, how I look at it? It's been very, very helpful for me because when I deal with the 22.5% of the population being a tribal and the scheduled court and scheduled tribe put together nearly 40%, different diverse linguistic uh, group, we how to have a the philosophy of accepting, understanding and acting upon. Because that uh, developmental process is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Unless I strike a conversation, unless I have a dialogue, we cannot deliver. So that the tribals taught me, I cannot think of, uh, because Orissa is considered to be one of the subsidiary cradle of the paddy cultivation along with the Southeast Asia, China and the Jaipur Valley is considered to be a place where something around 3500 BC or something around 6000 year back, the rice was domesticated. Okay, then when I very then, as Ramaya has written an article in 1953, the, you go on Google for it, Orissa being the cradle. But then how many people will know that the remote Mudulipada Bonda, about, you, about whom every, every year Elvin has written, they have a kind of a uh, mythological story, that means their own uh, myths and then legends in the tribal myths eh, where the paddy once upon a time was having its wings and there was a conversation, fight between the human beings and the paddy 
and the sun god the singhi rk of the bondas he comes for the mediation they go there and they have a competition whosoever loses he will be punished by singhi rk and then humans win it and then singhi rk uses his sword and cuts the both the wings of the paddy before which the paddy was flying from one location to other location after that the paddy started living in one location this is the myth goes i take this particular myth when i was working in 1988 i spoke about it i wrote about it this story is not about another myth this is the story carried forward memory about the domestication of the paddy because like a wild wheat wild paddy the it will keep on moving unless it is domesticated and transplanted it will not stay in one place so that mean if i can draw a inference from the the bond of myth to a scientific truth about the thing so i have lot more to learn from the orissa uh, and and then i i used to wonder i when i when i first time came to know about the danur yatra in 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 burgad where the you know that it is about the mahabharatam story but the hero is not krishna hero is actually kansa so that means how this particular diverse culture is celebrating all type of identities so it's a lesson and we get a benefit of it because our our sensitive sensitivity towards the pluralism and the tribal welfare is getting sharpened it got sharpened because of my understanding of pluralism it has helped me as an officer also great so mr patnaik you know from the point of view of uh, uh, how do you look at the state of odisha from point of view of mythology uh so please call me dev that nobody calls me mr patnaik <laughs> um so i grew up in bombay and uh in bombay not many people would know about odisha so you know um for example just recently i met this gentleman and he kept talking about rajputs and the great rajputs and nobody writes about rajputs i was doing a holiday near rajasthan so i just looked at the gentleman and said have you heard of the gajapatis he said maine kabhi nahi suna hai i said kyun nahi suna hai tum chahte ho ki main rajput ke bare mein sunu lekin tum gajapati ke bare mein sunna nahi chahte ye to theek nahi hua na it's not correct that you want me to know your story but you are not interested in my story pluralism is about listening to each other's stories not as sir said it's not a monologue it's a dialogue in the yajur ved the definition of yagya is given the yagya the vedic ritual yagya there's only one definition it's not so complicated it says dehi ma dadami te give me what i give you so if i give you a story you have to give me a story if i give you value you have to give me value now this is a trading metaphor this is what yagya is and this is what indian culture is all about so the rishis were people who went around saying dehi ma dadami te i'm not going to take anything give me what i give you if i don't give you something you don't give me something now this is how mythology talks about plurality so these people are traveling across the kingdom so for, you know when we are talking about uh, odisha from a mythological point of view we must understand that when people say you know india was one and i'm like no it happens very slowly india has many 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 ideas being brought together by different forces at work for example look at the jagannath temple in the jagannath temple i remember once somebody asking to kya ye krishna ka mandir hai and then the panda over there said nee wo krishna bhi hai ram bhi hai vishnu bhi hai shiv ji bhi hai devi bhi hai buddh bhi hai so he is telling you look at the temple because it's jagannath you can see him whichever way you like he is avatar and avatari he is this and that what is happening when i'm telling you this story when when you are asking me a very simple linear question is this x and the person in the temple is telling you well it is x x1 x2 x3 x4 x raised to the power of infinity he is talking about plurality he is saying you know it can be whatever you want it to be and that is how plurality spreads because you are constantly respecting people's views 
ideas i want to know about rajputs you want to know about gajapatis i want to know about krishna you are talking about ananta vasudev the infinite one ananta means infinity so i want information on one god i end up listening about many gods this is how in indian mythology we talk, you know we forget that you know everybody talks about the four vedas the only manuscript i mean of atharva veda was found in odisha the only place where it survived was in odisha atharva veda today the document that we have comes from odisha but you ask someone in the rest of india where did atharva veda survive they don't remember odisha because the stories are not being exchanged india has always had multiple storytellers traveling from north to south like uh, i had done a television show called devlok with devdat patnaik and one of the episodes we had um, shabri ke bear it's a very famous episode of shabri eating berries now the director did not get bear because the during the season there was no bear available in the market he put angur he put angur then there was a lot of controversy shabri ke bear mein shabri ke angur kaise bana diye tumne because it was angur so i had to i was talking to the press and i was talking to the people who were getting very angry i said पहली कहानी कहाँ पे आई द फर्स्ट बिकॉज शबरी के बेर की कहानी वाल्मीकि रामायण में नहीं मिलता है शबरी इज देयर इन वाल्मीकि रामायण बट शबरी के बेर इज नॉट देयर इन वाल्मीकि रामायण द झूठा बेर सो ही सेड नहीं तुलसी रामायण ऐसे तुलसी रामायण में नहीं है आई नो इट इज फ्रॉम आई टोल्डम दे भक्ति माला में मिलता है विच इज सेवनटीन सेंचुरी लेकिन ये कहानी सबसे पुरानी लोक कथा है उड़ीसा की और यहाँ पे शबरी नहीं कहेंगे उसको शवर कन्या बोलेंगे एंड इट इज नॉट अ बेर इट इज अ मैंगो बिकॉज दिस शबर कन्या विथ अ हजबेंड द शबर एंड शबरी विच इज द सबर अ पीपल राम कम्स एंड दे ऑफर हिम अ बास्केट ऑफ मैंगोज एंड ही ऑब्जर्व द सम ऑफ द मैंगोज हैव बाइट मार्क्स बिकॉज दे वर ईटिंग इट एंड इज आई वॉन्ट दैट बिकॉज ऑब्वियसली दैट इज टेस्टी and by doing that now look at the idea in india we all talk about the brahmanical purity or jhoota nahi khilana chahiye you will not touch saliva it's considered bad in odia it's called ointha jhoota you will not give ointha to god but god is saying i want that i want what you have eaten give me so look at this he's taking imagine in a brahmanical society the story is being written by someone in odisha long ago and he's saying the lord accepted the food eaten by the sabaras the tribal people of odisha and i heard this story and i heard this as a child and i told them the audience to yahan pe shabri ke bear nahi hai shabri ke aam hai you are obsessed with whether it is a bear whether it is angur whether it is aam you are obsessed with whether it is valmiki ramayan whether it is in odia ramayan but bhav dekho na kahani ka bhav kya hai bhav is god is saying i don't believe in this jhoota vuta business i want to be your friend and friends jo dost hote hain wo chhua chhut nahi karte bhagwan chhua chhut nahi karta manushya chhua chhut karta hai now that's a story which comes from odisha and now when you go to the jagannath temple you see there is the daityapatis there is a constant need to connect it with its root tribal culture that it comes from the loka parampara purushottam kshetra which people don't realize in bauddha yana dharma shastra aryans are told don't go to kalinga it is you will have to come back and purify yourself but that's purushottam you only can go for pilgrimage which means they were probably talking about purushottam kshetra only for pilgrimage you can go to kalinga otherwise don't go there so these ideas that purity and impurity and here is a land where the story comes and this is a unique you could say in a narrative innovation when people are showing on television shabri ke bear they don't remember odisha they don't remember the story they don't remember the origins of the story they do not interested in the bhav of the story which is the heart of pluralism and i think that is what कल्चर्स गिव अगर हम एक दूसरे की कहानियां सुनते तो हमें उड़ीसा की कहानी भी सुनाई देती चारों तरफ वी वुडेंट बी ऑब्सेस्ड विथ वन स्टोरी फ्रॉम ओनली वन पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया 
but we would listen to each other's stories and appreciate like the oldest mahabharat written in a lok parampara is sarala das mahabharat i in my art i always draw the image of nabagunjara and people say humne to kabhi nahi dekha hai sir kyun nahi dekha hai bharat ka hai agar tum if you are interested in me i will tell you my story but you are so self absorbed like a kupamanduk which is like a frog in a well you are not list you know you are only interested in the stories of the rajputs but not listening to the stories of the gajapatis i want to know about the choda kings when i talk to sir when we are talking about tamil culture i talk about tanjur and i tell him tell me about uh, madurai when i meet someone from kerala i want to know about the backwaters the samudrapati the zamorins when i go to karnada karnataka i want to know about the hoysalas i want to know about uh, the basadis over there so every state has a story and i think mythology says dehi ma dadami te i will get what i give and i think this is the heart of pluralism storytelling lovely uh, in fact uh, <laughs> mr balakrishnan you know you, you have been listening to the stories of odisha for a long time now i mean you have as he said you have come from uh, tamil nadu which itself is a is a place steeped in culture and one of the oldest cultures uh, in fact you know there is a very strong debate that is coming up where, which says tamil is the oldest language you know uh, etc etc so coming to orissa you know what are the kind of things you have picked up you know what is the kind of sense you have got about the the culture that he just mentioned about you know india from your perspective from the mythology perspective more than job perspective i would be more uh, take this question as a, as a researcher and a, uh, author uh, so in 2019 i published my book after a 32 years of research which i started in uh, koraput in 1988 is a 523 kg pages and 3.3 kilo book and it's gone for the third edition in 2 years but then this book i am right from the first page i write that i owe this book the entire understanding to the tribals of orissa in a way that book actually i owe to the tribals of orissa from there from where i got my understanding to put it uh, to take from what uh, devdath told that uh, why adarva veda is not popular in other part of india and then uh, same is the case with the yajur veda also block yajur veda is some popular in one few areas and uh, white yajur veda and particularly other way veda uh, i think this question has been uh, early indians uh, rajesh kochar has handled that uh, when the people travel aryans travel they pick up the uh, information about the local tribes and local people slowly and that is the reason other way veda is the fourth veda there are people who say that only there is a trivedis and chaturvedis so this fourth veda other way veda contains lot of information about the indigenous that is where the vedic literature gets into the magic and medicine that mean other way veda is full of magic and medicine having said that suppose i assume that i stand before a konark i have done lot of research and written lot of papers uh, nationally internationally about konark it's one of my pet subjects and then when i stand in konark i am asking myself this konark in front of me is it a great classical elite story or is it a folk story or is it a tribal story or is it a foreign story in for me it is everything let me give an example in india you will find that the surya is a god if i am from south anywhere in tamil nadu i have or in andhra or in karnataka i have never seen god wearing a shoe like this a shoe up to this is known as a horse rider shoe and there is a coat mail dress in the surya god in konark is wearing a horse rider shoe and a coat mail this is the typical of the what is known as northern sun god originating in the eastern iran which is known as sakal dipi sakal dipi and then in orissa there is a group of brahmins are there they are known as sakal dipi brahmins and if i rightly remember they have a headquarters in binjarpur in jajpur district i met one of the member who was the uh, advocate in the madra katak high court in some time in 90s i met him and took some input from him they are sakal dipi brahmins in search of them i have traveled to uttar pradesh gone to ocean in uh, rajasthan so that mean there is a one particular element of a konark which takes from the south iranian layer of the sun worship 
and there is a giraffe there is only one temple in india where the giraffe in two places exactly sizzled and people written lot of story about it how an african giraffe never lived anywhere in anywhere in the world other than the africa and those days there was no circus so what was that particular connect you go to the koraka in the konark sculptures i will show you where the along with the giraffe the people who are walking the women are wearing african skirts and there is a there is a two type of element elephant asian and african elephant and compare this with the karnak and abu simbel sun worshiping temples of egypt don't look it in the it's an international enterprise you go to the konark there is a panel in which a tribal woman carrying a rooster i don't know whether she want to give it as a bali or the sacrifice or just carrying a rooster and going to the temple it is in the sanctum sanctorum so then with the forgetting all about this tribal element is the iranian input the african input an international input suddenly you go and tell it's only surya which is not correct so the name konarka itself i have a tribe uh, for whom the sun is the numero uno supreme god the sun is not a demigod or the he is not the subordinate god he is the creator that is for the munda munda santal tribe and the bonda tribes astro asiatic tribal people do you know the, what is the name of the sun god singi rk in the name of singi rk a bonda tribe will never tell a lie i have interviewed almost about 70 prisoners in koraput in 1988 and they will say that uh, most of the cases are confession basis that uh, did you murder uh, he was said yes i murdered he killed there is no word because he takes in the name of singhi rk he never tell a lie because singhi rk is seeing everything from singhi rk to arnas tampo it is a absolute continuity of a cultural tradition so i refuse to believe that a primitive tribe like a bonda tribe their god being a singhi rk they would have borrowed this name somebody has written that they have borrowed this name from the sanskrit arka which will never take place a tribe will never borrow their numero you know god name from an another literature a no bonda must have read a sanskrit literature so that mean there is a need to look at the indian civilization indian culture as a multi layered i see it is a multi layered one one layer tribal layer folk layer and a modern layer and a brahmanic layer layer after layer unless you understand the cross section you will get uh, basically misguided so just to say that uh, how i look at this particular pluralism in india as well as in orissa specifically normally we in the in the uh, in the modern world when we talk about the whether it's a uh, wonder that was india or any amount of conversation about india we are getting used to a terminology called unity in diversity it seems long when i was a child also i heard about unity in diversity then immediately people you say india is a melting pot uh, i deny that i refuse that india is not a melting pot melting pot is a place where the metals are melted and an alloys are made they the original metal lose their identity they become a new metal india is not a new metal it is a place where the all the original elements are staying there so it is a, it, it, melting pot is a place is a slaughter house melting pot is a slaughter house where the identities will be killed but whereas in india identities cannot be killed even 4000 bondas they will keep their language they will keep their dress they will keep their identity so it is where the identities thrive and co live so it is not a melting pot you go to us people now talk about the new uh, phrase called metaphor called uh, salad bowl so when we have a breakfast we have a salad bowl in front of us there is a kakudi there is a carrot there is a cabbage and all kind of vegetables kept so i don't agree indian pluralism to be a salad bowl because salad bowl is a, a it's not an organic process it's a post harvest uh, process that mean you have to you have to write an entrance exam to make a grade to be in the your salad bowl because we don't keep a brinjal we don't keep the lady's finger so that it is not a salad bowl i consider indian pluralism orissa pluralism is a pluralism of a rain forest where everything thrives there is a rain forest there is a multiple layer there is a forest floor there is an understory there is a canopy there is an overshoot 
then there is a fungus or a fungus are there a very in the floor small insects are there worms are there birds are flying butterfly is there in some level monkeys are jumping and the tiger is living and the overshoot there is a birds are there so india is a rain forest orissa is a rain forest so this particular rain forest pluralism only i consider the greatest form of pluralism it is not a melting pot so i learned this from orissa only because otherwise i would have i must have had the understanding through our literature which is 2000 year old ancient literature but i never seen a place where a classical tradition as well as tribal tradition living together such a easy way it, 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 that mean here people are not tolerating each other it, 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 this pluralism is not imposed on them this pluralism is not a compulsion in my in my view orissa's pluralism is a voluntary spirit in letter and spirit it is a plural place that is the reason i have fallen in love with orissa because i am basically a plural guy thank you on that wonderful note of uh, the analogy of uh, a rainforest where everything you know is allowed to thrive and spread cheer and uh, sh shade and sunshine uh, we would like to end this uh, conversation thank you both uh, for giving those wonderful insights to us thanks sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Patnayak and uh, Mr. Balakrishnan. It was a fantastic session. Thank you, MG. Uh, we were just discussing that how we need to have more of these conversations. And we've learned so much sitting in the audience. We love the nuances. I love the melting pot analogy because until now, my, I thought New York is also a melting pot because all identities and people from all over the world come and fuse into each other. I never thought about it the way you explained it. And I think it was really lovely, very insightful. Thank you so much. Can we invite um, Mr. Santosh Kumar Sahu and Mr. Sudhir Kumar to please come on stage and f felicitate our uh, guests. of pluralism because that's what is Bharatiyata and that's what being Indian is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on now to our next conversation from poverty to prosperity, mapping Odisha's future. The Odisha we see today is so much different from the Odisha from say 20 or 30 years ago. It's been a fascinating journey of a complete turnaround and what good governance can achieve. In absolute terms, the state's per capita income has reached 1,27,383 rupees in, in the year 2021 from 48,499 rupees in 2011-2012. Odisha's rate of growth has been faster than the national average, whether it's in, in, it's in the growth rate or it's in the terms of national per capita income. State's employment rate also is, uh, unemployment rate is also at 6.2% compared to India's average of 4.8% and its inflation is at 2.7% compared to 5.3% at the national level. To discuss more about to discuss more about Orissa's journey from poverty to prosperity, can I please invite my colleague Kaushik Deka, executive editor of India Today, Mr. Kalikesh Narayan Singh Deo, former Lok Sabha member, BJD, 
Mr. Bhakta Charan Das, former Union Minister, and Mr. Bhurgu Bhaksipatra, Vice President of Odisha BJP. Over to you, Kaushik. I have a very interesting panel. Uh, I have with me Mr. Bhakta Charan Das, mm -hmm. who has been in politics for perhaps around 45 years. And the two other guests that I have with me, uh, Kalike Singh Deo and Bhrugu uh, Bhaksi Patra, they both are around the same age, I believe, if I'm not revealing out age. But so it's a very interesting combination of experience, wisdom, and youth new energy and the subject is Odisha's drive to prosperity from poverty to prosperity but before I get into Odisha's strength and weaknesses I would like to deal on the strength and weaknesses of my three esteemed guests. Uh, my first question is to Kalike Singh Deo. Since 2000, since in this century actually, your party is in power in this state. <coughs> And very interestingly, uh, it has a 147 uh, seat uh, assembly. And since 2009, I believe around 70 percent seats you have been regularly cornering. What's this magic, the secret of this magic? Why this uh, dominance of BJD has been possible? Is it because uh, you have a um, charismatic leader in the form of uh, Navin Patnaik ji? or is it the party infrastructure or is it something special that you have been doing for the state? Um, thank you Kaushik for that question. A lot of that question is answered in within the question itself. It's a mixture of a lot of things. Of course we have a very charismatic and uh, a leader which uh, not only people of Orissa but actually most people of India admire. Uh, Orissa has been ranked as one of the fastest growing states in the nation consistently by India today in various polls and various facets of uh, development. Uh, the party has worked, party has become stronger from strength to strength from election to election. It's done uh, work at the grassroots level, there's no doubt about that. But lastly and most importantly, if the party and the leadership and the government hadn't truly worked for the people of Odisha, there is no way we would have got this repeated resounding success in election after election since 2000. You are absolutely right, we went from strength to strength. Every time we've had an election, even when, it was with, when we were in partnership with the BJ, BJP and post-2009 when we've gone singularly into elections, our tally has improved only. Along with the party strength improving, what has also improved is the economic indicators of Orissa. I think uh, the, in, the lady introducing us was talking about how the growth rate of Orissa has been consistently over na the national average. To give you a little uh, sample, between 2003 and 2011, the national average was less than 7 or around 7 percent. Orissa was well over 8 percent. We've had a very strong, stable social security structure. We've been giving uh, subsidized rations for the longest time in the state. And that's helped keep up the most vulnerable strata and population of the state. We've also had massive FDI investment, private investment into the mining industrial sectors. In fact, between 2003 and 2011, Odisha had the highest private investment of all states in India. 
and we've done a wonderful job in ensuring that the kind of calamity which Odisha is to regularly face in terms of cyclone well, has been very ably managed. We, from a time where over 10, 12, 15,000 people lost their lives in the 1999, 1998-99 cyclone, today less than two or three people lose their lives every time a major cyclone comes and within 24 to 48 hours we are able to translocate or temporarily shift more than a million people overnight to ensure the safety. So many good things have happened and that is why the people of Odisha have consistently supported Naveen Patnaik and the Biju Janta Dal. Mr. Das, Congress party in Odisha has been very strong in the past. In fact, it has given so many SIP ministers, stalwarts like uh, Biju Patnaik ji, uh, uh, sorry, Janki Balla uh, Patnaik ji also. Uh, and still, the Congress now is reduced to single digit. Why did that decline happen? Where Congress lost the plot? Because uh, I must tell you this personal anecdote. Uh, when I first started reading India Today as a child, I saw your name in the magazine. Those were the heady days for Congress party. Uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, so after that, now we see Congress in a single digit. Why that happened? Mr. Koshik, <clears throat> I must thank you for the, to India today and uh, you especially, you have invited me after I think uh, 80s. I go back to the poverty days of Odisha in 80s, my connection with India today. As a young MLA of 25 year old, I completed 25 and I was MLA. And the role of India today to highlight the poverty ridden situation of Odisha during that time. And several measures and fifth year plans came into being for Odisha's upliftment after that. With regard to malnutrition and with regard to irrigation and many other measures and infrastructural development, etc. So that's why for the first time I attending yours, because you are having it in Orissa and you invited me and because of my past association with you. Thank you very much for that. The question you asked, uh, if you critically analyze the Congress party's working system and structure in Orissa, and the uh, moment that after the demise of uh, our leader, former Chief Minister of Odisha, the great man Biju Patnaik, and in incoming of uh, Navin Patnaik. If you analyze, uh, you'll find that uh, Biju Patnaik was a mass leader. Winning or defeat was immaterial for him. And as because he was a veteran Congress leader in his association. And winning and defeat is immediate for the Congress party. Congress party goes by the direction driven from the freedom struggle by the great leader of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and many more policies and constitutional framework, etc. We are bound to follow that way. The way the technical and mechanism to win the election by many means, that has surfaced in Odisha. After first election, Navin Patnaik ji won because of the demise of Biju Patnaik. From then, the role of our great bureaucrat Pyari Mohanji came into being. And everybody knows that. What kind of mechanism started using in the election period. I don't like to go on to that. And several ways, suppose you say, election has to be won at any cost. That is the spirit, the killing instinct of BJD party, which is not there with us, which is not there in our party. Suppose in 2018, just before election, the Kaliya Jojana surfaced to assist the farmers. Today you know the farmers, my friend Kalikeshji was saying about the per capita income and the growth of uh, Odisha uh, during uh, the present government resigned. 
the growth uh, attributed from the industrial sector and from the service sector is that is the main thing. But from the farmer sector, where 55% of workforce of the state is there, their per capita income is 5,112 only. So that at the cost of work, this growth has happened, a growth of minimum people or 45% people working in the field of service sector and in the uh, industrial sector. But what is the nation? The Odisha is a state of agriculturists, farmers, and they are 55%, they are mass. And that is inclusive growth is missing here. But Kaliya Jojana came into being as the assistance for the farmers that time. Farmers were happy and they blindly voted. It went to their account, state with 10,000 rupees. And it was continuing till the last panchayat election was over. But after panchayat election, they made it 4,000. After all the elections are over, the gain is over, they have done so. They will bring some other uh, program in future elections. Similarly, Biju Sena, unemployment situation of the state is known to everyone. I don't like to emphasize that or blame anyone. But everybody knows. But Biju Sena, the youngsters of the state, those who are brilliant scholars, MSc, BSc, uh, technocrats, they all join in Biju Sena and work as employees. But Biju Sena, after one election, they are no more. After 2014 election, they are no more. Everybody has forgotten about them. The younger generation were used to gain the election. So the kind of temporary gain and transferring money just before election in everybody's account is a major game plan. They are brilliant. They are brilliant. We can't do it. And in past also we have failed to do such kind of things. So that is why they are winning election. And Congress party, I honestly admit, we fight amongst ourselves. In the state, we don't, we are not in a position to accept each other. For that, we have, we are not being united. The moment people unitedly work, they will have more number of seats. I remember I was MLA with Viju Patnaikji in nine, 2000, uh, 1985. 14 MLAs were there. I was the secretary, parliamentary secretary. And the kind of movement we took, like one side, Kalahandi poverty, I started fighting. Then Gandhavardar movement, in coastal side, the, um, uh, this uh, missile range movement, this Baliapal movement. These three movement made the whole people of the state towards the opposition party that time. And people voted as alternate to the Congress party that time. So opposition, role in the masses for the narrative of masses has to be there that we have failed to do that. I honestly admit that is why our situation has become such. Well, this is the pity that uh, we are unable to uh, hammer the street properly and they are able to manage the election properly. That's the reason. The present has spoken, the past has spoken. Now I'll come to the one who is trying to be the future. The BJP, since 2000, they have been trying very hard to win elections in uh, Odisha. And it reached, uh, I believe in 2004, a number of 38 seats in the assembly. But now it has again hovering around 20 seats. And despite the fact that you have so many leaders at the national level also, from the Union Minister Dharmendra Pradhan, Jewel Oram, uh, you have Sambit Patra, and uh, Aparajita Sarangi, new emerging leader, uh, still, even in the Jila Parishad elections, you did very badly. 90% uh, seats were won by BJD. Why the BJP? It's always taking off. It couldn't land where it wanted to land for nearly two decades. Uh, wh what went wrong with BJP also? Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you, India Today, for inviting us here. Samastam ko namaskar. Um, you have already said what I was supposed to say when it comes to BJP. You said uh, 
the past has spoken, the present has spoken, the future is yet to speak. So we are the next I in the queue. Who is trying to be the future? I didn't we declare are, you future. I am no one to declare that. So we are next in the queue. So that's exactly what's going to happen now. People have seen enough of, had seen enough of Congress. They wanted the Congress to be voted out. The alternative then was the Biju Janata Dal. And if you actually look at the history of uh, Odisha politics, Kaushik, the Bharatiya Janata Party is a pretty late entrant into the arena. We as a party started in 80s, here, across the country. But the strength of the party actually started gaining ground after the 90s. By then, the opposition, the Janata Dal and the Biju Janata Dal subsequently were very established parties. We started understanding the ethos of people, governance from 2000 onwards. And therefore, we are going through what probably the others went in the past a little late. And that's the um, kind of advantage probably that we have. We are trying to unlearn what others learned. The panchayat and the urban elections that you're talking about, maybe we have fallen in numbers. But uh, if you actually look at things, we are pretty consistent from the 2017 panchayat elections, the 2019 general elections, in terms of the vote percentage. But yes, I do agree, we are down in numbers. But then if you look at what we were before 2017, we were probably um, too small in numbers when it came to panchayats. But yet, we had huge numbers in the assembly and Lok Sabha. Having said that, Bharatiya Janata Party, I mean, I, it, I don't want to make a very strong comment, but then I would not stop myself from saying this, that the Congress was there in the past. The Biju Janata Dal is probably in its way out. And Bharatiya Janata Party is working towards getting in. This is the state of affairs as far as I am concerned. A. B. You started, I mean, when the opening remarks was made, by the lady, she mentioned about parameters and it's only the numbers where we are fighting for. I mean, all the while, all the television reports, all the newspaper reports talk about numbers. I would also not like to dwell in the numbers but would like to mention, hover around those numbers. Odisha as a state, in early 2000, had about 58% peak population below poverty line. In the past 20 years, Odisha has improved its state of affairs and we are now, our population is below 40. It's somewhere around 35, 38, 32. Which is a very good news. We, all three of us, come from a region called KBK, all three of us, Kalahandi, Bolangir, Koraput, which at a point of time used to be one of the most backward regions of the country. And therefore there used to be KBK special funds. If from 58 to 32, that number is an indicator that poverty has really come down, then all of us should go back to our constituencies, our villages, and see if actually poverty has come down. A. B. In 2017, the then Minister for Food and Civil Supply of the Government of Orissa writes a letter to the Government of India saying, that we need 35 lakh more people to be covered under the Food Security Act. Now this is such a contradictory thing. 
This is such a dichotomy. Here is a government, here is a state, which says that we have done wonderful job and we are all unitedly saying this as people from the state, that our poverty level has come down. But the same government and the same state goes back to the government of India and says that, look, we need 35 lakh more people to be covered by the one rupee rise. Isn't that a contradiction? Here is a state which said, the lady said, that unemployment percentage is much better than the national level. You go back to 2000, when this government got into power, let's see what the state of affairs is. This is probably the only state which does not have a count of its migration count. Almost 15 lakh people, the government says 10 lakh. I mean, this is the only reason where I can thank COVID. Had it not been for COVID, and those 10 lakh people, if they wouldn't have walked from all over the country to Odisha, the government wouldn't probably wouldn't have known that there are 10 lakh people working outside Odisha. What for? Because they don't have employment in Odisha. Why don't they have employment in Odisha? Out of this 10 lakh people, almost 5 lakh people were from my constituency and my district, which coincidentally happens to be the chief minister's district. Where do they go? They go to Surat. To do what? To work in the textile mills. What happens there? If people from Odisha do not work in those textile mills, none of the textile mills in Gujarat can function. Why do they have to do it? Because the textile mills started in the 80s and the 70s by Mr. Biju Patnaik, the father figure of Janata Dal and Biju Janata Dal, and Mr. J.B. Patnaik, the former Congress minister, chief minister. This government now takes the credit of shutting down all the mills. So we don't have a single textile mill, we don't have a single spinning mill, and therefore these people have to go out. This government, this state, has registered 22 lakh people in the employment exchange in the past 20 years, in the past 13 years. And what have they done? They have given 26,000 jobs. This is the government's confirmation inside the assembly, which is what? which is 1% of the people who want jobs in the state. To sum it up, <coughs> these are the reasons, these are the reasons why Bharatiya Janata Party feels, and we have an understanding, these are the claims with which we go to the people and say that, please vote this government out and we could give a good alternative governance. Many in the opposition, they often say that uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chief Minister Nabin Patnaik has, they have some secret understanding. Now, Mr. Baksi Patra makes us feel that it, it goes much deeper. It has a historical connection. Uh, jokes apart, uh, Odisha, as I see the numbers, is actually a study in contrast. Because as you mentioned about uh, GDP growth, GSDP growth, it's 10% nearly above the state uh, national average. Uh, per capita has grown above the national average. But Odisha is a state where every one person in every three person, one in every three person is poor. It's a state where uh, around 65% people do not have access to clean fuel, cooking fuel. It's a state where nearly 40% people do not have access to sanitation. It, these are not my numbers, these are Niti Aayog numbers. Kalike Singh Deo may probably not agree because they come from Niti Aayog. But, uh, and then there is geographical disparity also on certain parameters. So, why is it happening? On one hand, uh, 
your government is claiming and which is a fact also doing economic growth, driving economic growth, huge investment. Now you are going in for infrastructure development. But poverty is still there. 30% poverty is not a good number actually. Uh, why Odisha failed in that direction? Kaushik, poverty is there in Odisha. Poverty is also there in Delhi. Is there in Gujarat. It is also there in Banaras. The fact is, India and especially Odisha, we started from a very low base. When you talk about poverty, uh, the poverty line as uh, my friend Rigu was talking about, this was a figure given in 1967 and it's been very widely debated of recent because the previous chief economic advisor of the Prime Minister, who has now gone to the IMF, has submitted a report saying that the Prime Minister or India under the Prime Minister has eradicated abject poverty. Sujit Bhalla. That's been a topic of hot debate now. And the reason for that debate is how poverty is defined. We are still going by the 1967 definition of poverty of $1 uh, purchasing power parity of, uh, per, per day. And so, Jeet, of course, is taken up to $1.9 or something else. The fact is that, and I'm glad that uh, both Brigu and Bhakta Babu, who is much, much, very much senior of mine, is, was my fa is my father's colleague, both have accepted that when this government came into power in 2000, the, the, the state of the economy was so abysmal that major, major reforms had to take place. Odisha had undergone this massive cyclone. Over 12,000 people dead. At that point of time, Odisha was paying 80% of its revenues for salaries and interests. Capital expenditure was less than 20%. It is with that base the Biju Janata Dal government under Naveen Patnaik started. There has been over 65 years of neglect towards Odisha. Let's not forget when the Green Revolution happened. Most of it happened in Northern India. Let's not forget that when the major institution and industries were, state industries were put up post-independence. Most happened in Western India and parts of Southern India. It's East India which was always neglected and out of which the central government because the, the economy was uh, controlled centrally at that point of time, the central government neglected Odisha. And Bhakta Babu would agree to a large extent that post Naveen Patnaik taking over, there was a fiscal discipline which was brought in. The basic macro economy of the state was set right. Today, Odisha is surplus in its budget. Even during the pandemic, Odisha has 40,000 crores to spend and more than 60% of that goes into capital expenditure. Even today, vis-a-vis -vis Indian states and the, in the Indian economy, Odisha has some of the lowest debt-to-GDP ratios. That's on a macro level. Let's get down to specifics here. Uh, some allegations were talked about, about my, uh, labor migration. Bhakta Babu spoke about uh, the agriculture sector. Absolutely right. We have a problem of labor migration. I mean, all three of us come from districts where there's labor migration. I was in touch with 10 to 15,000 people from my constituency during the pandemic. People do migrate. There is a problem of unemployment in the, st in the country. It's not just Odisha. People migrate from every state. The, the so-called uh, workers which go to I'm Surat. Sorry to interrupt because uh, we are running out of time. But what you are agreeing is that on macroeconomic level, Odisha is definitely progressing, but on social security side, it, no, no, it, it, it's walking down the line, but… I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. You just allow me to… give me two minutes, leave it to finish and I will, will complete quickly. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is, problems exist, but it's not solely in Odisha. The extent of the problems when this government took over was so bad that Naveen Patnaik has done a remarkable job. In… compared to almost every other state in the vicinity. Even if you compare growth rates, even if you compare employment, certainly on child, education and health parameters. The fact is, India has problems and we've got to go beyond Odisha to address the problem of employment. We've got to look at a nation as a whole to address the problem of, uh, of many other issues. So, you have shifted the goalpost and uh, passed the buck to the center. Uh, Mr. Das, I need a quick answer. Uh, you talked about poverty and Congress party itself suffers from a different kind of poverty which is the poverty of leadership 
Uh, you mentioned also that in Odisha, the, the BG, uh, Congress earlier had big leaders like Biju Patnaik ji or Janki Balla Patnaik. Now they don't have. Now the party, you, you are not even sure about your central leadership. Who would be the face in the state now? Means if you have to fight the election and uh, pass the narrative, you also need a mascot, which you don't have. I want a very short answer. With regard to the narratives, you know, without a narratives, party cannot be built. If we think of the development during this government, you know, out of 30 district, 25 district, high level of malnutrition is there. Women in the age group of uh, 15 to 49, 51 percent are malnutrition affected. And children from 44.6 uh, percent children from the uh, sixth month period to uh, around 59 months, they are malnourished. That is the thing. 77 percent people of the state are drinking contaminated water, open infected water. This great government, the development has taken so much, then why they are not able to provide safe drinking water to the citizens? I, I agree all these numbers, but to counter these numbers, you have said the narrative, I understood your narrative, development is a narrative. No, no, this, this Who will is be a, the mascot? Yes, so development means industrial development. Kalingnagar is a well-developed steel city, but just adjacent to Kalingnagar, there is a Nagada case. People died out of starvation. People are affected. You go to the industrial area in Lanjigarh, you go to Utkal Almina place or Bedant Almina place, you go to all industrial places and see the surroundings. Are they developed? Sir, we are running out of time, but so, I, so, I didn't uh, get the answer. So, so, they see, it is a mindless industrial development, meaningless industrial development. People are, the stakeholders are not taken into consideration with regard to the development of industries. So, any industry comes. Why POSCO could not come? Why again it is given to Mittal and agitation has again started? Because the before giving clearance, the, the environment clearance and every people's clearance, Gram Sabha, everything should be cleared so that the inclusive growth will take place at the cost of the people of the mining area and the factories area, this industrial development has taken place. That is the fact. So, brother, you said that Congress had the narrative. But to think that Congress cannot rope in in Odisha… Where is the leader, sir? I am telling you, there are people to fight. I am here. The history knows by about my background. To create a narrative and to spread it. And days are not very far. I am here… Days are not very far. Congress is going to answer. bounce back. That's an answer, sir. Uh, I'm, my last question and very quickly. It seems that BJP has only one narrative everywhere. Now BJP is very much interested in Puri, probably for the obvious reason. For all these years, all the narratives didn't work, so now Puri probably would become a narrative, the Hindutva narrative. Why BJP always thinks that this Hindutva narrative is the only um, strategy that can work. But in Odisha, it doesn't seem to work till now. No, that's, I think that's a completely wrong understanding of understanding Bharatiya Janata Party in Odisha. We are interested in Malkanigiri, we are interested in Avarangpur, we are interested in Kalahandi, we are interested in Balangir. We are not interested in things which would don the newspaper cover pages and India Today's cover pages. We are very, very clear. I will just want to finish it off here. We are very, very clear that Odisha's among the poorest, Niti Aayog's report says, the poorest district of the country is in Odisha, and that is Navarangpur. One of the poorest districts of the country is Keonjar, which provides 21% of steel to the country. It has got 62% of poverty. All the industrialization that the state is talking about is about mineral-based industries. All the poverty-stricken districts of the country and Odisha are the mineral-based districts. Odisha has to improve. Odisha has improved, there is no doubt about it. I totally agree. But it is not an organic growth. 
there needs to be an organic growth. People have to get employment, people have to get livelihood, people have to cut down their dependence on the one rupee rice, clean drinking water needs to be provided to everybody and if you are talking about Hindutva, 97%, 96% of Odisha's population is Hindu, right? We don't need to fight for that. That's a narrative which is ingrained within the ethos of this society. I think there is Bharatiya Janata Party is trying to understand Odisha's issues, Odisha's problems in totality and trying to find out the right ways of addressing these issues and to, under, and to give a long-term solution to the organic problems already there in the state. Thank you so much. La last word you have to give me as a defendant of the government. But very quickly, very, very quickly, quickly, else I would be no, no. thrown out of this dais. No, no. <laughs> We've seen the Congress, the voters and the people of Odisha have rejected them. As Bhrigu says, it's a long-term vision for the long-term future of Bharatiya Janata Party and we'll have to wait a very long time for them to capture the imagination of the people of Odisha. Currently, the people of Odisha have voted and in the manner of their vote, supported the policies and the steps taken by the government. I think that's the true, step of, uh, true test of democracy. It's very rare that three politicians from three different parties are sticking to the narrative. They're talking about development de despite all the provocations that I tried to make. And it, thank you, Mr. Bhaksipatra, Mr. Das, Mr. Singhdeo, for being part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you, Mr. Deo, Mr. Sharandas, and Mr. Bhaksipatra. I just want to say at the outset that uh, all the data that I had used was government data. <laughs> so I did not concoct any numbers here. <laughs> since the data was referred to a lot. Um, can I please invite uh, Mr. Ranjan Kumar Behra, Mr. Benudhar Barik and Mr. Devarth, please to come on stage to felicitate our panelists. are promising the state of Odisha. I think it's a win-win for, for the residents of the state and for the country as a whole. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next session. A mark of a developed country or in this case a developed state is when a person who can afford to buy a car but chooses to use public transport and when one can drink water right out of the tap. That's how economists typically look at what constitutes a developed country or a developed area. And as it turns out, in July 2021, Puri became the first Indian city to have 24 by 7 drinking water from taps. It's, it's a huge accomplishment and that's what we are going to be talking about. Drink from tap, 24 by 7 water supply, a transformative story of urban Odisha. Can I please invite my colleague M.G. Arun, Executive Editor of India Today, and Mr. G. G. Mathi Vathanan, Principal Secretary, Housing and Urban Development Department, and Mr. V. Srinivas Chari, Director, Administrative Staff College of India, Hyderabad. Can I please request the panelists to join MG on stage, please? Thank you.
Good afternoon. Access to safe drinking water is a basic human right. In January this year, Chief Minister of Odisha, Naveen Patnaik, dedicated the Sujal Drink from Tap mission to residents of Katak. The 24 by 7 drinking water supply project worth 790 crore rupees will benefit 7 lakh residents of 1.4 lakh families in 59 wards of the Katak Municipal Corporation. With this, all families in 60 cities of the state have been provided with 24-hour piped water. Soon, all 114 cities will benefit from this. To talk about this crucial and critical mission, we have got two eminent panelists. We have got Mr. G. Mathiwadhanan, who is the Principal Secretary, Housing and Urban Development uh, Department of the Government of Odisha, and Mr. Srinivas Chari, Director, Administrative Staff College of India, Hyderabad. Let me start with uh, Mr. You know, Madhi Vadan. Now, Odisha, from, a, from being a challenged state in terms of the drinking uh, water situation, has transformed into a water-secure urban Odisha. Ashweta has talked about you know, the success of Puri, the city of Puri, in uh, the Drink from Tap mission. And it is the first in the country and has made a big mark in the national level. So if you could share your experience and tell us about this particular mission that you have taken up for the benefit of the audience. The, uh, <coughs> yes. In, in, in fact, we started the journey sometime in 2015-16. That time, uh, you know, if you see the Odisha's population, less than 40% of the state, the urban areas, we have 114 cities, had the pipe network. That means more than 60% of the cities did not have even the pipe network. They were fed by just hand pump tube mm -hmm. or provided with syntax tanks, where you provide water through tankers. So the supply was not there, regular supply was not there. And even within that 40% pipe network area, only 30% of the households were having the house connection, less than one third. That was the scenario in 2015-16. And because of that, lots of waterborne diseases, jaundice, hepatitis, uh, diarrheal death, all those things used to happen every year. Situation used to be very bad during summer, scorching summer. So journey started, it was Honorable Chief Minister's desire that every household should have a pipe water supply connection. So to realize that, we started the mission called Basuda Mission. In 2017, on October 20th, Honorable Chief Minister launched Basuda Mission. It has been four years. So now, not only that, 96% of the households have been provided with the individual household connections. We have covered 84 cities out of 114 with 100% house connections. And we have declared and it has been validated by third parties. And not only that, we have also reached the drink from tap 24 by 7, the first city being Puri, and started implementing in 20 more cities. That has been the journey. Great. So I want to bring in Mr. Chari here, you know, who, can, who has done extensive research when it comes to, you know, the experience of other states and also you know, as a country as a whole. Um, where does Odisha stand when it comes to you know, this particular phenomenon of uh, you know, drinking water direct from the tap? Uh, if you can just put th that in perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I come from, uh, from a pan-India perspective. Uh, for us, uh, Orissa is a, uh, a benchmark or a role model, or if I may say, a gold-plated solution, very beautiful. <clears throat> Uh, just to give you the contrast, where Orissa stands, particularly urban Orissa vis-a-vis -vis other uh, cities that we work, uh, in most of the cities in India, I mean, as all of us know, urban India is what a stress 
situation. Every urban India, every big city, metropolitan city, small town, they go through phenomenal amount of water stress. The water supply is intermittent. When it means intermittent, they get alternate day supply. Even big cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad or even many uh, Delhi, other places, the water supply is not continuous. Uh, poor are not connected in many places. So for us, <coughs> Orissa is a, a great benchmark to look up to both from access point of view, having a tap at home as well as water flowing through the tap on a continuous basis without any interruption. Not just from convenience point of view, but from health point of view. So for us, benchmark uh, Orissa, particularly Puri and some of the cities of Orissa has become real benchmark in urban water management. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mathiwan, you know, the, the fact that 84 out of 114 cities in the state has, uh, has been declared 100% uh, in terms of completion, in terms of house connections of, of piped water. I mean, that's, a, that's a quite a remarkable feat, I suppose. Uh, could you just take us through this journey, how you know, it was reached out and, and the challenges that you faced when you did this? See, we worked on the premises of the premises that public has a right to tap water. Yeah. Every household should get a house connection. It, it, it's, it's, it's like air, clean air. Everybody is entitled for a clean water. So with that we started and our experience has been that lots of projects get started but never get completed. Get completed but doesn't result, that does not lead to house connection. So our focus has been to ensure that the public investment should result in house connection. So our benchmark has been 100% house connection, leaving no one behind. No house should be left out, whether it, it, it is located in a posh area or in a slum or informal settlements. Everybody should, is entitled to get a house connection. So on that premises we worked and uh, uh, once we complete the projects, we ensure that every house is connected. For that, you know, we roped in the community connect, the Jalsati, those kind of things, which, who facilitated in making sure that every house is connected. So that is how we have done, uh, uh, so far we have come up to 84 houses. For that we have done a lot of things. In fact, you know, Professor Chari can supplement that, that getting house connection itself is a big thing. So if you see ease of doing business or ease of getting a government facility, you need number of documents before you get house connection. So what we have done is that we, we analyzed all those things and, and we decided that there should not be any requirement of any document. Do away with all the documents which actually prohibit people or obstruct people from getting house connection. And another major thing is that we, make, we, we decided that poor should not be asked to pay for the house connection. They should be asked to pay for the water they consume, but not for the connection. So ur urban poor has been freed from a one-time upfront connection fee. And there were several other obstacles in getting a house connection, road cutting permission from the municipality, road restoration charges to be paid. Every house is required to pay 10,000 to 15,000 rupees as a road cutting and road restoration charges apart from the connection, apart from other charges. So we have completely removed all these obstacles so to facilitate easy house connection to every home. That's how we, we could. We started with you know 3.5 lakh connections in 2015-16. Today we are 9.7 lakh within a period of you know five years. So that's the kind of phenomenal jump we have got. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Chari, you know, uh, Mr. Madhivan was talking about uh, the ease of getting water, drinking water, you know, just as we say the ease of doing business. And uh, you have had enough experience with other states. So where does Orissa stand in this? If you can just give us a comparison of how things happen elsewhere. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, I take you back uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, where we used to struggle to get a, uh, you know, access to a telephonic connection because of procedural barriers or financial barriers. It used to be a huge procedure as well as we, we were asked to pay 20, 25,000 as deposit to get access to a telephone connection. The situation, the similar situation prevails even now 
for getting access to a tap connection at home. We have done this analysis uh, scanning of the whole country, uh, almost all states. One of the biggest challenges is the amount of documentation that we require for getting a tap connection, especially for the poor family at home, is Herculean. So in the process, people either depend on a public fountain or take an illegal connection. So what Orissa has done is to do away with the procedural barriers, as Mr. Mativatanan mentioned. But equally important is to do away with the financial barriers. These are artificial financial barriers created by the system to keep away the poor from getting equal access like everybody else. So this prevalence of procedural barriers as well as financial barriers still is rampant across many states in the country. And I think again, access to individual tap connection as a fundamental right is again, Orissa is setting a great example for rest of the cities in the country. And I think uh, uh, the national government and even Amrut 2.0 recognize this and they are trying to sort of incentivize states and cities to remove this procedural as well as fiscal barriers that prevail in, in, in this sort of sector. Oh, that's a great insight. Um, Mr. Madhivanan, you know, one of the things that one has observed in, in, as far as the state is concerned is community participation. And uh, you are mentioning about the role of uh, the Jal Sathi, you know, the women self-help group. In fact, you know, in the morning, uh, Chief Minister uh, Naveen Patnaik himself had mentioned you know, several schemes that the state has uh, has taken for the development of women and children. So, I mean, bringing uh, women and children to the forefront of a whole lot of activities. So, in this case, self-help group of women. So, if you could just, you know, highlight what are the aspects of that? So, you know, Odisha uh, believes in women empowerment. There is a very strong uh, women self-help group movement in the state. It's about two decades old. So, we have a very strong women self-help groups in the cities. So what we have done is that if you see the, the, the government functionaries, there is a huge disconnect between the government and the consumers when it comes to water supply. So we bridged the gap by deploying the women self-help groups from the communities, mm. from the localities. So we have onboarded them as Jalsatis, water help assistant. And then we, uh, you know, we have entrusted uh, several functions to them, trained them, provided them with a uniform, ID card, and capacity has been upgraded. And then they perform several functions of the PHO, VATCO, uh, for a performance linked incentive basis. They are paid for each and every job. For getting a new connection, facilitating a new connection, they are paid 100 rupees. For regularizing an illegal connection, unauthorized connection, they get about 200 rupees. For revenue collection, they get 5% of the revenue they collect. So several functions, starting from uh, uh, bill generation to delivering the bill, revenue collection, field quality testing, facilitating consumer complaint redressal. Several, they act as a community connect, they act as a connect between the government and the consumers. So that has actually transformed the situation. So almost, we, now we can say that in most of the cities we have done away with the illegal connections, unauthorized connections. All have been regularized. The advantage is that once it is regularized, from that time onwards, it comes into our official fold. The revenue collection happens. The consumption is regulated. It is no more irresponsible consumption. Wastages reduces. Losses are reduced. So they have been our anchor actually. Great. How do you bring about this awareness among women? I mean, the communication part is extremely important, is it? So could you highlight some of the things that, you know, you take we, to re no, take the message across? Yeah, we, the, the Jalsatis are selected based on a selection process mm -hmm. from the interested groups. Okay. Then we, con we do an, a selection process and take them and uh, uh, we, we make them to undergo a very intensive training program, hand-holding support. That's the reason they are able to do even field quality, quality testing also. For every quality test, they get 20 rupees. Mm -hmm. So at the field, they do it. So not only now, now what, what we have done recently is that we have handed over the responsibility of operating and managing a water treatment plant in Katak to the women self-help group and transgender group. Oh. So we have gone to that stage of, that's the strength of our community partnership. 
And where is this uh, water treatment plant coming up? Katak. In Katak? Katak. Wonderful. Uh, so, when it comes to community participation, you know, what is the experience that, you know, you have some other states? I'm sure there is a lot of work going on in other states also. Yeah. <clears throat> community participation is uh, uh, quite rampant. It has caught on imagination of uh, most of the states, but particularly with regard to water. Uh, what's happening is, uh, the chair here is, any drink from tap sort of a scheme, we call it as 24-7 water supply scheme, is often implemented through public-private partnerships, unlike Orissa. Now, many places, the public-private partnerships have failed because of lack of community connect. Either the private sector or the government were unable to engage communities on the issues of tariff, on the issues of illegal connections, on the issues of uh, regularizing the illegal connections, many of those issues. What Orissa done, I think is a very interesting model. It is public sector driven, municipal state government driven initiative, but squarely taking community participation as the centrality to this engagement reform program. And I think for me, the sustainability of Orissa model is very much because of the community engagement process that they have done. Unlike the public-private partnership model often attempted in other states and other cities. I think this is the crux of the sustainability of the program. I believe is going to not just, it is not just a one-time exercise, is going to multiply from one city of Puri to a number of cities. I think that's my take on this issue. I would like to add one more point here. Professor Chari was mentioning that every 24 by 7 uh, uh, project has been on, attempted 24 by 7 project has been on PPP model involving foreign funding and foreign consultants and foreign agencies to execute the work. And Odisha is the only state where it is fully made in Odisha, skilled in Odisha with the local in-house work completely. What we have started in Puri now is being implemented in 20 other cities, but it is completely managed by our own people without any foreign fund or foreign consultants or foreign companies involved. Tell us something more about Puri, you know, because that is one city which is attracting the maximum tourists and you were giving me some astonishing figures and the quantum of water that is consumed, you know, during the time, the festival time and how, the, how you have revolutionized, uh, you know, the water supply there through the drink from tap concept. So it will be interesting if you can dwell a little bit on that. In, in 2019, when we were implementing the Basuda scheme and uh, we, were, we were about 90% of completion stage. So the, at that time we thought, uh, we started thinking about the quality. We, ex we found that still in some cities there, there were incidences of jaundice, diarrhea, waterborne diseases. So, I asked myself and I asked my team also that we supply water. We say that it's a good quality water. What is the guarantee? Who will guarantee that? Can we say that the waterborne diseases are because of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, unhygienic food they have consumed, not because of the water, contaminated water? The health department obviously will put the blame on the water supply system. So, how do we counter it? that time we started thinking about the quality. How do you provide assured quality? We can say that it is good, but somebody has to say that it is assured. So then we, we, then we checked for the IS quality standards. There is an IS 10,500. Then, then my team started working on why not we provide IS 10,500 quality standards and say that this is pure water, quality water. So that's the dream of our Honorable Chief Minister to provide clean water. So we started working, that's how drink from tap has come. So when we thought of where to implement this first on pilot basis, then uh, it was decided that it should be Puri. Puri is the cultural capital of the city, uh, the state. So we, we get two crore uh, uh, tourists annually to the pilgrim city. So their impact would be more, the benefits would be more. So that's how we chose Puri and it has been implemented and it has been a quite successful one. Now we are extending it to 20 other cities. Wonderful. 
So generally, you know, 24 by 7 water supply is perceived as a service to the rich. But then, you know, as we have been saying, it's a, it's a right for everybody. How are the urban poor in Puri and other cities, you know, benefiting by it? Especially the urban poor. And if you can just give an idea of that. The focus of our water supply mission has been to reach the urban poor. In fact, uh, uh, you would be happy to know that the first pilot under Drink From Tap started from Isaneswar Basti. It's a slum area in Bhuneshwar. Then the second one was Salya Sahi, which is the largest slum in the entire state. Mm -hmm. It has 57,500 population, largest slum, most difficult slum within Bhuneshwar city. That was, a f that was one of the first pilot cities where we started. So our focus has been only on urban poor. Had we failed implementing drink from tap from uh, the Salia Sahi or Ishanishwar Basti, then we could have even abandoned this program. The very purpose was to ensure that the poor gets the clean water. In any case, you and I, we can afford mineral water. All our houses get 24 by 7 because of the water tank system, supply we get, all housing complexes get 24 by 7. It is only the poor, only the bastis, only the slum areas which are deprived of that. So this primarily benefits them. In fact, I can, I'm happy to say that today in Odisha, 4 lakh houses, which translates to one, uh, 18 lakh population living in the slums are provided with tap water connections, which is a record in the country. And uh, if you could throw some light uh, uh, on, on, on the, uh, Mr. Chari, on the, you know, national scene when it comes to the urban poor and how that is being tackled. So, <clears throat> all I can say is that, uh, you know, as individuals, just imagine for a minute, we get uh, one hour of talk time on my mobile in the morning and half an hour of talk time on my mobile in the evening. Would, are we happy about it? Mm -hmm. Just imagine a scenario of one hour of talk time every alternate day. Are we uh, happy about it? It's exactly what Puri and other cities are trying. Just drawing an analogy. When we are so rely, when we are so uh, you know dependent on a mobile access on a seamless 24/7 basis, it is a fundamental right for citizens, especially the poor, to get 24-hour round-the-clock drinking water supply. It eases pressure on women, it eases pressure on children and girls, and it enhances the economic opportunities. Unfortunately, this particular fundamental think thought process has not set in in many cities, and I'm sure it will come sooner or later. So the current scenario is that as I explained earlier, like the mobile, urban poor gets alternate day supply for an hour. People queue up, waste their time. Kids cannot go to school on those days. Women cannot unlock their time for economic opportunity. So this is not just a convenience we are talking about of Puri example or any such example of uh, Orissa. It's about not just about convenience. It's about economic opportunities, it is about empowerment and it is about the growth of a state or a city or a country. So I think uh, these are examples we need to amplify and talk and talk and talk and then put pressure on the system so that it gets replicated across the country, particularly for the poor families and communities. Great. So finally, uh, I just wanted to come to some challenges when it comes to uh, the future. I mean, you have achieved so much so far. But um, when, it, uh, when you're looking at, say, a decade or two decades from now, what are the kind of targets that the state is setting for itself? And what are the likely challenges and what are the things that you s still feel is left uh, uh, to be done? We don't have a long, we have not set long-term targets. We have set, set very short-term target. Bhuneshwar will get a 24 by 7 drink from tap before December 2023. Barampur would be achieving drink from tap 24 by 7 supply by in the another seven months time by December 2020. So every city, Katak also by December 2023, 20 other cities will get. So maybe in the next three, four years, we'll be able to complete entirely 
the entire state 114 cities that's a speed at which we are working and uh, the next thing would be to sustain this system the supply so moving away from the groundwater to the surface water river sources migration to that so we have started the migration 100% migration not to exploit the groundwater but to tap the surface water runoff water so that would be our focus we are also parallelly working on conserving the rainwater harvesting the rainwater last year we started with we have achieved about you know about 14000 rainwater harvesting structures have been constructed in the state with the help of the women self help groups they are the executive agencies in a record time of time of 3 months 4 months so this year this summer we have taken up 25000 rainwater harvesting structures now they are under implementation with the help of the women self help groups so rainwater harvesting water conservation would be our uh, you know priorities in the days to come mr chari i mean is there anything that you feel that the state should be uh, focusing on prioritizing in, in this field yeah i think uh, <clears throat> uh, orissa is at the cusp of urbanization is not completely urbanized in a big way like many other states but it's just about urbanizing so with rapid urbanization and climate change impacts that i envisage uh, there could be stress on water security. While the, this is a great progress, it has set an example for the rest of the country. But ensuring water availability, water security in the context of rapid urbanization and in the context of climate change and the variability of sources is going to put a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the existing system. So the leadership has to think through some of these scenarios and ensure that we climate proof, we take care of some of these risks and sustain this 24-7 water supply. The other equal uh, challenge for me, I think uh, Mr. Mativatana is handling it, is a human capacity to scale up. Uh, setting couple of examples is pretty easy, but sustaining at scale and requires a complete change in the mindset, skill sets and that's where I think the Orissa Water Academy that they have started is a great example of building this human capital to achieve this scale. I think uh, these are good examples, but these are also risks and we have to be cognizant of it and we need to plan for it. Thank you so much. I think we had a very insightful session with both of you giving us a lot of information that, you know, uh, would be quite useful to us. And I think, you know, Odisha has really set a big example for other states to follow. Thank you so much both for participating in the session. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Shweta.
moving on to our next panel did you all know i'm sure all of you know that five athletes from orissa duti chand birendra lakra amit rohidas deep grace eka and namita topo participated in the olympics which is a matter of great pride and chief minister of course has announced a huge prize for all the winners so clearly the state is focused on building an ecosystem for its athletes chakte odisha india's new sports destination can i please invite my colleague kaushik deka executive editor of india today and can i also please invite Ms Manisha Malhotra head of sports excellence and scouting JSW Mr Dilip Tirke former hockey player and Mr R Vinil Krishna special secretary to chief minister and commissioner cum secretary sports and youth services over to you Kashyap Odisha has always uh, made the country proud especially in the field of hockey and we are very fortunate that we have such an illustrious player with us today uh, Dilip Tirki he needs no introduction then we have among us uh, one person who has a sharp eye on talents and more importantly she herself has been a very illustrious tennis player Manisha Malhotra and we have one bureaucrat who actually is leading a kind of sports revolution in india uh, sorry in odisha vinil krishna ji welcome all three of you uh, i'll start this session with uh, manisha malhotra you your designation says that you are scouting for talent all the time so in that context how do you map odisha in terms of sports talent in india well i think it's it's i mean this this sports talent per sport has been very very demographic within india i mean there's been pockets of um the country which have been like kerala has always been prevalent with athletics then there's haryana and stuff which is more of the combat sports then there's the northeast which is judo boxing um orissa has always had a very very rich heritage uh, with hockey and also to some stage with archery but what is really heartening i mean as a as a government and as for, you have to take a much more holistic view so i think it's still nascent to be able to see maybe the fruits of all of this happening now is probably going to be 10 years down the line when we'll be able to really assess um what the talent pocket of orissa would be but you know a lot of the work that's being done right to the grassroots level is is very very heartening i i have said it on several forums if we have a strong base and if we have strong depth at the base the elite level takes care of itself and strong competition at a very um, mass level will turn out talent that that didn't exist so it's it's now the time to kind of you know we have the science we have the people we have the infrastructure it's time to kind of upgrade i think um now this is not orissa centric but from a country wide perspective it's it's important to upgrade the hr i think our coaches lack the knowledge of of the foreign coaches still i think this the peripherals around sport are, are going to be the key to going forward at the same time i'll continue this question because odisha has been a very special state in a sense that where uh, as we have discussed the private government partnership in terms of development of sports it has been a kind of model for other states uh, uh i would one from you how this model is different and uh, as we often uh, it's discussed that sports is a state subject or state should do more on sports the the moment there is a criticism it's passed on to the state so uh, how do you think that other states can uh, learn from this model and what exactly is the core of this model 
Well, I mean, I think it's this is probably the only successful model in the country where there's the private entities and the state government working hand in hand and in a very cohesive manner where everybody on is, is given some sort of decision-making seat and, and it's a collective decision on how they want to take the sport forward. Um, I think that countrywide and statewide, it is time for, for that to happen. Um, the the central government has tried for their various PPP models which have not been very successful. But the biggest thing for any state to take this forward is the will. And sports is one of the best platforms for tackling several different verticals and challenges of society. So it's important that a state, any other state who wants to look at it, needs to look at sport as a vehicle of change for a lot of their problems that they can do. Uh, Mr. Krishna, uh, sports infrastructure we always talk about, uh, particularly when it comes to um, state support, the government support, we always focus on the sports infrastructure only. But at the same time, development of sports also depends on the change of mindset and developing that mindset for sports. A kind of ecosystem and environment for sports, uh, and that's where the government role is very crucial and we see it's lacking in many states in India. What is Odisha government doing? Because we have seen, as Manisha has mentioned, it has been very successful here. What special that government in Odisha is doing to create not only the infrastructural support, but to create that mind space, uh, to create that environment of sports in the state? So you have uh, rightly pointed out that uh, infrastructure is not the only thing. But infrastructure is definitely required because that will also attract a lot many. If you have a very good uh, high quality infrastructure that automatically also attracts many people towards utilizing that uh, uh, that facility. Uh, but but uh, it's absolutely right. It's apart from infrastructure, what we are really focusing on is uh, you will see that we are doing lot many competitions, whether it is the national or the international uh, uh, events, sporting events, across the various sports disciplines we are organizing, so that we create an atmosphere where. Uh, people are attracted towards sports. For example, if you look at uh, hockey, now we are a global hub for hockey. Uh, we have conducted the 2018 Hockey World Cup. We are again going to conduct in 2023 in uh, Bhuneshwar and Rorkela. Uh, in 2017, we have conducted the Asian Athletics uh, Championship in a very uh, short uh, uh, time span. Uh, similarly, national championship, you, you take almost every sport we have done it, including sports like Yogasana. Their first uh, national yogasana, yogasana as a as a competitive sport. We know yoga as a as a kind of uh, 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 lifestyle kind of a thing, uh, but as a competitive sport like a gymnastics, even yogasana is uh, something that uh, we we uh, at a very short span uh, we conducted last year. Uh, so one competitions create that kind of an overall atmosphere towards uh, uh, sports, and more importantly, we are now working on how we can start from the school level. Because unless the sport is included in the uh, syllabus of these students, like how they give importance to maths, physics, or uh, uh, other science subjects, or the languages, where they get the marks, they fight for those marks, and their overall grading in a class is determined based on the marks that they get in all the subjects. Similarly, why can't they be a sports as one of the subjects? where again it brings a lot of competitiveness. So they will start spending time on sports, they start understanding sport, participating in the sports. So therefore, that level of how for every class we can have a syllabus and make sport as a compulsory subject. So that is also something that we are trying, because of the COVID and the schools being closed, we couldn't implement it, but that is something that is very important for us. Uh, and uh, uh, I would also like to tell that uh, we are in conversation with the International Olympic uh, Committee. Uh, they have a program called Olympic Values Education Program. So we are, we are very shortly going to uh, sign an MOU with them and uh, it is going to be implemented in the uh, state. So sports is not just about, uh, uh, Manisha has told about uh, it being a, a changing uh, kind of a uh, system. Uh, so therefore, we are not looking at sport as just uh, another winning uh, Olympics or those kind of things. That is also one of the things that will happen. But more importantly, it is about how we create a more health conscious, fitness conscious uh, society. Because sport has multiple advantages. It's not just about 
winning in the game uh, kind of a scenario it is it creates a personality it it, it helps people especially the youth to uh, discover themselves discover their potential uh, so therefore we are trying to see how holistically we can actually focus on sports dilip tirki ji aap pehle khelte the aur ab neta bhi ban gaye hai main aapke bare mein aapse hockey ke bare mein puchunga lekin usse pehle ye puchna chahta hu ki अक्सर ये क्रिटिसिज्म इंडिया में होता है कि सारे नेता लोग स्पोर्ट्स एसोसिएशन को कब्जा करके बैठे हुए हैं जो खिलाड़ी है वो कभी एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन में आ नहीं पाते हैं आप अभी तो आप दोनों साइड में हो पहले खेलते थे अब आप नेता भी बन चुके हो तो आप अभी क्या बोलेंगे कि स्पोर्ट्स मैन को ही ये खेल जगत को संभाल लेना चाहिए या नेता भी मदद कर सकते हैं मेरे ख्याल से दोनों साथ साथ में चलना चाहिए आ, पहले काफ़ी सालों से हम देखते आ रहे थे नेता जो लीडर्स हैं काफ़ी एसोसिएशन के साथ जुड़े हुए थे कई सारे नेता सचमुच स्पोर्ट्स के लिए काम करते थे और कई सारे नेता नेता रह, रहते थे डीपली इन्वॉल्व नहीं होते थे लेकिन मैं कहना चाहूँगा एसोसिएशन के माध्यम से जरिए हम काफ़ी कुछ डेवलप कर सकते हैं और जब स्पोर्ट्स पर्सन जब आते हैं एसोसिएशन में एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन में मेरे ख्याल से बेटर वे में और काम हो पाता है और मुझे आज मैं आज हॉकी एसोसिएशन ओडिशा के मैं प्रेसिडेंट हूँ और आज मुझे फील हो रहा है और और मुझे काफ़ी अच्छा महसूस हो रहा है और मैं सपोर्ट कर रहा हूँ और एक प्लेयर को मालूम होता है कि एक स्पोर्ट्स में एक खिलाड़ी किस तरीके से आगे बढ़ सकता है और क्या क्या फैसिलिटीज़ उनको चाहिए और किस तरीके से उनको सपोर्ट चाहिए एक खिलाड़ी को अच्छी तरह मालूम होता है मेरे ख्याल से खिलाड़ी को सामने आना चाहिए और मेरे ख्याल से एसोसिएशन के साथ जुड़ना चाहिए फ्यूचर में और स्पोर्ट्स आगे बढ़ सकता है तो रिटायरमेंट के बाद खिलाड़ियों को नेता बनना चाहिए और नेता बनने के बाद स्पोर्ट्स एसोसिएशन पर कब्जा डालना चाहिए <laughs> बिल्कुल सही <laughs> ये एक फॉर्मूला हो सकता है लेकिन हॉकी के बात करेंगे आपने हॉकी में उड़ीसा ने बहुत सारे प्लेयर्स दिए हैं भारत को आप जैसे इलस्ट्रियस प्लेयर दिए हैं जो कि सर्वाधिक कैप सर्वाधिक अपियरेंस है आपके हॉकी ग्राउंड में एज एन इंडियन प्लेयर गोल्ड मेडल से लेके बहुत सारे मेडल आप जीत चुके हैं तो सवाल पहला ये है कि उड़ीसा में ऐसा क्या खास है कि हॉकी को लेकर इतनी ऑब्सेशन है या अच्छे प्लेयर ही नहीं दे रहे अब हॉकी के एक, एक हब बन चुके हैं एक हॉकी का घर बन चुके हैं और दूसरा फ्यूचर में आप कैसे देखते हैं प्लेयर्स की इवोल्यूशन एक तो एक इकोसिस्टम बनाया गया है लेकिन आगे कितने दिलीप तिरकी ओडिशा से आएंगे देखिए पहली बात मैं कहना चाहूँगा ओडिशा स्पोर्ट्स के बारे में जब मैं कहूँगा काफ़ी डीपलू में जुड़ा हुआ हूँ और मैं जब नाइन्टी में जब मैं भुवनेश्वर आया उस टाइम में इंडियन टीम के साथ में इंटरनेट में शामिल था इंडिया के लिए खेल रहा था मैं जब आया उस टाइम मेरे ख्याल से स्पोर्ट्स का माहौल कुछ भी नहीं था मैं प्रैक्टिस करने के लिए मुझे ग्रीन ग्रास ग्राउंड ढूंढना पड़ता था ऐसा सिचुएशन था और मेरे ख्याल से और भी स्पोर्ट्स मैन काफ़ी फेस कर रहे थे प्रैक्टिस करने के लिए उन्हें अच्छे कोच के पास जाने के लिए टोटली वो इन्वायरमेंट नहीं था लेकिन जब मैं आज देखता हूँ जब 96 उस उस टाइम का दौर देखता हूँ और आज का जो माहौल देखता हूँ काफ़ी चेंजेस काफ़ी मैं कहूँगा इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर के बात करें या हम कोचिंग के बात करें या हम हम आ, किस तरीके से प्लेयर यू नो मैं कहने कहना चाहूँगा स्पोर्ट्स साइंस इंजुरी रिहेप्स की बात करें सभी एरिया से हम देखेंगे तो काफ़ी फैसिलिटी आज सामने मुझे दिख रहा है और स्पेशली मैं धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा हमारे मुख्यमंत्री जी नवीन पटनायक जी उनके ब्लेसिंग से उनके सपोर्ट से आज हमें आज मैं सुनता हूँ कि उड़ीसा एक स्पोर्ट्स का कैपिटल बन चुका है हॉकी का कैपिटल बन चुका है सुन के मुझे काफ़ी गर्व महसूस होता है हर एक दिन ऐसा था हॉकी कहीं ना कहीं उसका क्रेज कहीं ना कहीं नीचे गिर जा रहा था कई कारण हो सकते हैं हम इम्पोर्टेंट टूर्नामेंट हम मेडल जीत नहीं पा रहे थे एटी के बाद हम कभी भी हम मेजर इवेंट जीत नहीं पाए थे 
हाँ एशियन गेम्स में हम एशियन गेम्स जीते हुए गोल्ड मेडल जीते हुए हैं एशिया कप में गोल्ड मेडल जीते हुए हैं अपने एशियन में गोल्ड जीत जीते हुए हैं लेकिन ओलंपिक्स में नहीं और जैसे पाँच साल पहले मुख्यमंत्री जी ने सपोर्ट की स्पॉन्सर के दौर पर और आपके सामने टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन जो ओलंपिक्स टोक्यो ओलंपिक्स में फोर्टी फोर्टी वन हमें ब्रॉन्ज मंड मिला टीम बहुत ही अच्छा परफॉर्मेंस किया मेंस टीम उसके साथ साथ वोमेंस टीम का परफॉर्मेंस मेरे ख्याल से एक्सेलेंट रहा है जो कि काफ़ी सालों के बाद हमें देखने को नहीं मिल रहा था ये मेरे ख्याल से उड़ीसा गवर्नमेंट का सपोर्ट से हुआ है और साथ साथ मैं कहूँगा मुख्यमंत्री के सपोर्ट से हुआ है उसके साथ साथ मैं ये कहना चाहूँगा जो कोचिंग का बात कर रहे हैं उड़ीसा गवर्नमेंट हम फोकस कर रहे हैं सब जूनियर जूनियर ग्रास रूट लेवल हमारे सुंदरगढ़ में नर्सरी लेवल में काफ़ी बच्चे हजार हजार बच्चे हॉकी खेल रहे हैं तो काफ़ी हम उसको फोकस कर रहे हैं वहाँ पे नर्सरी कोचिंग सेंटर अभी स्टार्ट करने जा रहे हैं आपको बताना चाहूँगा सुंदरगढ़ में सुंदरगढ़ में सेवेंटीन ब्लॉक्स जो है सेवेंटीन ब्लॉक्स में सेवेंटीन अस्टोटप सिंथेटिक सैंड अस्टोटप बनाने जा रहे हैं ऑलरेडी काम स्टार्ट हो गया है वहाँ पे नर्सरी ईयरली एज में बच्चों की इस तरीके से कोचिंग मिल पाएगा मेरे ख्याल से उसके लिए अभी हम लोग कोशिश कर रहे हैं गवर्नमेंट कोशिश कर रहा है और और डेफिनेटली फ्यूचर में उड़ीसा से और खिलाड़ी उभर के आएंगे मुझे ऐसा लग रहा है मनीषा आप वेन एवर देर इज़ ए टॉक ऑफ स्पोर्ट्स इन इंडिया वी ऑफन से दैट ओके पेरेंट्स आर नॉट इंक्लाइन टूवर्ड्स एज ई टॉक्ट अबाउट द एजुकेशन स्पोर्ट्स एजुकेशन राइट फ्रॉम द वेरी बिगिनिंग इंसर्टिंग इट इन द सिलेबस एंड ऑल दैट बट आई डू नॉट कवर स्पोर्ट्स रेगुलरली सो एज ए ले मैन आई फाइंड दिस आई डोंट अंडरस्टैंड दिस डाइकॉनमी इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ क्रिकेट Now in hockey, we had better achievements globally. I mean, so we had eight uh, Olympic gold medals, which is any day far higher in in value than uh, cricket World Cup probably. Uh, but cricket, it's it has become a religion, and it was triggered by one 1983 victory, and no government help came, nothing. It's still a private entity, and uh, all the money has come to cricket. We had better achievements in hockey, as I said, and we have relatively. Uh, good performance in some other sports also but other sports could never pick up our imagination so it has kind of become a vicious cycle people say that because there is no uh, victory in other sports that's why there is no support system whether it's government or private support but the victory also cannot come if there is no support then cricket logic defeats that there was no support for cricket as well but they won and then all the support came so why other sports are waiting for that moment of victory it could be in tennis it could be in badminton it could be there have been victories there have been uh, some individual success stories but then again it fizzles out it it doesn't become a phenomenon like uh, uh, 2 years ago when himadas won then it became a athletic phenomenon then it fizzled out so now olympic in the olympic we have done well it was all hyped up but again it's fizzling out that consistently that uh, drive for the sports in other sports why that's not happening and for over several years several decades we are waiting for that to happen well i mean um, this is completely a personal take but you have to understand that a team sport is what galvanizes a nation so an individual sport will never have the same following and catch yes there'll be superstars like the sindhus or you know at some point mahesh leander sanya then there you know there are superstars that come and now even for example neeraj but it it's always a team sport when you see a team winning with your country on the back of their of their jerseys that galvanizes and gets the the masses involved um what cricket has managed to do that that and this onus on this is completely i would say with the with the federations is that they were not able to ride the success so cricket won the 1983 world cup and then actually was still not that much popular until this ipl came along and then it became like this media phenomenon and it became so india as a nation is starved for sporting properties which are appealing to the public i mean you will see even with a sport like kabaddi it had fantastic ratings it's just a question of being able to package that sport to be able to give the masses what they want and 
in today's day and age with social media, all I mean, we're a very content-hungry world. It, it should not be that much of a challenge to start marketing. Hockey has had results after a huge drought. So this present generation, who are these content users watching TV on the, on the phones, have no clue about hockey. Only the hardcore sports fans know about 1980. So, so that now is we will see. I truly believe that hockey is on the up. I think there's a lot more um, news. There's a lot. There's people who can name you five hockey players. I mean, ten years ago, I don't think anybody could name you people after maybe him and and uh, and you know two Virain and one or two others. So. I, I do believe that the onus is on, on the administration of the federations to package their sports in a better way. I think that the onus really should lie um, within these federations to be a little bit more self-sufficient. You know, they, are, they do hop on the, on the money wagon and they're getting easy money, so they're kind of not really forced to generate revenues. But I, 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 I have seen a change since when I came into sports administration in 2005 to now. It's night and day. So I do really believe that it's looking quite okay. It's, sport is now suddenly becoming a viable career option, which is the first step, I guess, for an Indian society. Mr. Krishna, as you said about um, putting it in education, that's the first step. But uh, while you were working over these years to turn Odisha into a sports hub, what are the challenges that you are facing, that first roadblock that you face? And, and I'm sure that roadblock is not specific to Odisha because I'm trying to s find out an answer, a, a formula which can be replicated probably in other states also. So from a bureaucratic point of view, if I have to tell, I can't tell any of my batchmates that I'm actually posted in sports department because then they'll think that it's a punishment posting. <laughs> so that is the usual, usual kind of a... Uh, something people approach towards sports in government, in the society also. If you look at in a school, probably the PT teacher will be the least important person in the entire school. Maybe a max uh, teacher will be very important, a science teacher will be important, still uh, English teacher will also be very important. So uh, even the principal would not uh, like to have a conversation with the uh, PT teacher unless there is an event going on where they will use some responsibility to the PT teacher. So therefore, sport not being considered as an important part of our society or even in our uh, government also is something that's a fact of our life. Uh, I mentioned uh, briefly about the uh, two, three challenging situations we faced and uh, uh, since we could overcome that, therefore we got more momentum in going forward on sports. Uh, for example, in uh, when most of our journey, actually we call it as a landmark when we organize the Asian Athletics Championship. So that was organized within a very short period of 90 days. So it was to be organized in some other city in, the, uh, in another state. Uh, last minute that uh, city backed out and therefore we were, uh, we were we, 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 uh, the Athletic Federation came to Honorable Chief Minister and uh, uh, Honorable CM said that we will definitely do it. But we had a challenge that our stadium was not ready. It was completely going to be during a monsoon period. Uh, so, so there was huge challenges uh, for organizing that, but somehow the entire administration got together since uh, Honorable Chief Minister said that we have to do it, it's a prestige of the uh, country. Uh, so therefore when we organized it and when did it and showed that it can be done, then there is a lot of uh, support for uh, doing more in sports because that was a big success here in the state uh, when we organized the Asian Athletic Championship. Similarly, a very a uh, very different approach towards hockey in terms of sponsoring the teams. So no state has uh, done it and uh, Chief Minister took a call that we should support hockey, it's uh, considered to be our national sport and therefore we should uh, sponsor them so that they are financially stable and they will be able to focus on the game. So this is again something that uh, uh, no state can actually, no state government or a bureaucrat or any, anybody can take that chance and we were criticized a lot for that in across the spectrum. After they won the, in fact, the Tokyo Olympics was very critical for us because we were supporting, hoping that their, the performance will be good. So when Tokyo Olympics happened and India got the medal, 
even the women's team which we we never expected that will go into such a top level they performed exceedingly well after that there is uh, there's no problem so they realize that once we uh, take up some of these challenges and uh, try to focus and uh, do it and once that success is there there's nothing like success once the success happens then now everybody says that we should so if i go to the finance department with some uh, budget for some project or some infra i don't face any problem they said yes you please do it we have to do it for sports it's it's ironical actually you need success for success uh tirki ji आपने बहुत मैचेस खेले बहुत ऐसे मैचेस खेले जो हम सबको याद है इंडिया के लिए मेडल लाए तो मुझे दो ऐसा मैच बताइए जो आपको लगा कि आपको पूरे टीम को ये बेहतर खेलना चाहिए या आपके मन में आज तक रिग्रेट है कि ये मैच हम जीत नहीं पाए या अच्छा स्कोर नहीं कर पाए और एक ऐसा मैच बताइए जिसको जीतते हुए आपको सबसे ज़्यादा सेटिस्फेक्शन हुआ कि सबसे ज़्यादा खुशी हुई मैचेस तो हर मैच जीतने पे खुशी होते हैं लेकिन कुछ कुछ ऐसे मैच होते हैं जो पूरे ज़िंदगी के लिए याद रह जाते हैं दो ऐसे मैच जो आप अभी भी चाहते हो कि काश मैं ये जीत जाता और एक ऐसे मैच जो आपको लगा कि ये सबसे अच्छा जीत था आपका 98 एट एशियन गेम्स मेरे ख्याल से 32 टू ईयर के बाद इंडियन हॉकी टीम चैम्पियन होकर आया सो so, 32 टू ईयर तक हम लोग एशियन गेम्स मेडल जीत नहीं पा रहे थे कई कारण से एक वो जीत मेरे धनराज पिल्ले कैप्टन थे उस टीम के और मेरे ख्याल से उस जीत के बाद हॉकी में एक एक जान आ गई एक मोरल सपोर्ट आ गया उसके बाद 2003 में हम लोग अफ एशियन गेम्स गोल्ड मेडल जीते थे और कई एशिया लेवल में हम काफ़ी अच्छा परफॉर्मेंस किए हैं टू में एशिया कप चैम्पियन टू में एशिया कप चैम्पियन काफ़ी अच्छा रहा है लेकिन जब वर्ल्ड लेवल की बात करें सो आपको भी याद होगा 2000 थाउजेंड ओलम्पिक्स सिडनी ओलम्पिक्स मेरे ख्याल से हम कोरिया का से जीत रहे हैं हम ऑस्ट्रेलिया का से ड्रॉ कर रहे हैं लीग मैच में लास्ट मैच रह गया था पोलैंड के साथ और पोलैंड ऑलमोस्ट सभी टीम के साथ हार चुकी थी लास्ट मैच हमारे साथ था और हम कॉन्फिडेंस के साथ गए हुए थे खेलने के लिए हमें जीत चाहिए था एक गोल जीत चाहिए था हमें सही फैलने जाना था और एक गोल हम लोग ने किए थे हाँ मैंने किया था एक गोल एक गोल से लीड कर रहे थे लास्ट थर्टी टू सेकेंड में इक्वलाइज हुआ और हम एक 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 गोल से ड्रॉ रहा बराबर रहा टू टू गोल्स बराबर रहने से भी हम सही फाइनल क्वालिफाई कर सकते सामने पाकिस्तान था कुछ भी हो सकता था तो काफ़ी साल के बाद एक टीम अच्छी हॉकी खेली लेकिन हम सही फल जा नहीं पाए सही फल जाते तो कुछ ना कुछ वहाँ पे हो सकता था हम कुछ मेडल टैली में आ सकते थे लेकिन ये बहुत बड़ा हमारे साथ था मैं कहूँगा एक हमारे मन में जितने भी हमारे खिलाड़ी थे मेरे ख्याल धनराज पिले से लेके बल सिंह ढिलोंग से सब ने मैच के बाद रोना स्टार्ट कर दिया दूसरा मैच मैं कहना चाहूँगा टू थाउजेंड में इंडियन टीम ओलंपिक क्वालिफाई कर नहीं पाए हम लोग जहाँ हम एक तरफ हम इतने सालों से एक एक हमारा हिस्ट्री रहा है ओलंपिक्स में हम एट बार ओलंपिक गोल्ड मेडल जीते हैं जब हम 2008 में ओलंपिक क्वालिफाई कर नहीं पाए इंग्लैंड के साथ हम हार गए थे उस दौरान काफ़ी दुख उस टीम का सदस्य मैं भी रहा काफ़ी दुख हुआ था लेकिन आज हम सब काफ़ी खुश हैं आज हॉकी का माहौल चेंज हो गया है आज हमारे इंडिया में हमारे भुवनेश्वर में वर्ल्ड क्लास स्टेडियम राहुल कला में वर्ल्ड क्लास स्टेडियम बनने जा रहा है नेक्स्ट वर्ल्ड कप होने जा रहा है और खुशी इस बात का है कि वर्ल्ड हॉकी आके भुवनेश्वर में खेलना चाह रहे हैं वर्ल्ड के टॉप टीम्स आके कलिंगा हॉकी स्टेडियम में खेलना चाह रहे हैं तो इससे हमारे लिए गौरव की बात क्या हो सकता है आपने ग्रास टाफ में खेला एस्ट्रो टाफ में भी खेला और आप पॉलिटिकल टाफ में खेल रहे हैं सबसे बढ़िया कहाँ खेल सकते हैं आपको कौन सा सबसे अच्छा लगा अब तक के देखिए दोनों अपने अपने जगह पे सही है और डेफिनेटली हॉकी मेरे प्रोफेशनल 
गेम था मैं काफ़ी पैसन के साथ खेला काफ़ी एन्जॉय किया और काफ़ी हाई लेवल में भी मैं आ, आ, मैं काफ़ी खुश रहा और जहां पॉलिटिक्स से बात करते हैं पॉलिटिक्स दूर दूर से मेरे नाता नहीं था लेकिन मैं धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा हमारे मुख्यमंत्री नवीन पटनायक जी को मुझे पहली बार और मेरे ख्याल से राज्यसभा के हिस्ट्री में पहली बार ऐसा हुआ है एक यंग पर्सन को 34 ईयर था और पहली बार ऐसा हुआ है कि स्पोर्ट्स मैन को राज्यसभा में भेजा गया मेरे ख्याल पहली मुख्यमंत्री हैं या पार्टी के लीडर हैं मैं गया और मुझे काफ़ी कुछ उसे वहाँ पे सीखने को मिला काफ़ी बहुत अच्छा मेरे लिए अपॉर्चुनिटी रहा देश के लिए स्पोर्ट्स के लिए हमारे राज्य के लिए काफ़ी कुछ कहने के लिए मौका मिला था कप्तान को सबसे पहले धन्यवाद दे रहे हैं आपका टीम में जगह पक्की है ऑन दिस नोट वील हैव टू एंड दिस सेशन बिकॉज वी आर रनिंग आउट ऑफ टाइम हेडिंग टूवर्ड्स द लास्ट सेशन and thank you all three of you for being part of this conversation i really enjoyed this hope you also enjoyed thank you thank you thank you very much can i please invite mr manish shubhi from and uh, mr besaj kumar mohanta please to come and uh, felicitate our guests culture dance and music from time immemorial odisha has attracted a large number of scholars artists and tourists kalinga the kala bhumi how the power house of art and culture can be marketed that's what we will be talking about can i please invite kaushik back on stage and uh, can we also please invite our uh, panelists miss aruna mohanty she's a dancer neela mahadab panda who's a filmmaker and mr satyabrata raut author director and scenographer over to you kashik as shweta has said that odisha is actually a, uh, to me odisha is a cultural hub in fact the most popular novel in uh, my home state assam is based on odisha paradeep that novel probably every romantic uh, person in assam would read uh, would is anuradha dekh and that is based in uh, odisha so i have a very strong connect with odisha that way uh we have three very esteemed guests with me today and uh, my knowledge on art and culture is very limited so please forgive me if i ask some very lame questions uh i'll start with a very somber note as we are discussing about art and culture in odisha two days back uh one padmashri from odisha 
he was evicted from his home in delhi which is very sad and unfortunate and i must tell all of you that i am so fortunate at this moment that i am sitting with two padmashris and two sangeet natak academy we know so this is an illustrious panel but coming back to my question madam mohanty ji how do you react to this uh, incident what happened in delhi that eviction of that uh, padmashri we know uh it is definitely an unfortunate incident from here where i am sitting i uh, see guru madhav rao as one of the pillar of odissi and certainly we would not like any artist or any individual to be uh, evicted um, this way but we really do not know the other side of the story also that whether they knew that they had to vacate and and it is not only given to him but probably uh, the notice was given to um, almost all the artists including birj maharaj ji yeah, and all of them so we really do not know but however one artist should not be asked to leave in a disgraceful manner like this definitely perhaps the whole episode could be handled in a much in a more delicately yeah. so odisha has been a uh, it has a great tradition of dance not only the odissi but in other forms also and uh, the state has given so many big names to the country keluchran mahapatra gangadhar pradhan mayadhar rod as you said so and one such legend is you what makes this state so special that this dance forms indian classical dance forms and traditional dance forms of the state it has become a uh, breeding ground for dance forms and so popular so successful and uh, not only limited to odisha what is it in odisha that uh, the dance forms are so successful here today wherever you go whichever state you go everyone is kind of uh saying that odisha is the most happening place and when we are talking about odisha performing art i'm not talking about odissi you look at different regions of odisha be it our tribal society be it our coastal areas be it western odisha every part of odisha is very vibrant with its culture i'm talking about the dance music theater and the allied art forms today odissi is enriched odissi is in the international stage because it has got everything assimilated all the nuances from all this folk tribal and uh, allied art forms so uh, odissa for odissa the dance forms and the music they are part of odia life it reflects odia way of thinking odia language odia literature odia we say it janna jivana odia bhava emotions odia's uh, celebrations we have 13 festivals in 12 months we say bara mase tera jatra it doesn't only reflect dance and music it reflects odianess it reflects odia with the fragrance of the soil with the soothing uh, touch of the air the water of odisha everything dances it has got music embedded in it that's so wonderful to hear and encouraging and i can find a connect i i, I have been hearing that statement that you said baro mahe tera utsav in assam is it said uh, but we are also facing a challenge uh, in 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 a in an era where the dance is about doing reels or insta posts where self taught modern dancers in whatever form they are gaining popularity on social media and all that how do you attract ma'am because you are also in administration in a way uh, uh, you were in the other side also how do you attract new age talents young boys and girls to this traditional dance formats where the fame is not instant and the effort and the hard work would be 10 times more if not less uh 
how, how, how do you attract newest talents now? It has been a challenge and we are debating on it that why the Bollywood schools have more number of students than ODC schools. It is not here. Nationally also the debate is on. But in Odisha, I would say that we are facing two uh, challenges. One is we want to preserve the traditional forms, whether it's folk forms or classical forms, the way it is handed down by our uh, generations of scholars and dancers and gurus. And at the same time, we want to attract in 21st century, we want to bring youngsters into the auditorium to appreciate it, understand it and take it forward. So to do both, we, we are definitely experimenting. I will tell you one example that I was kind of uh, making a presentation in IIT Kharagpur and I was doing a traditional ODC piece called Ardha Nareshwara. So after in speak make what they do is they ask question, there is an interaction session after every performance. So one student asked me that uh, why you think that we should come to the auditorium to watch Odyssey? I said, why? You didn't like what I did? He said, no, it was very beautiful. You did it very beautifully and your uh, footwork and the grace and everything was perfect. But tell me, how many times should I see Siva, mythology and Purana? Whoever comes, they do the same thing. I said, we connect the past and our foundation, on that foundation we are building the present and probably we'll take it forward to the future. So it is definitely connected and the values, it's shaping our lives and, you know, are uh, giving us wisdom to deal with life. But he said, you are not talking about why you are doing how. How Shiva is having the matted locks here, he's adorned with serpent and the Ganga is coming down. You are just showing us what we see in the calendar, but you are not letting us know why it is happening like that. What's the purpose behind? So that made us think that to attract youth today, we have to do the packaging differently. We have to put the same wine probably in a new bottle with a new fragrance, with a new look and new interpretations so that they will understand the value of the tradition traditional form of art and will be attracted and will claim that this is me and it has to be relevant to their lives. If it is not relevant to their lives, probably they are thinking it's something which is not connected to me. That is why when I did a small composition called Nari, I kind of connected from Sita to Draupadi to Gandhari to Kunti and finally I ended with Nirvaya. So I just wanted to say, that the journey of a woman is kind of saying that Mu Nirbhaya, Mu Bijaya, Mu Ajaya, I have the strength and power and chintan of Madurga. So, what those a beautiful are the thought. <laughs> Mr. Rao, same question actually. You are into stage theatre. And it's also facing the same problem in, in today's time when all the entertainment has gone digital and so many distractions are there, entertainment is available on phone. How do you face this challenge that to attract new generation and to make uh, theatre commercially successful, good content, commercially viable and successful? And I'm not saying, as we had discussed uh, uh, in the green room that there is no art, art uh, theater or commerci commercial theater. There is only good or bad content. So how can we make good content commercially viable in terms of theater? Namaskar. Uh, this is a very relevant question. Uh, to make theater commercially viable so that artists can uh, get a respectable in the society, which is for the so many years we are really facing this problem because of other mediums, parallel uh, allied mediums like film, television. They are, uh, they are uh, because of that theatre is going uh, 
down and down and it is losing its audience. But for me, this is not true. This is not true. Because this is the medium which is directly connected to the audience with a live communion between you and me. So here the problem arises that when we meet at one point, two group of pe uh, people, one is the audience and another is the actor, when we meet together, we talk of an event, a situation. So here the problem is that our contemporary theatre, which uh, when uh, we are presenting on the stage, we are doing our performance, we couldn't make it reach up to you. The aapka paas hum directly pahunch, humare baat ko rakh nahi pa rahe hain. The reason is that we do not know our art properly. That is the problem. For example, if you want to become a doctor, you would need six years tra training and you become a doctor. For uh, any other, for engineer, you need training. And for a, a teacher, you need a teacher training, pro a teacher training program. But for theater, anybody can come and do a theater on stage and we clap at him. That is the problem. The, so what I identified, the basic problem lies in our education. We must educate our actors. Our academic is so poor, so poor, even we do not know A, B, C of theater and we come to the stage and we perform. One, one, in one performance, we think we became an actor and then uh, we were to take our way, koi film mein chala jata hai, koi TV mein chala jata hai. Because we, uh, in theater, we do not know the grammar of that and we, we are doing it. And then, jab, then when we know that uh, we are not successful here, then people go for money. But the thing here, the, the, reason, the, the solution which I found is that we have to educate our actors. We have to educate our actors. Actors ke liye teen bahut important element kaam karta hai. One is his body. He must fit. I'm not saying that his body should be like Salman Khan. I, I, mean, I mean a body that articulate. The body must speak. So a, through the body, one has to create a dialogue. Angikam jisko kaha gaya hai. We have a voice. We must know the basic technique. But with, with your body and voice, the problem will not be solved. We must develop our intellect. I know it very well. I can say it with Not only in Odisha, most of the parts of this country, people stop reading. Logon ka reading habit khatam ho chuki hai. Nobody reads poetry, nobody needs no, read novel, nobody... We, we are not aware of ourselves. We are not aware of We do not know because we, we do not read newspapers. So, if I, do, I want to do a production, I must be aware of all these things. What is happening with me? Because theatre is a medium of... It's, it talks of the present time. Its language is present because it is a presentational art form. It's a, it's a language of the present. Ka hai. So, yes, who will teach our actors all these things? We need academicians. We need academicians that is directly related to practice. So, practice and academy, when these things come together, we will prepare actors and then we can say, we can say that we prepare professional actors. When professionalism will come, there is no commercial, there is no art. Only professionalism. We should know our art. Very well. Just like doctor professional, hota hai, usre actor ko professional hona padega. Then only audience will come. We will, uh, 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 because audience, hamesa, uh, every audience wants a good product, whether it is in film or television or in theatre. We need product. It must, it must speak of our, uh, our problems. Hamari issue ko ham tak properly rakh paaye. Then only I think a good and healthy theatre will come up. And in Odisha particularly, in Odisha I have seen lots of possibilities. I am sorry to say, and I'll also I am happy to say also, both the things are at one time. Odisha theatre is doing lots of works. Every day we have shows. Lots of festivals have been organized by government, uh, with the support of the government or any private sectors. They are coming up to, with sponsorship, giving shows to our actors. They are living their livelihood. But the problem, the, our flaw also lies there. Doing so, 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 we are do, repeating the same mistake. Our mistakes should be rectified. We need workshops. We need proper training to the actors. If that will not happen, we are doing the same. And who is going to tell that you are wrong or right? 
मेरे एक्टर को अपनी बॉडी इफ ही डजेंट नो हाउ टू मैन्यूपुलेट हिज बॉडी हाउ टू मैन्यूपुलेट हिज वॉयस देन एवरी डे वी डू द सेम मिस्टेक एंड टिल आवर एंड ऑफ लाइफ विल डू द सेम थिंग सो इट्स ऑल्सो ए सजेशन टू द गवर्नमेंट बिकॉज मैम इज सिटिंग आई कैन बिकॉज सी इज द ऑनरेबल चेयरमैन ऑफ आर संगीत नाटक अकाडेमी so academy is is doing lots of work with doing lots of production festivals but at the same time i request the academy to to do some theater workshops training program is important is really important without training how we become an, how you dare to say you are an actor this is really very shameful affairs and new generation will come only when they they will know the importance of the training I think uh, the, that is the thing which I want to express in front of you. Thank you very much. I'll come for that response, but before that, I'll go to Neela Madhav Panda, probably who has find, found some solutions to these issues that have been raised. Because uh, I have seen his movies are popular also. I'm not saying they are Salman Khan movies, but they are quite popular. and uh, he has uh, earned success uh, critically also uh, as far as content is concerned so mr panda how did you find this balance what was the magic trick that you found that you could earn the popularity that you were looking for i'm certainly sure, i'm sure that you were not looking for uh, salman khan kind of popularity that kind of box office return but you were looking for some kind of recognition which you have got at the same time you have produced good content which has which has been recognized by uh, connoisseurs of film industry so what's the secret well uh, namaskar you know it's a very important session but it's at the end of the seminar conclave today i don't understand why we think art is for free whereas everything has you count as money value but art is for free i'll give you an example it was just i mean there's so many conclave on art i have attended you know about a decade back also we were talking to one of the greatest artists from here and when i started talking about branding of art you know whether odyssey or sculpture or any form or theater even okay so i said then immediately he said oh you thinking you will commercialize art then i asked him who pays your bill sir he shot his mouth and if you have particularly seen in last two years during covid time there was lot of talk about artist begging why there is a whole creative economy out there when we we can we can announce cinema as industry why can't there be a creative industry begin with orissa it's a, such a powerful thing it's such a soft power it's not about i'm not saying about commercialization i'll tell you my own theory when i did my first film i am kalam i sold my house and we just made the film in 1.2 crore everybody said that oh it's a tele film it's a art house film means you just give it to durdarshan or do something <laughs> by in one decade 10 years it made 82 crores in terms of value of money and why because i left that art once i finished the film i become a marketing agent for 2 years i did not made any film i went door to door to say that here is something i have made so means if you are a artist so called artist or art it is for free let's understand right here we just had a session here odisha is the best example where anywhere i go very proudly i can say any any part of this country i go they say oh your state is progressing so fast well indeed it is happening it's right here we did that with hockey hockey is one of the finest example where if you tell ask children 2 years back they don't know how how a goal happens what is hockey who knows tomorrow there will be private league of hockey as good as cricket cricket you recognize because there is a lot of money star value why can't can that happen with artists with artisans with sculptor with odyssey somewhere we we lack in terms of branding leadership everything government cannot do nobody no nobody supporting cinema it become a industry by itself because there is commercialization factor people loved it people love to pay 
I want people to buy ticket for Odyssey, not sponsored by some PSU or uh, government of Odisha or government of India, you know. So when you start the session with something, I remember when I went for a narration with a Bollywood actress and somebody fixed an appointment about 11 years back, uh, no, six, seven years back. And when I entered, she said, they, oh, I thought there is an art house filmmaker who is coming. I said, what do you mean by that? This means that if you get a national award, you can wear a hat, 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 wear a hat. I mean, the artist means that you will wear a hat, wear a hat, wear a hat, wear a hat, wear a hat. The rest of the Mercedes will come. Why? It's such a derogatory remark to, you know, what is that respect for artist? And I think that's where we lack our own self as an artist. There is nothing for free. If a doctor is charging, if an engineer is charging, why that Odyssey dancer who is practicing for months for a dance, so why is he not charging? Why are you not buying a ticket? So, in overall, I would say, I mean, I, had, I, I can talk about creative economy because I studied a short course in IIM Bangalore, and then I went traveling Europe, you know, especially UK. UK is one of the finest examples about creative economy. They transforming everything from painting, uh, theater, classical dance, everything into a right sort of a business model. So your money is counted. How many? For example, Aruna Apa's money is counted as creative economy or money? No. So that's where probably we need to bring change. And that has happened in cinema. We need to figure out, I mean, today, of course, with social media, now there are little, 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 little positioning happening here. Many ways when people, I mean, young generations writes, giving that clip of Michael Jackson, uh, one of the Michael Jackson song has an Odyssey uh, beat, you know. So they talk about that. So somewhere we need to really progress faster. And this is a great time where this is a state, I mean, let's understand, most, one of the most prosperous state in terms of art and culture. Centuries old, all the temples have art, culture, dance, musicians, everything, you know. So somewhere we lag behind, we can keep talking about this, the time will go and we still talk about this. That's why I think we all have to figure out something or sort of a policy or something where we, we evaluate, we value these artists. You, you announce it as, as a creative industry, include everything, then we can find a way to call it a powerhouse thing, to call it as a soft power. Cinema is not just the only soft power. Literature, dance. Now please explain me this mystery. Odisha is sandwiched between West Bengal and South India. Now from South India these days, everyone in India is watching South Indian movies on OTT platform or even in movie theatres. And most of the time South Indian movies are commercially very successful. They could be loud, they could be anything, but they have got the market formula right. Then you have Bangla films which are globally known maybe as art house or maybe as good content, but they are known in every corner of us, uh, India at least. They are talked about from Satyajit Ray to Ritik Ghatak. I am not saying Odisha film didn't have any great names, but we don't hear anything about Odisha films. We do not see commercially successful Odisha films on OTT platform. Like people are watching someone sitting in Nagaland or someone sitting in uh, Gujarat or Jammu and Kashmir, they are watching any kind of film. Language is no more a barrier. But Odisha films, Odia films, they haven't been able to take advantage of that situation. Why this hasn't happened? Even you made your Odisha, Odia film only last year, I believe. You took so many years to make an Odia film. Why? Well, we're not sandwiched between South and Bengal at all. We are what we are, you know, honestly. We somewhere lagged behind in terms of cinema. That's for sure. Last two decades especially. Again, what I say is leadership. Somewhere, I mean, it's all, all interlinked, you know. It's not just about cinema. It's linked with our you know, classical dance, classical music, Odyssey. And if you see, we might lag behind in cinema, but we are, we are in a very powerful uh, position in terms of our dance, you know, theatre, okay? Cinema, you know, is, is always about a cycle. You know, if you see today Bollywood, 
is now suddenly dominated by South films, you know. There's Tamil films, Malayalam films, which are growing really big. In, when you go to OTT also, in terms of value and financially, I mean, I work in the industry, so I know, suddenly Bollywood is down. So I would say that this is a phase we have been going through in Odisha, that somehow uh, film did not improve much. I mean, it was not my choice that I did not make Odia film. I wanted to find the right sort of a film to do. So it took me a while to do that film which I wanted to do. It's almost a, like a silent film which I uh, did last year, you know, the two years back, which got national award. Now, you know, this is, you know, when I took the film to movie, movie is one of the uh, best international platform in terms of art house cinema. They said, we never heard of this language. So I was, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I was feeling a little ashamed, you know. I said, oh, you never heard this language. I said, so they were very happy to take that and it did very well. So, but with, if you see the new talent and in the film industry also, technically we have a lot of talented people, but somehow again the leadership that telling stories from here was not happening. Of course, there was a time when we did a lot of films, you know, about 15, 20 years back. So that phase, it looks like beginning again because I see a lot of new talent doing beautiful films and also the music is improving a lot. I can see the music is improving. Somewhere I think within next couple of years, things will change. Madam Mohanty, you had to respond to Sir's request that um, you need to do more workshops from, from a government I, point I, of view. I just wanted to respond to Satya Babu that now in Rabindra Mandap, Government of Odisha, uh, Sangeet Natak Academy, we are doing a theatre festival on Baraputra of Odisha. So, uh, in the five, five days festival, we started with Bhima Bhoi, then um, uh, Madhu Babu, Bira Surendra Sai, then uh, we had Vaishnavapani, today we are finishing it with Upendra Hanja. And I am so happy to say, that there is not a single seat vacant there. It was overflowing. It was so crowded. So, the festivals are doing fine. Because it is a thematic festival, it appealed and people got connected to it immediately. Ajadika Amrit Mahoschab. So, how you market the festival, that is kind of responsible for bringing in people into the auditorium. And uh, as you mentioned, workshop, in last uh, 12 months, we have done three workshops, theater workshops. And we have Utkar Sangeet Mahavidyalaya where theater is taught academically. And we have also post-graduation course offered by Sanskriti, Utkar Sanskriti Mahavidyalaya. So we have and we are trying and the government is very sensitive towards this need to train theater people academically. Academic input is very, very necessary today in 21st century, not only in theater, in every performing art. And we are trying to also now create research center for folk art forms. Because folk art forms without the thinking artist and the scholars and people who will contribute to develop its boundary, expand its boundary, the folk art forms also becoming very repetitive. So that way also we are trying to uh, do something to make it vibrant. So I'm hoping that in Odisha, when you'll come back in two years, you will find theater is improved in its uh, approach in terms of uh, training and uh, workshops and interaction session. Now we are going to introduce, it's an interdisciplinary, where I was kind of going to ask Nilo Madhababu that that should be interaction between theater, film, and performing art like dance and music. Because yesterday, what I saw in the theater, the theater people, they came from Sambalpur and they were using Sambalpuri language for the entire one and a half hours theater. And the music was very good. The music was so good that it has lifted the theater to a different level. 
I was just asking you, do they buy ticket or they come for free to no, see? No, this is a festival which is kind of earmarked for no. this year. No, I agree with you. I just told uh, that the day people will buy tickets to see dance or theatre or any art form which we are so proudly presenting, that day we will say that it is really kind of, it's making a statement, people's statement. Mm. No, Arunapa, what I mean here is we have to change that. We if have to cinema change is not working, people can easily afford 300 or 500 bucks. It's not about the money. It's the respect to the artist, respect to the form they're going to watch. Here I would Whether agree the with museum, theatre, anything, they must pay. Yes, then only they will respect. I agree with Satya Babu. The professional artist, they, it is a big responsibility on their shoulder that how to make it at par with international standard because today with the fingertips, the uh, people are kind of connected to the world through different OTT platforms or whatever way. So now we cannot say that, okay, I am from Odisha, this is our strength. No, my strength has to match with the strength of any international ballet or international dance, uh, whatever we are seeing and we are comparing with. So we need to strengthen and we have to develop our skill to, and here comes the importance of marketing. Suppose we have good artists, if we cannot market them, if our publicity and PR work is not good enough, I'm just telling you one small example. We did something called uh, Make in Odisha, here in Bhubaneswar. And when we presented that, Honorable CM was very happy to see that the, through the dance, the development and growth of Odisha can be presented like this. Someone saw it in USA and then approached me that can we take that video and play it in global convention. So that is how we are going to do now. We have to market it and to do that kind of marketing, we have few points that educate audience so that they can appreciate it and buy tickets and pay respect to the artist. And the second thing is that we have to have more Nilamadha Panda with the uh, technology where it can be captured beautifully and can be presented in a kind of an international, with the international standard to the rest of the world. Odisha can be promoted through the marketing. The brand has to be established. Then only we'll be able to help the artist and the art forms. Rebranding, repackaging yeah. and marketing. I believe these are the things that need to be done. I'm one of the finest example I'll give you, one of, the, one of my friends who did a folk art theater from Rajasthan, went half of the world. He made about $10 million just taking folk artists performing all over the world. It can, uh, Mangnir Seduction, you know, if you know this uh, play called Mangnir Seduction. So this is very famous, the NSD get, Mangnir Seduction. Rest and Yeah, Rest Thank you so much for being here. It was a wonderful session. I had so many questions to ask, but I'll just conclude with this, that again, I'm promoting my home state. There, we have seen NSD uh, artists going to films to make more money. In Assam, film actors come to theatre, mobile theatre to make more money. So, traditional form of art, theatre, dance, everything can be commercial, provided we uh, have good content and we can connect with the audience. So, on that note, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. And over to Sweta. Thank you very much. It was a very lovely and a very candid conversation. As someone rightly said, art is something that makes you breathe a different kind of happiness. And I think all of us can do with a lot more art in our lives, especially after two years of a lot of, I think, soul searching, uh, pain, agony that humanity collectively went through. Um, just, so thank you so much for taking out the time. And personally, I loved I Am Kalam. <laughs> Uh, it was a lovely film. I watched it with my nine-year-old. He watched it too and we both loved it. Thank you so much. Can I please invite Mr. Manoj Das and Mr. B.B. Behra to please come on stage and uh, felicitate our guests.
and can we please give the artists who've taken out the time to be here today a big round of applause and with this we conclude our state of state conclave in odisha we loved being here it was uh, it, it today was a very memorable day for all of us we learned so much about this magnificent state and honestly we are left in complete awe of how much your state has to offer so thank you very much we hope to be back again soon next year have a great evening and uh, have a good night thank you